for the Xperia Pro I. It is crazy to see the depth of field that you can get with it and is pretty insane that it's coming from a smartphone. Xperia has a brand new on the go solution called Videography Pro that combines all the features that a run and gun filmmaker like me needs. I can access different lenses, cine looks, and switch apertures between f2 and f4. I can check it out with a ton of accessories, an external mic on top, a multifunctional grip where I can zoom in and out, and also a portable vlog monitor. This is really great because you can still use the rear cameras and I can still see myself. It's honestly crazy that I'm recording this on a phone because it looks like a movie. It, it looks so good and it has a video shortcut key where I can just pull it out of my pocket, press it, and I am off to the races. Eye autofocus keeps lock on my eye, so I'm in focus whether I'm here or back here. And just like shooting with my Sony Alpha cameras, it has optical image stabilization. And that way I have assurance that my image is going to be steady. It's not going to be shaky. Shaky video footage is always very, very distracting. The Xperia Pro I is slim, it is water and dust resistant, and it is packed with a ton of features. Xperia shoots up to 120 frames per second, and I can also shoot 4K HDR, which is great for capturing beautiful colors for your video. One might think that being a YouTuber means that image is everything, which it is, yes, but audio is just as important. Xperia has added a third unidirectional microphone, and it almost has the effect like you're just there with the person. It also has a sound source separator that uses an intelligent wind filter. What that means is they figured out how to deal with the biggest sound killer in the field, wind and with Cinematography Pro. It also has Venice Color Science, which uh, they take from Sony's Cinema Line. So if you wanna go Hollywood, that is an option. Whether I'm in the studio or on the go, I always love to have a pro image and that's where the Xperia Pro I comes in. And I think even my audience expects, you know, an elevated image from me. So it is really great to have that in a smartphone. The Xperia Pro I is just that. Photography in its essence is about emotion. Capturing that emotion takes more than a good eye. It takes having the right camera and the right moment. Sony took all the speed from the existing cameras, combined it with all the advanced technology from the Xperia line to create the Xperia Pro I. Street photography happens fast. The fleeting moments that create the best images are gone with a blink of an eye. Fast action, low light, wild contrast swings. This new Xperia can handle it all having a 1.0 type image sensor and dual aperture f2 and f4 lenses in the camera on my phone is a complete game changer. The bokeh, the low light capabilities, never in a million years did I think I would be able to create images that rival my mirrorless camera on my phone. With three different focal lengths, it's like having a full kit of lenses and Xperia's Photography Pro allows you to shoot in auto, manual, or any way in between, giving you full control over all its settings. It features real-time tracking and real-time IAF. It instantly locks onto your subject wherever it is. With built-in optical image stabilization, my handheld images are sharp. And its dedicated shutter button it has a feel-in function that I'm used to with my Sony cameras. Xperia Pro I has light and fast autofocus, covering 90% of the frame and it shoots in bursts of up to 20 frames per second. Xperia's high sensitivity sensor handles night scenes like a champ and with little noise and mind-blowing dynamic range. Its T-Star coated lenses practically eliminate reflection, flares, and ghosting. So whether I'm shooting into street lights or the sun, the image comes out perfect. As a professional, I always use a strap with my cameras and with the Xperia, same exact thing. Plus with a water-resistant body, I know it won't get damaged even as I carry it around the city. Because Xperia records in 12-bit RAW, it provides smooth and rich files to work with in post without any banding to worry about. And thanks to 5G capabilities, I can upload and share my images immediately. Or I can use Xperia's removable SD card for quick transfers and hot swaps up to a terabyte. Nothing captures the emotion of a moment like a perfect photo. And now with the Xperia Pro I, have the ability to capture that perfect moment at all times.
Prospering in this environment is challenging. When you give kids a voice and you give them access, greatness is sure to follow. This allows for more kids to be exposed to what their passion is going to be. We always say, you know, you can't be what you can't see. What we're creating for our community is growth. Think of the wildest and craziest things that you can do to change the world around you and then use this support to make it happen because you have a whole team behind you. At B&H, we're here to help folks find what they need. Give us an example there, Irving. There was NASA. NASA? What did they need? A unique hospital at Lens. We often have what others don't. For all your needs, big or small, check out bnh.com. This is a real B&H customer story about Fred Smith here, turning lemons to lemonade. Fred, tell us your story. I was a fitness instructor in Atlanta, and I transferred to New York March 13, 2020, right as all the studios shut down. But with B&H's help, I started Workout with Fred. The challenge for a fitness instructor when they're streaming from home is you've got multiple sources of audio. I didn't know how complex that was, and that's where B&H came in. Whether I was on the chat or I called, anytime I had a question, they had a solution. I was like, ah, I wish I'd called you earlier. Thanks for sharing your B&H story with us, Fred. Visit us at bnh.com for expert advice on starting your next project. <laughs> I take for granted all these moments sometimes. Oh, I don't need the stars to align. No matter what you always have my time. No matter what you always have my time.
the fire that is within you is the same that is within us all. A spark traveling through the night. A torch burning in time. And it is how we use that time that will define our story. The creative mind can shape worlds out of thin air. Imagine the unimaginable. See beyond the impossible. We give meaning to life. And life gives us meaning back. It's not just about what we see. It's about the way we see. Together, we dream upstream into the headwinds. Against all odds. Come on! Seeing the world through a lens unlike any other. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our friends around the world, and welcome to Sony Creative Space. I am Michaela Yon of Sony's Alpha Universe, and I am thrilled to welcome you to what's going to be an amazing event today. My name is Miguel Quilas. I'm a Sony artisan of imagery, and we are going to have a lot of fun today here at Creative Space. Welcome. So we're live from the Digital Media Production Center in Los Angeles, California, and this is the first time we're in person in two years. Yeah, it's weird. Like you're it? here in person. Like, yes. Wow, it's crazy. How, do, how are we doing this again? <laughs> it feels I don't know. like a dream. Two years blew by. What, it, what have you been up to for the past two years? Well, you know, trying to keep up with shooting, uh, creating a lot of content for my YouTube channel, as well as for Alpha, Alpha Universe. Universe. So if you haven't seen that, definitely check it out. So speaking of content, amazing content today, all day today. Better settle in because we have some awesome stuff coming up. On the workshop stage, we have our friend Christopher Robinson of Alpha Universe. He's going to be hosting some amazing content creators. He has Chris Burkhardt coming in, Allison mm -hmm. Anderson of the Alpha Imaging Collective, uh, your friend artisan of imagery, Andy mm -hmm. Mann. Mm -hmm. Cinematographer Gonzalo Amat is going to be with us as well. And in between the sessions, we're going to have portfolio reviews with Brooke Shaden and Mahesh Tapa. And the best part about it all is you can ask all your questions live. You have questions, we have answers. Yes, indeed. And that's really awesome. That's all exciting. But there's more, right? We have live photo shoots that are happening right here, live, right here. in person, which is really cool. We've got the amazing Scott Robert Lim, the awesome Greg Noir, one of my favorites, Anita Sadowska is here. She's gonna be doing live photo shoots with models. Uh, Jeremy Cohen is here. We have music, we have pets, little cute dogs. I was in the back, we've got these little tiny hats. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Definitely wanna check that out. And we have models, so we literally Everything. have it all. I mean, I'm good with just the dogs. I mean, I was cool the with dogs. the dogs with the little hats. You guys need to see yeah. that, but you gotta see yeah, the hats. yeah, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, we, we were doing rehearsals yesterday. It was absolutely amazing. Some really crazy shoots coming your way. So um, tune in because you're really gonna love it. And we're gonna get all the live shooters in a panel at the very end. And if you're in the United States, we have some crazy giveaways throughout the day. So after every live shoot, we're gonna announce a winner for one ZV-1 camera, one of my faves. And after Andy Mann's session for Xperia, we're gonna give away an Xperia Pro I. Awesome phone. Beast awesome of a phone. phone. So I'll take one of those. <laughs> I want one. I will talk to, uh, you know who. We'll make some calls. We'll make some calls. <laughs> so definitely lots of stuff going on. And at the very end of the show, we are giving away an Alpha 7 IV kit. Crazy. And an Xperia 1 III. So stay tuned for that. If you're watching this right now, you are entered in both of these and you're in the United States and all that, you know, check out the terms. Yep. But um, it's gonna be a lot of fun all day long. 
And again, there's more. We've got these amazing digital boots here. We've got Xperia, we've got Pro Support, Alpha Female. There's gonna be a lot of great presentations throughout this entire day. Really excited for those as well. And classes that are being held by amazing content creators that you also won't wanna miss. Absolutely. And we have a couple of new features in Alpha Universe that we prepared specifically for Creative Space, which we're really excited about. The first one, we have downloadable photo walk maps. So we have a Creative Space collection that we just launched today. There's five cities, go check them out. And you will find um, a lot of places in these cities where you can take awesome shots. Mm -hmm. So um, if it's your city, go check it out. If not, you know, post on social, let us know what city we should do next. And, uh, more to come in that um, arena. But yeah, our collective did an amazing job for it. It's pretty awesome. Looking forward to seeing that. And we also have this virtual gallery, which is kind of nuts. Um, there's going to be a lot of incredible photos that are uh, being shared in that gallery from the community. So uh, you can access that through the event homepage, or you can go to alphauniverse.com, which you should kind of go there anyway, because beyond just the virtual gallery, there's a lot of great stuff there as well. Absolutely. Uh, I checked out the virtual gallery earlier. It looks really good. It's like being in an actual room with photos on the walls, and you can check out each one of them. So it's Hashtag really nice. Science. <laughs> Hashtag science. Hashtag <laughs> science. Gotta technology. love technology. You gotta love it. Yes. Um, so lots of stuff's coming your way today. Stay with us. Uh, you know, stay hydrated, relax, yes. uh, settle Stretch in. Out. <laughs> and stretch yeah. out, settle in, lots of amazing stuff coming your way. And remember, this event is for you to ask your questions, to meet with other people in the community, to connect. Uh, you never know who you're going to meet next. You never know who you're going to interact next and sure. uh, what will come of it. So make the most of it. And on behalf of the Sony team, uh, our production team, thank you for being here. You're the reason we're doing this. Uh, so enjoy, and we will see you around in the event chat. See you.
Hey everybody, this is Chris Burkhard. We are in the field in Iceland. It is a beautiful, chilly day. It's about 28 degrees Fahrenheit with a lot of wind, so sorry about the noise. Um, today I wanted to do something I'm pretty excited about. It's a, it's a what's in my bag kind of overview for when I'm shooting in cold weather. Obviously, wherever I am in the world, what I put into my backpack really changes, but oftentimes the essentials stay the same and my kit really stays the same. And today I wanna to go over a little bit of that. And so first and foremost, this is my camera bag. Um, it's a custom Mountain Smith bag. To be honest, doesn't matter what kind of bag you're using, you pick the one that works for you and you just roll with it. For me, the key is to kind of have something that can fit extra space, extra layers. I'm not a big fan of bags where all it can fit is the contents of your camera because on a day like today, I need gloves, a puffy jacket, hand warmers, a headlamp, etc., etc., etc. So let's break it down and let's go through it. First things first, water bottle. Preferably insulated because on a cold day, it's nice to have something where you can have some hot water or some tea or something like that. Now, inside my bag, my camera cube. This is also a Mountain Smith camera cube. It's something that I use on every shoot, every trip, because I don't like to have my camera stuck inside my bag, inside of like a rear opening. I wanna be able to have something where I can put my bag down, run around, shoot, work out of the bag, work out of this little tiny pouch here. Inside this bag, what I have is memory cards, extra batteries, right? And I open this up right here. Nice wide opening so I can be shooting. I can put this on the side. I can hike with it. I can strap it to the front of my pack, et cetera, et cetera. In here I have one camera, three lenses. I have a Sony A1 with a peak design strap. This is a 16 to 35. Every time I go out and shoot, the 16 to 35 is the first lens I have on my camera. It's just the way I translate the world. It's, it's what I always see things through and it's kind of um, the lens that I, I most commonly use. So it's nice to start with it at the beginning of the day. On this is a circular polarizer. Also in here, I've got a little portrait lens. I've got a 35 millimeter right here. Um, and I also have the big boy, the 24 to 70, which is like kind of the all around, just go getter lens, right? It's kind of the thing that works for almost everything you're doing in most situations. Now, this would be kind of like my basic kit. If I was going around shooting, say a catalog, clothing catalog, something like that, um, this is kind of pretty much all I would be using, these three lenses, right? Unless, you know, obviously I need to shoot some action sports or some night photography, things would change, right? Things are always evolving depending on what you're shooting and where you're shooting. But most of the time, this is my go-to. Now, also in my bag, below that, what you'll find is a 70 to 200. This is just in its own case, 70 to 200, right? Sony, it's a little f-stop pouch. The reason I like this, this little pouch is because if I wanted to, I could put this into my water bottle holder on the side of the bag, or I could kind of, you know, put the 7200 in there. I've got another lens pouch. I don't always need the 7200 on the side of my, my person. You know, I can, I can kind of have it accessible at times, and I love having it in its own separate little pouch. Also has a waist belt strap, so if I am shooting and I'm in the field and I got this backpack on, I can strap that around my waist, put the 7200 right here, and I have access to it all the time. Now for the good stuff. Now for kind of the stuff that you're like, well, what else is in that bag, right? Um, gloves. It's freezing out right now. My mouth is getting numb just talking to you. <laughs> so gloves. Typically, I bring two pairs. This is my lightweight pair of gloves. Just a little pair of black diamond kind of thin gloves where you can use your phone. Also, big puffy jacket, right? And a base layer with a shirt. On my bottoms, I've got a pair of pants. It's kind of like a water-resistant pair of pants with a pair of thermals underneath, thick socks, waterproof shoes, a beanie, and always a balaclava, which is basically just a uh, kind of a neck warmer, gator warmer. It's really nice when you want to cover your mouth, you want to cover your ears, and you're in cold conditions, right? But it's important to understand kind of where do you fit all this stuff? Where does it go? How does it work its way into the bag? Well, at the base of my bag, I'll always carry a little something like this. This is actually a peak design, kind of just like um, expandable like uh, clothing carrier or something like that, right? Um, and in here, I've also got like a little towel, right? Wipe my face, 
you know, shooting by the ocean, you need to wipe off a lens, a camera. I've got a thicker pair of gloves, pair of black diamond gloves, thicker pair of gloves here. And I have a rain shell in here as well because if the weather gets really bad and if it gets really harsh, I want to cut the wind. And the rain shell is the way to do that. Right now, this is a puffy jacket. These are great for keeping you warm. But if you need to really cut down on that, you know, Arctic breeze, rain shell is the way to go. So I keep this guy in my bag, kind of sits at the bottom. Right. The one thing I'd say is it's important to me always, everything you have has to have a zipper pull kind of like this that's long so that you can use it with gloves. Because right now, my hands, they're freezing. I can barely feel them. If I'm trying to reach and pull strings and grab my bag and kind of put it away, it's going to be really hard, right? So I need to be able to feel things. I need to be able to have stuff that has a long zipper pull. You'll often see that I'll replace zippers with something bigger like this. Um, I want to be able to have something I can grab and easily access. So now the bag is basically empty, right? At the bottom of this bag, I have a waterproof cover. I just pop open this thing. Waterproof cover goes on. If I need it, it's there. Um, now working through some of the smaller items, um, if I am hiking with this bag, I'll potentially put in a, a water bladder that's as easier to access than maybe a, a water bottle, which I really like. Front component of this, headlamp, always accessible, right? Little black diamond headlamp, I love this thing. Always have it at the ready. This one's like a 350 um, lumen light, just in case I am like coming down a trail at night, it's dark, need to be able to see. Uh, what else do I got in here? A pair of AirPods, right? Something to listen to music to. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the beach somewhere and it's just freezing out and I'm, you know, want to kind of get my mind off of what I'm doing and I've got to just, you know, get a podcast going. So headphones are great. Um, what else do I got? I have a big front compartment here. And this is what I'm saying about having a bag that has space, something that you can get into. You can pack extra stuff. You're not worried about just all I have is space for three cameras, which I think a lot of photography backpacks or people when they go out, that's all they have space for. And I'm like, well, where are you going to put all your other stuff? Where are you going to put your gloves? Where are you going to put your beanie? Where are you going to put your jacket? So for me, this is kind of what I'll use. And I'll, I'll use this little storage bin to put everything else. Now, uh, these are two graduated neutral density filters. Uh, what is a grad? A grad is basically a, a piece of ground glass that um, is dark on top, light on the bottom. So when you're shooting a landscape, you can put this in front of your camera and you can darken that bright sunset and bring the exposure back to that kind of that foreground there. Um, I'll also carry, I'll carry two grads with me. This is a, a nine stop grad. And then I believe right there I have a six stop grad as well. Also in this bag, a pair of sunglasses, right? Not going to get sunny today, but these are great to have. And I can't tell you how many times I've been out shooting and I'm like, oh my gosh, my eyes are fried. Looking at the camera, looking at the ocean, it's glaring, it's bright can barely see sunglasses are crucial okay um what else do i have in here a carabiner why a carabiner because a lot of times i'm kind of strapping this camera bag to maybe the back of a seat somewhere or to something in a car and i want to have a place to kind of hang it off right i don't want this thing to be jostling around in the on a dirt road somewhere so having a carabiner is really helpful um, it's also great for attaching some of these lens pouches and other things what else a hat just in case it gets sunny, right? I can put this hat over, maybe it's too hot. I wanna kinda, you know, have something to uh, strap in right here, put my balaclava over it, just good to have. Also in here is going to be a micro spikes. What are micro spikes? They go on your shoes. And this is just a tiny little pair of shoe traction for today just right down this path, it's super icy, like unwalkable icy. And so I wanna have these so I can slip on my shoes. Pretty much they go on any shoes. These are amazing to have, they weigh nothing. They are something that every photographer should have in their bag if you're shooting in the winter time. And just if you wanna be extra safe, like if you're shooting even in kind of frozen mud or in kind of a grassy hill where it's wet, micro spikes add a lot of traction. These are these little tiny easy pair from Black Diamond. I love bringing them, they, they pack into their own tiny little pocket and they just kind of disappear. It, it literally takes up no space. And so this is something that honestly, it's like as silly as it sounds, it can kind of save your life. What else do I got in here? Okay, this pocket, nothing. This pocket right here. Uh, three very important things. This, <laughs> I love these odd random things. This is a tiny little, ah, 
lock, right? Goes around the camera bag, allows you to potentially lock this bag, wrap it around a couple times, lock this bag to a car, maybe to a um, like some kind of bolted area underneath a seat in a house. If I'm worried about theft or security, I want to just be able to wrap this around something. Obviously, it can get cut. Obviously, the bag can get cut. But oftentimes, when it comes to theft, even just seeing a lock is a huge deterrent for theft. So I, I tend to bring it with me. It's something that's safe. If you have a Pelican case, I love having these as well. Um, hand warmers, right? Little hand warmer pack. This is being used right now. It's in my pocket because it's freezing outside. These are super crucial. I mean, they go such a long way to keep you warm. I personally love to put hand warmers early in the day inside my gloves because when I put my hand on my gloves, it's already just this awesome warm environment. I'll also sometimes keep the hand warmers, a couple extra pairs, next to my batteries for my camera because if you shot the Northern Lights, it's negative outside, it's freezing cold, you know the camera batteries, regardless of who you're using, they just tend to die a little quicker. So those are really helpful to use and something that kind of always makes its way into my bag. Last thing, last but not least, a little charger. This has been by Nightcore. It's a carbon fiber charger plus a little charging cable, USB-C. Awesome piece to use. This can charge the Sony cameras just in case something happens, you know, your camera battery's dying, whatever. Also charge your phone. Also charge a headlamp. I mean, so much of what we use nowadays, you guys, is based upon our the fact that we need to charge it, right? Everything we use is electronic. So having that's really helpful. Um, this bag, it's pretty much pretty much the contents of this bag right now, actually. That's that's it. Um, the last, maybe most important thing is, is a lightweight tripod. I've been a big proponent of the Peak Design tripod. Um, really easy. It's kind of like folds down to the size of like a Nalgene pretty much. Really thin, right? And the thing I love about it um, is that you can basically with, with kind of one hand and glove operation, you don't need to be twisting it. You can just go like this and the whole thing just clamps like that. Super easy, right? So I love um, thinking about oftentimes how is it going to be out there when it's freezing cold? How do you utilize uh, your gloves and, without having to take them off? Because if I had to take my gloves off to put away my tripod, take my gloves off to grab a bag out, that's just robbing you of heat the whole time you're out there shooting. And I really want to be conscious of not losing heat, especially if I am out here shooting surfing or if I'm shooting something like that where I really want to be in the elements as long as I can. This thing's awesome. It kind of just can slide either into the side of the bag right here. It can slide into the water bottle holder. It can even slide in this front pouch. But having a, a spot for a good tripod is huge. Now, one of the things I really look for in a bag personally is, and this is, might be controversial, is I'm not a big fan of bags that open from the back. Reason being is because I oftentimes am taking my backpack to a place up on a mountainside, hiking with it long distances. I need to pack in maybe even more, so maybe a sleeping bag, maybe a tent, maybe food. And the fact that you are compromising a back system, you know, a support system on the back of your body where there's a zipper never really sits well with me. I like being able to have a system where I know that I can I can hike with it first and foremost, right? That's kind of the specialty. Now, how I get in this bag is I usually will open it up here or I can sling it like this and I have a big, massive side zip. I can actually access my camera here. So this is really helpful. It's something really nice and something that I kind of help design. Um, Personally, I think that any camera bag will work, but I would just kind of think of it from your use case, right? What's the, what's the place that you want to use it the most? How do you want to have it help you? I tend to rely upon a slightly bigger bag. This one is right around 40 liters, and it has a collar that extends up to about 50 liters. Um, I think that typically for a good day bag, if you're shooting somewhere cold, kind of a 35 liter to a 55 liter is a, is a great size. Well, you guys, it's freezing out. I can't feel my face anymore. Um, I've got some snot dripping down my nose from the cold and I'm um, psyched to be here, psyched to take you in the field with me. I've been shooting in Iceland for the last 15 years or so. This is about my 50th trip and I've learned a thing or two about shooting in the Arctic and I can't wait to see the images you create out there. And remember folks, stay warm. Uh, it's cold out there and I can't wait to see the images. Cheers.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Space. I'm Christopher Robinson, editor of AlphaUniverse.com and host of the Alpha Universe podcast. And I'm here today with Sony Artisan of Imagery and the incredible Chris Burkhardt. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's always a pleasure. Before we get started, I want to remind everybody that we are live. And after uh, having watched Chris's presentation, um, we're ready to take your questions. Please send your questions through during the, the chat or in the chat. We'll be taking them during this session. And I also want to remind everybody that uh, we have a lot going on today. This is just the beginning of our program. Um, and you can win cameras. There's live shoots to see. We're going to have other presentations here. And that's all coming up. But before all of that, we're going to get to Chris Burkhardt. And again, Chris, thanks for being here. And I want to kind of kick off uh, this little session by just asking generically, as, as, you're, as I watch that video, um, <clears throat> I'm curious, what does a piece of gear, like, how does a piece of gear earn its summer and in this case I'm packing my bag knowing first and foremost where I'm what I'm going to be doing during the day if I look I look at the weather every morning when I'm on a shoot and that's the first thing I'm really tuning into is it going to be icy is it going to be snowy am I going to be getting in after dark there's kind of certain staples that always stay in the bag like a hand warmer a headlamp a snack a phone charger but then other things you know like an insulated piece of equipment or an extra pair of gloves or a rain cover or things like that that might that it might, might oscillate. oscillate. So, so a lot of it is stuff I will use outside of photography that I found that work really well. If I'm on a hiking trip and I find that perfect jacket, that that goes in my bag. So much so that oftentimes the stuff that earns its place in my bag I'll have double of because I want to make sure that um, that I don't have to that I'm not taking it out to use for something else. It's almost like it always lives there, so I can pick it up and I can be ready to go. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's going to be that stuff that, that just is, is, is always in the, in the bag. bag. And then there's going to be some stuff that you kind of um, like want to reevaluate, like almost not every time you go out maybe, but just in general, keep it, keep tabs on because a bag can get overloaded with stuff. And one day you look at it and it's got a lot of stuff that you're just never using. Totally. And, and it's, it's funny, funny because, because this, this is, is such a, a, a simple subject, right? Like I've given talks for Sony on more elaborate concepts and photo shoots, but what's in my bag is kind of like the photographer's playbook it's like the holy, holy grail. grail to, to me, me it's, it's almost, almost like, like what's most, most precious you're kind of showing all your cards and in many ways i i found that creating this especially on location i had just got done shooting i literally pulled off found a cool spot to film this we were it was you know 15 degrees out you can see my lips and my face are all purple i wanted to show people what was really in the bag right there on location in the moment um you know, you had that bag with you, like you said, when you were in Iceland. And I just want to ask a couple quick questions to clarify, because you mentioned some lenses in particular, the mm -hmm. 16, 35, 35, and the 24 to 70. Yeah. Um, are those are those GM lenses? Which ones are they? Yeah, they're all GM F2.8. The 35 is the F1.4. Um, obviously, my my kind of, I guess I call it like the portrait lens or the specialty lens, it'll oscillate depending on what I'm shooting. If I'm going to be shooting night images, I might be putting in a wider lens, like a 24. Um, if I'm shooting portraits, which that's what I had to do that day, I was shooting some portraits or product photography, a 50 millimeter or a 35. But I, I really stick to um, the F2.8 uh, you know, GM lenses. I want to have the best glass I can, especially when I'm shooting in more... Um, limited lighting situations that's really important having f2.8 or or lower is crucial because again it was iceland it was november it's really dark out we had four hours of available daylight so i i was really pushing my lenses to the limit you know um i was curious about the the 35 in your bag there when you had the 16 to 35 and like you said it's the gm what situation would you use the the prime 35 versus the 1635 Excellent question. I mean, really, it comes down to f-stop, right? Like if I'm if I'm shooting something where I want, want a shallower depth of field, I want to set my subject or my product apart from the background. That's really important to me. I'm often looking for something that can uh, be utilized in a in a kind of a number of situations. It has to earn its way into the bag, like you said. So to me, usually a 35 or a 24 millimeter, that's almost my go-to prime. I really like the way it translates to my eye. 
And again, it's, it's usually for maybe a night scene, maybe a, a lower light scenario. If I'm shooting at dawn or at dusk, maybe there's something, um, maybe there's something a little more focused on like, a, a, again, a portrait. Um, that's typically where I will pull that lens out. But I would say during the day, you know, when the light is brighter, I'm just kind of using that, the, 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 the zoom lenses almost, almost exclusively. You know, um, we were talking before, uh, before we started here that um, we can talk all day about cameras and lenses, but one of the things I really loved about this video is that you really gave us um, a, a look at the other stuff, the things that aren't just the cameras and the lenses that really right. are, are so necessary for, for a shoot. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, it's crucial because I think that you, as you mentioned, things have to earn their way into your bag. It's often for me, it's not the camera or the lenses. Those are kind of, you, you know, you're taking those with you. Those are crucial. You know, you, you, you use them day to day. It's the other stuff. It's the water bottle. It's the extra food. It's the, it's the, you know, the slip on, um, you know, uh, chains that might go on your, your shoes to give you some traction on snow. It's, it's a good tripod. Those are the things that to me, they kind of define a great image or being able to get out there in the field, um, having your micro spikes, having, you know, a portable charger for your phone. Um, I, to me, that, that made all the difference. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten back from a trip and I did bring a headlamp and I'm wandering around in the dark. I mean, that's, that can kind of make or break a great image. Oh, absolutely. Um, I know that as we started this segment, we we kind of lost our feed for just a second here. This is one of the things that happens when you're you're doing things live. It's it's TV without a net, and um, I want to just kind of come back and and ask my my first question again in case somebody somebody missed it. I was asking about the lenses that you have, and you showed the sixteen thirty five, the thirty five, and the twenty four to seventy in the video. And I was curious yeah. as to whether they were the the GMs or the um, you know the the uh, the F four versions, especially of the zooms, and also the thirty five, which thirty five it is. So if you can come back to that again. Yeah, yeah, those are all the GM versions, the F two eight. I'm I'm typically shooting in harsher conditions where the lighting is oscillating between bright and sunny to dark, and I I want to have the best in class. I need to have something that. Um, that I know I can, I can, you know, dial down the f-stop or dial up the f-stop and get exactly what I need. The 35 is the 1.4 version. I usually have that with me for portraits or landscapes or something that's a little bit lower light or where I want to separate my subject from my background. But I find that in my traditional kit, you know, I'll have my zoom, like my bigger zoom, a 70 to 200, my, my two um, mid-range zooms, and then I'll usually have one specialty lens with me. Um, that will oscillate between a 24, a 35, and a 50, depending on what I'm shooting, right? Uh, if it's night photography, it might be more of like the 14 or the 24. If it's more portraits or, or people, then, you know, I need to use the 35 or the 50. Thanks very much for that. And just to remind everybody, we are, we are live with Chris Burkhardt, and we are taking your questions with, with Chris Burkhardt. Send your questions through in the chat. We're going to get to as many as we can. And one of the questions that came through in the chat, and, uh, and Chris, again, you and I were talking before, and I knew this one was going to come through, about the bag itself that, that you carry. And I was really curious yeah. as to whether that's um, one that's a, a prototype custom made for you, or if it's one that people can, can buy off the shelf. So um, the bag that I'm using right now is made <clears throat> by Mountain Smith. It's a prototype, but it's really based upon a, a number of bags that I've used in the field. A lot of times I... I have something that I, I don't really like about photography backpacks where the, the rear opens, mainly because I like to be active, I like to be moving. So my bag has a side zip where you can actually open the zipper um, from the side kind of while you're moving. I, I tend to like that only because it, it allows me to be more mobile, allows me to kind of be out in the field a little more. Um, Oftentimes, this is really similar to like a ski pack or a climbing pack or something more sport specific. I find that when I'm shooting in the field, I tend to be focusing more on the sport that I'm shooting or the or the pursuit that I'm doing as opposed to just a general photography backpack. Because setting your backpack down, unzipping the back, it's tedious. It takes a lot of time. I, I don't like that process. I think that backpacks themselves are something that we just tend to kind of accumulate. We're always searching for the perfect one. Um, I know I don't have uh, Mountain Smith on speed dial to, to design one uh, just for yeah. me. So I, I envy you in that. But it's like one of those things, always like a search for finding the perfect bag. You know, and, and you had mentioned that side zip. I've had uh, bags like that with the side zip. And 
I would I would say to anybody who gets one of those, if you if you get one, they are awesome. But make sure you practice with it a little bit uh, before you actually take it out into the field. It's really easy to uh, just kind of forget to zip that that side zip back up and sling it back over your arm. Totally. It definitely takes a, a minute to kind of figure out. It takes a second to really understand and dial it in. But it, they can be really, really advantageous when you are kind of when you have other gear with you, trekking poles or or climbing gear or something like that, where you, you really need to focus on, on, you know, some other task at hand. Totally. We got a question in the chat, um, especially about the, the cold and you were up there in Iceland and it was, as you said, really freezing cold. Um, what do you do with your batteries in those situations while you're shooting? That's an excellent question. I've actually been asked this a lot and I have a couple tricks for people. First and foremost, when Sony kind of re-updated the battery with the R4 and the, the A1 and the S3, they went to a larger battery. Now that has vastly improved my ability to shoot in the snow um, and in cold weather. But another tip I would say is that there's three things. First of all, I like to keep my batteries close to my chest in like a pocket, you know, kind of right there. If I have a, a couple of them, I'll put them in a neoprene case, tiny little neoprene sock. And that will kind of keep them together warm. If I'm really worried about the cold, the next step is to put a hand warmer on the outside of that, like a foot warmer that has a sticky piece. You attach that to it so it can keep them warm. I would say the very last thing would be to actually attach a little foot warmer to the outside of your camera um, where the battery door is just to kind of generate a little extra heat there. It's also nice on your hands. So those are kind of my three tips. I would say that just in general, being conscious of the fact that if you're keeping batteries in a car, and you're leaving that overnight outside, it can get below freezing. So be, be careful with that for sure. Yeah, those hand warmer and foot warmer things are, um, are just worth their weight in gold. I think that that's a, um, an underappreciated accessory to kind of always have in your bag. We're talking about stuff that you always wanna have with you, make sure that it's in there. That's like one of those things that just stays in the bag. Yeah, and I, it's funny because I love the hand warmers, but the foot warmers are nice because they have a sticky piece on it. So you can actually attach it to uh, a camera, a lens, something like that. They, they can stay anywhere. So I, I really tend to have like maybe two or three of those in my bag at all times. Chris, you mentioned that you carry uh, ND filters with you. And I was really um, interested in that. And we got a question in the chat um, about them, just uh, whether you ever use circular NDs or only the rectangular um, grad filters, but even before we get to that specific question, um, just talk about using NDs because in this day of, of Photoshop, I think some people might be surprised that you are out there with actual physical NDs. I, I you know, call me a, a purist. I really like trying to create it in the camera. So a lot of times I will use a, a you know, ground glass, a rectangular piece of glass that, you know, is a graduated neutral density filter is typically what I lean towards. I'm not really just using a straight ND because I'm not shooting video, um, but usually a grad helps me to darken the sky or the sunset and then allow for my foreground to be a little brighter. I, um, you know, this is probably the worst piece of advice that anybody will give, but I, you know, I don't tend to use the, the full on-camera systems where you drop it in. I tend to just hold mine. I know it's not the perfect way to do it, but the one thing I'll say is that when it's, you know, five degrees outside and you have all this, you know, infrastructure in the front of your camera, you tend to not use it. So I, I feel like for me, I need something that I can easily hold. I can easily get out of my bag, use it. I don't always want to have that equipment on my camera. Maybe if I was going somewhere to specifically shoot one shot, I would. Um, but oftentimes I'm looking for ease of use what can fit easily in the bag, what will be pulled out of the bag and is more likely to be, to be kind of used. So that's kind of where I go with it. I think that's really a great tip. And, you know, I, I hear you about having, you know, a lot of apparatus on your camera can really slow you down. And the next thing you know, you had a, a cool idea and it's just like your head gets a little bit too much into tightening a filter and not enough into what you're seeing out in front of you. Totally, yeah. Do you ever use the um, the screw on NDs, or do you stick to those those rectangular ones for the control? I, I stick to those rectangular ones for the control, typically, uh, because I, I want to be able to, you know, if my horizon is tilted, I want to be able to move it pretty naturally. So that's kind of what I what I lean towards. We also got a question: um, Do you use off camera lighting for any of your landscape work? And if so, can you, you give know, an example? That's a great question. I typically don't, um, it, unless I'm shooting a commercial shoot where I, I need to have a strobe or something like that. 
but I, I, I am, I'm often hired because I'm a naturalist. I like natural lighting. I really try to celebrate and appreciate natural lighting, but occasionally I'll bring more constant lighting, maybe like a loom cube or some kind of little light. Um, I, I don't really like flash so much as, as I, or a strobe so much as I, I like to have constant lighting. I think I can see my scene a little better in that, in that regard. Um, but I would say that 90% of the time I don't use that at all. Um, I do, however, uh, like to use like a reflector sometimes when I am shooting portraits or something just to bounce a little bit of light. That's super nice as well. How do you carry a reflector with you? Do you just kind of use that carabiner? Uh, you know, I mean, I typically I'll carry something small, one that kind of binds up into a little circle and, um, and that can usually pack into the back of my backpack really, you know, tucks away into nothing, you know, just something kind of small to kind of give the face a little more light if I need to. I, by the way, I love that carabiner tip. That to me is like right up there with uh, WD-40 and duct tape, you know, have a, have a carabiner Dude. with you, just thousand and one uses. The, the other thing I have in my bag that I, I didn't have on that was I usually do have a very small roll of duct tape. Nice. along with maybe a, along with maybe like a small Leatherman, you know, if you're traveling outside the U S it's hard, but I love having a small Leatherman, like something with scissors, something with a, a little multi-tool. That's probably the one thing I wish I had in there. I, I, I love those kinds of like little things that you just want to have in that are so utilitarian, like a thousand uses. And, you know, you can go um, a whole bunch of, of sessions, never touching it, but then it's something's yeah. going to happen and it's going to be the perfect tool. Totally. <laughs> we got a question about um, changing lenses in the field. I know a lot of people always have questions about this. Oh, man. Um, what tips yeah. do you have for changing lenses in the field to protect the sensor and rear glass of the lens? You know, the first thing's first. Just if you keep the sensor clean when you, when you have the opportunity, when you're back at your hotel room or in your car, when you, if you keep the back of the lens clean, that's also another one. People never look at the back element. It's probably like the number one culprit for dust. Right. So you got to look at the back element of the lens, clean that out. My biggest thing is like gravity works. Don't let gravity work against you. Let it work with you. So when you do change the lens, tilt the camera down, undo the lens, put that lens somewhere, like just, just drop it. Doesn't matter. Put it wherever you want, put it between your legs, put it in the armpit, put it in a pocket and then get the other lens on there as fast as possible. But the, the orientation of everything should be down. You also want to turn the camera off. You want to demagnetize the lens or the sensor, sorry, when you're doing that because you don't want dust to be absorbed there. So for me, a big part of it is typically if I have an oversized jacket, I will unzip it. I will hunch over. I will kind of almost pull it over and I will do all of this right here. And this is why I use a side bag for my cameras because I don't want to be having my backpack on the ground, you know, getting, letting stuff get wet. I have it all kind of hanging off my body. I'll have my side pouch right here and I will just put that lens right on there. So that's typically how I operate as well. You know, I was really interested that um, you didn't have a, um, a camera cover, like a waterproof camera and lens cover in your bag. Is that something that you, you ever use or do you just find them to be, you know, not especially helpful? You know, it's funny because there's only a very specific time when you need that. You know, if you're, if you really are shooting in the pouring rain, then that makes sense. But typically I'm not shooting in pouring rain. I'm, you know, the conditions aren't that great to shoot. So I'm usually it's in the snow where it's cold and you don't need a camera cover because you can just dust off the snow or I'm in a situation where it's lightly misting. And usually what I'll do is I will just bring an oversized rain jacket and I will tuck the camera in there. And a lot of times I'll have a little, um, like a little towel with me, something to dry it off. I don't find myself being subjecting myself to shooting and pouring rain for hours at a time. If I do, or if I am, then I would use a camera cover or a housing. Yeah. I like to um, have like a microfiber towel with me just kind of all the time. If I'm out in a little bit of drizzle, you just kind of use that, wipe off the camera lens and no, no problems. And then, you know, Same. when you're out like shooting in the snow, you know, snow is like, snow is dust as long as it doesn't yeah. melt, you know, just brush right. it right off. The drier it is, the, the, the better it is actually. And I find that whenever you have a camera cover on or, or a plaque cover, you're compromising your functionality with the camera. So that's really challenging to me. Chris, we got a question. This is getting a little bit a uh, field of, of just what's in your bag, but um, about uh, your card readers and your external hard drives and just kind of that workflow. So what are the card readers and, and drives you use and how do you kind of keep things organized? when you're on some of these, uh, these big trips to a place like Iceland? 
That's a great question. You know, typically I don't carry any of that in my bag first and foremost. And I, I what I really should do is I should do a workflow um, video for the next Sony creative space. Cause this is a question I do get a lot and it's a really important question. Um, it would take sadly hours to explain because we sure. have a whole digital, digital backup system. We call it the dam, right? Data asset management. Um, but typically what I do is I, I use the Sony tough cards. There's a really small, um, USB-C to Sony tough card reader that we use as well. Um, and then I'm using solid state drives. They're just about this big, one terabyte, two terabyte solid state drives. I usually have two of those. And on bigger shoots, obviously, I will bring a dedicated digi kit, like a digital technician kit where I've got a laptop. It has both those drives. And, and just as a quick kind of, you know, overview, what I do is when I upload the images, I upload them to two places at once. And I do that through a program called Photo Mechanic. And then from there, it goes on to being organized, cold down. And then eventually, once I have my selects, I take them into Lightroom, post-process them and save them as DNGs. But that's that's like taking a very long conversation and whittling right. it down to 30 seconds. So I'm sorry. <laughs> No, that's great, and we will uh, we'll hold you to that. We'll do a, a whole workflow piece uh, for the next creative creative space. I think that would be really yeah. interesting to hear how you do yeah. that. But thanks awesome. for giving us that that kind of thirty thousand foot view. I think that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Chris, we got a question. I think it's a great question about um, you know safety in the field. And do you carry anything for safety when you're out you know in nature and out in the wild for for a long time? Um, you know, typically I, I don't. I think that the most important thing you can have with you is just a a really solid set of, of skills and, and common sense, you know, and I think that being cognizant to where you are doing your research and knowing, obviously, if I'm in bear country, I might carry bear spray. If I'm in an environment where I feel unsafe, I'll, I'll first question why I'm there and I'll make sure that I have somebody with me who can um, watch my back, I guess. Um, but I think that the most important thing is always uh, alerting somebody as to where you are. If you're going out on your, by yourself on a hike, um, either telling somebody where you are, having a check-in time, having a spot locator is really important. If I am on an expedition, I'll always carry like a spot locator or a GPS locator of any kind. Um, there are now some great wearable ones that are really like pretty inexpensive. And, you know, um, I think there's one called like somewhere and, and bivy mm -hmm. stick and things like that. Um, those are always good to have. And I think just like, you know, your significant other will appreciate it. Um, but I don't, necessary bring any like weapons of any kind <laughs> sure. um, with me you know a tripod works pretty well as a um as a, as a weapon if you need it to do you carry like a mini first aid kit at all just in case great question yes always i feel like i've got a little tiny waterproof one that you know basically i've kind of built myself i've taken out the things that i don't need and usually if i'm in a larger group i'll make sure that there's there's multiple first aid kits but typically i just have enough for me um enough to kind of like you know make sure that, you know, wounds are healing and things like that. And, and I think a big part of that is when you are in an expedition, the, the bag changes, right? It evolves, the camera gear might get smaller. That's when I might bring a, an F4 lens or a lighter lens. I might even bring the A7C because I want to make more space for stuff like first aid and other things like that. So. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we are live with Chris Burkhardt here today. Please, we're taking your questions. Go ahead and submit questions through the chat. Um, and uh, we're talking about his bag and how Chris works when he's, when he's out in the field. And kind of, Chris, getting back to what you were just saying about safety in the field, and I just want to spend a second on this because you said something that really um, I think is important and it speaks to me, is you know, just kind of you know, preparing and, and making sure that you've you know, kind of done your research and you know what you're doing and, and not having that mindset of, well, I'll have a cell phone so I can call for help. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I think that, uh, you know, that's, there's a lot of that that happens and it's, it's, not, it's not super helpful when, you know, you're saying, well, if I get myself into trouble, I know I can call someone else. And, you know, if you think that through, get them into trouble with me <laughs> trying to, yeah. you know, to save me, you know, you do kind of want to really spend some time and, and, and think about it. Yeah, I love this question, Chris. And I think that the key thing is, you know, if I'm going out by myself, I'm always thinking through, um, you know, what would happen in any situation. And I want to be prepared for all of those what ifs, right? Now, you, you don't want to take that over the top and bring a million things, but you do want to have a plan. And so I like to make a plan, think through that, okay, if I'm going out, how am I going to, um, you know, self-rescue or how am I going to call for help or how am I going to deter myself from this? But I truly feel like the greatest 
asset you can have in the field is knowledge and the idea of, of how you can protect oneself, how you can kind of, uh, again, avoid any sort of catastrophe, um, thinking through it, giving, giving, giving time and really spending time scenario, you know, creating scenarios in your head, not because you want to scare yourself, but because you want to protect oneself and you want to make it so that, you know, you feel safe. So. Uh, I think that's, it's such a great point and I'm, I'm glad you, you expanded on it there. We've been talking quite a lot about your, uh, your cold weather gear and your cold weather bag. And of course you were shooting um, that video out in, in subarctic uh, or in the Arctic um, in crazy cold conditions. Um, but how does your bag change for, for warmer weather? Uh, great question. Typically, you know, my, the, the bag itself wouldn't necessarily change, but I think what I might have in there would, would change a little bit, you know, no micro spikes, no micro tractions, um, you know, something along those lines where I'm, I'm you know, I might have in there a, a pair of sandals, you know, board shorts, uh, um, you know, I might have in there some, some bug spray, some sunscreen, just things like that. You know, my bag will obviously evolve slightly having more hydration, more water, more space dedicated to those things. If I'm in the tropics, I might be getting in the ocean. So I might have a pair of uh, swim fins in there, maybe a water housing, all of that can tuck into that bag. So typically I'm trying to avoid, you know, having a different bag for every situation, but rather just changing up what I might bring. You were mentioning a second ago um, that, you know, depending on, on what you're shooting, where you're going, if you have to be ultra light or something like that, you might switch out the, the camera body and everything. And I think people will be really, really interested in, in hearing a little bit more about that because, you know, the Alpha One is going to be your, your go-to, um, but, you know, you're, you're a professional photographer. You've got a lot of bodies. And, you know, what, what are some of the other ones that you'll use and, and on what conditions? Yeah, so if I'm going out shooting something that's low light specific, the A7S would be my, my body of choice, right? Um, a lot of times my bag is just, that's what's kind of going with me day to day, but I might have a, a couple extra pieces of camera gear tucked away on a check-in bag or in a roller or something like that, of course. Um, so keep in mind, this isn't just like the only thing I'm throwing on my back when I travel. I've got clothes, I've got other stuff. So I usually will have a couple other bodies with me. An A7C is usually a great backup body. If I'm going on a hiking or trekking expedition, everything's going to get trimmed down. Lighter lenses, uh, the lightest gear I can bring, you know, the lightest body. So that's where the A7C, the F4s come in handy. If I'm going out at night and all I'm going to be shooting is astro or night photography, I'll probably bring an A7S, no 70 to 200, and maybe just two or three uh, potential prime lenses. Um, other than that, I think that, you know, it, it varies if I'm shooting a portrait assignment where I just need prime lenses, it might just be the a the, the a7r4 and a 50 and 85 or 35, maybe I don't need a 70 to 200. So what I kind of showed today was more of like a general kit that I would use for a situation like this. But that's, that's typically what I would bring is, is what I showed in the video. Sure, sure. Do you have a story or can you relate an anecdote about um, kind of a piece of that um, sort of non-camera gear that that has bailed you out in a in a spot that's uh, that sticks out in your memory. I mean, I would I would say every single piece of gear there has a story behind it. It's why it's in the bag, right? I mean, specifically micro traction, micro spikes, right? That is crucial. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people go to Iceland for their first time and it's like October or November and they're like, oh, I couldn't go to that waterfall because it was icy. And I'm like, well, you're, you're in the Arctic. I mean, <laughs> did you not think about that? So for me, I learned the hard way. I learned just like that. You know, I went there and I was like, I can't go and get that shot I want because I didn't have the gear. Um, and I remember times where I was using my tripod sticking my tripod in the snow, trying to come up, climb up a, a really short, steep hill, but I was just sliding down. My shoes had no grip. You know, I'm, I'm literally like smashing my tripod into the ice, trying to climb up this, this icy little hill. Um, it was the silliest thing. And I can't even remember which waterfall. I think it was a Adafoss or something like that. Um, but I, I just felt so silly. I felt so stupid because I didn't bring this, you know, $20 piece of equipment that was like this big. And that could have enabled me to get the shot. So Almost every piece of equipment in there, you know, headlight, I have a million stories about headlights. <laughs> yeah. um, they, they've, they've kind of, they're, they're, they're worth their weight in gold, really. And so that's kind of the, the key thing. We got a question, and a minute ago you were talking about um, some of the, the lighter gear, and specifically um, the lighter lenses you use. You mentioned some of the F4, like the, maybe the 1635 F4, 24 to 70 F4, but what are some of the other like ultra lightweight lenses for those times when you really are trying to go super light but still have some some diversity? In yeah, I would say like the 18 to 200 um, or the 24 to, to one 
to 120, right? Is it is an F4 lens? It's kind of like I think it's called like or sorry, 24 so 24 to 105. To 105. Uh, yeah, I think it's called like the the, the you know the people sometimes call it like the master of none, you know, because it's not this lens. It's not like the the epic you know, portrait lens, it's not the perfect zoom, but what it does is it kind of gets you everything you need. And I would say it's the lens that like, if I'm up in a plane somewhere, or if I'm, I'm going on a really lightweight bike backpacking trip or bike packing trip, I want to have one lens that can do it all. That's usually my go-to. And, you know, don't, you know, don't misread that name. It can absolutely get incredible shots. It's just not the lens that's like, it's not your night lens. It's not your portrait lens. It's not your, you know, your zoom lens, but it, it kind of gets everything you need. And it does so in good enough quality to actually print the images, submit to the client and still have something exciting. And again, to me, I think that, you know, Sony has done a great job of making the F4 lenses and then they make the 2.8 and they make the kind of uh, multi tiers of higher yeah. end lenses. So I tend to try to have a set of, of both pending on the assignment that it takes me. There's even like within the 35 millimeter, there's a pancake 35, that's a two eight. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's three other or four other 35 millimeters. So for, if I'm going on a, a kayaking trip, the, the pancake lens is a great one or, or some trip where I just need a really small lens on my body. I mean, it almost disappears. Yeah. That's a lens that the, the 35 to eight pancake is a great one to take. I also like some of the other pancake lenses. If I am traveling really light, I might bring one 24 to 105 zoom, but then I might bring two other small pancake lenses because I'm not sacrificing quality. And at the same time, I'm still able to kind of have a couple shallow low light lenses that work pretty well. Absolutely. You know, that 24 to 105, I, I, I love that lens. And I think of it like in the, the 80, 20 rule where like it just does 80% of the stuff you, you, you want to do. And it does it really well. That other 20%, you really do need something, you know, maybe a little bit different and it's just not going to be the right choice there, but it just does so many things well. Um, but I hear you about like, it, it gets that reputation of just doing like a lot of stuff really well, nothing yeah. super, super great. Yeah. Um, it's well, just such a handy thing. It is. And that's, that's a part of it, right? It, the best camera is not the one that you have with you. It's the one you're willing to take out. Yeah. And if that lens is attached to your camera and it's there, you're going to use it. It doesn't matter if you have a, a, you know, an F1485 in the back of your pack. It's like, what, it's all about what's the easiest thing to use and what's the most convenient at the time. We are live uh, with Chris Burkhardt. We're taking your questions. Send your questions through in the chat. We've got just a couple more minutes here. This has been such a great session. Um, I, I got a question that came in here um, about um, what are some of your experiences with checking your equipment? Do you, do you carry yeah. on? Do you check? How do you handle that? I know you travel on some small planes. That's a great question, Chris. And something that honestly is a, is a good thing to talk about because what I've found is that depending on which plane you're flying to, a lot of times you have this tiny commuter plane to get to like somewhere larger or a bigger, bigger aircraft. And so you can't, you know, put your bags in the carry on. I've had so many situations where I get hassled at the gate. Right. And, um, and usually what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I need to prepare for that. So what I have is my cubes inside my camera gear. I want to make sure that I can easily pull those out because what will often happen is I can pull out those cubes. I can, I can check those overhead and they might make me, you know, plain side check my bag or check my bag. I've even gone so far as to carry with me like a super, super lightweight foldable kind of duffel that can, that packs down to something like this, where if I needed to pull out my camera gear and they were in their own case, I could at least put them in that little duffel and then put them on the plane. Um, obviously when you have a backpack, it's fully loaded. It's got, you know, extra pair of shoes and jackets and this and that, it can be pretty bulky. So you have to be conscious of that. I think this is why having something that can slide out and, and can kind of hold all your gear comprehensively is really important, like a big ICU or internal camera unit. I've, I've found that that's bit me in the butt too many times. Um, so I try to be safe now. No, that's, that's such, a, such, such great advice. And you've done so much travel. You have just that, that great perspective. So thanks for that. Um, we're, we're just about out of time. I, I have a, a question for you. You mentioned um, about you know, always having headphones with you and you yeah. know, kind of always wanting to listen to something. Um, what's on your playlist? Oh man, good question. Uh, you know, it's funny cause I, I think that if I'm out like hiking in nature, I don't want to have, you know, I don't want to have music blaring. Um, but it's oftentimes when you're maybe like waiting for sunset or you're sitting there and the light's great, you know, it's going to get better. Or it's a night photograph. You're waiting for the moon to, you know, rise or the Milky way. And you're just, you just want to kill some time. 
I think that having a great podcast is really helpful. Um, I usually have like four or five of them. Like I save the good ones and I'll usually put those podcasts in like a queue for like when I really need them. Right. Um, and then my playlist is usually kind of a, a mixture of, I, I love like movie soundtracks. I love like the kind of electronic, you know, and also more theatrical movie soundtracks. So I'll, I'll, those get me inspired sometimes. Um, I'll have a lot of folk music on there. I'll have obviously a classic rock playlist that I have to have in there. So it kind of oscillates for the mood. I think sometimes when I'm like, you know, really wanting to feel like that cinematic um, excitement, I'll, I'll throw on like, I don't know, something from like Interstellar or something like that. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's a mix. It's a mix for sure. I'd love to see what's on yours, man. I bet it's good. <laughs> well, we'll have to swap some playlists. I really like uh, like the um, the movie soundtrack. I don't do that, but that's such a great yeah. idea. I'm going to I'm gonna add that. I've got like now yeah. the, the theme to How the West Was Won rolling exactly. through my head right now. That's awesome. Hey, Chris, thanks so much for being here. This has really been great. It's uh, always a pleasure to see you. Um, I want to remind everybody that uh, we're here live all day today. Head over to the live shoot stage where Scott Robert Lim is going to be doing, um, you know, a nice session about showing you how to upgrade your, your lighting game. And here um, I've been live with Chris Burkhardt. Chris, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, buddy. As always, a pleasure. Really great to see you. Thanks. Cheers. fire that is within you is the same that is within us all. A spark traveling through the night. A torch burning in time. And it is how we use that time that will define our story. The creative mind can shape worlds out of thin air. Imagine the unimaginable. See beyond the impossible. We give meaning to life. And life gives us meaning back. It's not just about what we see. It's about the way we see. Together, we dream upstream into the headwinds against all odds. Come on! Seeing the world through a lens unlike any other. Are the thought sparkers, the street dreamers, the wind hunters, the fire seekers, collectors of color, trappers of time itself. <laughs> and it's how we use that time that will define history.
My name is Sarah Dichi, rhymes with peachy, and I am a YouTuber based in Dallas, Texas. So I'm always on the go. I need something fast enough to keep up with YouTube life. I am super excited for the Xperia Pro I. It is crazy to see the depth of field that you can get with it and is pretty insane that it's coming from a smartphone. Xperia has a brand new on-the-go solution called Videography Pro that combines all the features that a run-and-gun filmmaker like me needs. I can access different lenses, cine looks, and switch apertures between f2 and f4. I can check it out with a ton of accessories, an external mic on top, a multifunctional grip where I can zoom in and out, and also a portable vlog monitor. This is really great because you can still use the rear cameras and I can still see myself. It's honestly crazy that I'm recording this on a phone because it looks like a movie. It, it looks so good. And it has a video shortcut key where I can just pull it out of my pocket, press it, and I am off to the races. Eye autofocus keeps lock on my eye, so I'm in focus whether I'm here or back here. And just like shooting with my Sony Alpha cameras, it has optical image stabilization. And that way I have assurance that my image is going to be steady, it's not going to be shaky. Shaky video footage is always very, very distracting. The Xperia Pro I is slim, it is water and dust resistant, and it is packed with a ton of features. Xperia shoots up to 120 frames per second, and I can also shoot 4K HDR, which is great for capturing beautiful colors for your video. One might think that being a YouTuber means that image is everything, which it is, yes, but audio is just as important. Xperia has added a third unidirectional microphone, and it almost has the effect like you're just there with the person. It also has a sound source separator that uses an intelligent wind filter. What that means is they figured out how to deal with the biggest sound killer in the field, wind and with Cinematography Pro. It also has Venice Color Science, which uh, they take from Sony's Cinema Line. So if you wanna go Hollywood, that is an option. Whether I'm in the studio or on the go, I always love to have a pro image, and that's where the Xperia Pro I comes in. And I think even my audience expects, you know, an elevated image from me. So it is really great to have that in a smartphone. The Xperia Pro I is just that. Photography in its essence is about emotion. Capturing that emotion takes more than a good eye. It takes having the right camera and the right moment. Sony took all the speed from the existing cameras, combined it with all the advanced technology from the Xperia line to create the Xperia Pro I. Street photography happens fast. The fleeting moments that create the best images are gone with a blink of an eye. Fast action, low light, wild contrast swings. This new Xperia can handle it all. Having a 1.0 type image sensor and dual aperture f2 and f4 lenses in the camera on my phone is a complete game changer. The bokeh, the low light capabilities, never in a million years did I think I would be able to create images that rival my mirrorless camera on my phone. With three different focal lengths, it's like having a full kit of lenses and Xperia's Photography Pro allows you to shoot in auto, manual, or any way in between, giving you full control over all its settings. It features real-time tracking and real-time IAF. It instantly locks onto your subject wherever it is. With built-in optical image stabilization, my handheld images are sharp. And its dedicated shutter button it has a feel-in function that I'm used to with my Sony cameras. Xperia Pro I has light and fast autofocus, covering 90% of the frame and it shoots in bursts of up to 20 frames per second. Xperia's high sensitivity sensor handles night scenes like a champ and with little noise and mind-blowing dynamic range. Its T-Star coated lenses practically eliminate reflection, flares, and ghosting. So whether I'm shooting into street lights or the sun, the image comes out perfect. As a professional, I always use a strap with my cameras and with the Xperia, same exact thing. Plus with a water-resistant body, I know it won't get damaged even as I carry it around the city. Because Xperia records in 12-bit RAW, it provides smooth and rich files to work with in post without any banding to worry about. And thanks to 5G capabilities, I can upload and share my images immediately. Or I can use Xperia's removable SD card for quick transfers and hot swaps up to a terabyte. Nothing captures the emotion of a moment like a perfect photo. And now with the Xperia Pro I, I have the ability to capture that perfect moment at all times.
Prospering in this environment is challenging. When you give kids a voice and you give them access, greatness is sure to follow. This allows for more kids to be exposed to what their passion is going to be. We always say, you know, you can't be what you can't see. What we're creating for our community is growth. Think of the wildest and craziest things that you can do to change the world around you and then use this support to make it happen because you have a whole team behind you. At b &H, we're here to help folks find what they need. Give us an example there, Irving. There was NASA. NASA? What did they need? A unique hospital at Lens. We often have what others don't. For all your needs, big or small, check out bnh.com. This is a real B&H customer story about Fred Smith here, turning lemons to lemonade. Fred, tell us your story. I was a fitness instructor in Atlanta, and I transferred to New York, March 13, 2020, right as all the studios shut down. But with B&H's help, I started Workout with Fred. The challenge for a fitness instructor when they're streaming from home is you've got multiple sources of audio. I didn't know how complex that was, and that's where B&H came in. Whether I was on the chat or I called, anytime I had a question, they had a solution. I was like, ah, I wish I'd called you earlier. Thanks for sharing your B&H story with us, Fred. Visit us at bnh.com for expert advice on starting your next project. I take for granted all these moments sometimes. Oh, I don't need the stars to align. No matter what you always have my time. No matter what you always have my time.
fire that is within you is the same that is within us all. A spark traveling through the night. A torch burning in time. And it is how we use that time that will define our story. The creative mind can shape worlds out of thin air. Imagine the unimaginable. See beyond the impossible. We give meaning to life. And life gives us meaning back. It's not just about what we see. It's about the way we see. Together, we dream upstream into the headwinds. Against all odds. Come on! Seeing the world through a lens unlike any other. are the thought sparkers, the street dreamers, the wind hunters, the fire seekers, collectors of color, trappers of time itself. <laughs> and it's how we use that time that will define history. My name is Sarah Dichie, rhymes with peachy, and I am a YouTuber based in Dallas, Texas. So I'm always on the go. I need something fast enough to keep up with YouTube life. 
I am super excited for the Xperia Pro I. It is crazy to see the depth of field that you can get with it and is pretty insane that it's coming from a smartphone. Xperia has a brand new on-the-go solution called Videography Pro that combines all the features that a run-and-gun filmmaker like me needs. I can access different lenses, cine looks, and switch apertures between f2 and f4. I can check it out with a ton of accessories, an external mic on top, a multifunctional grip where I can zoom in and out, and also a portable vlog monitor. This is really great because you can still use the rear cameras and I can still see myself. It's honestly crazy that I'm recording this on a phone because it looks like a movie. It, it looks so good. And it has a video shortcut key where I can just pull it out of my pocket, press it, and I am off to the races. Eye autofocus keeps lock on my eye, so I'm in focus whether I'm here or back here. And just like shooting with my Sony Alpha cameras, it has optical image stabilization. And that way I have assurance that my image is going to be steady, it's not going to be shaky. Shaky video footage is always very, very distracting. The Xperia Pro I is slim, it is water and dust resistant, and it is packed with a ton of features. Xperia shoots up to 120 frames per second, and I can also shoot 4K HDR, which is great for capturing beautiful colors for your video. One might think that being a YouTuber means that image is everything, which it is, yes, but audio is just as important. Xperia has added a third unidirectional microphone, and it almost has the effect like you're just there with the person. It also has a sound source separator that uses an intelligent wind filter. What that means is they figured out how to deal with the biggest sound killer in the field, wind and with Cinematography Pro. It also has Venice Color Science, which uh, they take from Sony's Cinema Line. So if you wanna go Hollywood, that is an option. Whether I'm in the studio or on the go, I always love to have a pro image, and that's where the Xperia Pro I comes in. And I think even my audience expects, you know, an elevated image from me. So it is really great to have that in a smartphone. The Xperia Pro I is just that. Photography in its essence is about emotion. Capturing that emotion takes more than a good eye. It takes having the right camera and the right moment. Sony took all the speed from the existing cameras, combined it with all the advanced technology from the Xperia line to create the Xperia Pro I. Street photography happens fast. The fleeting moments that create the best images are gone with a blink of an eye. Fast action, low light, wild contrast swings. This new Xperia can handle it all. Having a 1.0 type image sensor and dual aperture f2 and f4 lenses in the camera on my phone is a complete game changer. The bokeh, the low light capabilities, never in a million years did I think I would be able to create images that rival my mirrorless camera on my phone. With three different focal lengths, it's like having a full kit of lenses and Xperia's Photography Pro allows you to shoot in auto, manual, or any way in between, giving you full control over all its settings. It features real-time tracking and real-time IAF. It instantly locks onto your subject wherever it is. With built-in optical image stabilization, my handheld images are sharp. And its dedicated shutter button it has a feel-in function that I'm used to with my Sony cameras. Xperia Pro I has light and fast autofocus, covering 90% of a frame and it shoots in bursts of up to 20 frames per second. Xperia's high sensitivity sensor handles night scenes like a champ and with little noise and mind-blowing dynamic range. Its T-star coated lenses practically eliminate reflection, flares, and ghosting. So whether I'm shooting into street lights or the sun, the image comes out perfect. As a professional, I always use a strap with my cameras and with the Xperia, same exact thing. Plus with a water-resistant body, I know it won't get damaged even as I carry it around the city. Because Xperia records in 12-bit RAW, it provides smooth and rich files to work with in post without any banding to worry about. And thanks to 5G capabilities, I can upload and share my images immediately. Or I can use Xperia's removable SD card for quick transfers and hot swaps up to a terabyte. Nothing captures the emotion of a moment like a perfect photo. And now with the Xperia Pro I, I have the ability to capture that perfect moment at all times.
Prospering in this environment is challenging. When you give kids a voice and you give them access, greatness is sure to follow. This allows for more kids to be exposed to what their passion is going to be. We always say, you know, you can't be what you can't see. What we're creating for our community is growth. Think of the wildest and craziest things that you can do to change the world around you and then use this support to make it happen because you have a whole team behind you. At b &H, we're here to help folks find what they need. Give us an example there, Irving. There was NASA. NASA? What did they need? A unique hospital at Lens. We often have what others don't. For all your needs, big or small, check out bnh.com. This is a real B&H customer story about Fred Smith here, turning lemons to lemonade. Fred, tell us your story. I was a fitness instructor in Atlanta, and I transferred to New York, March 13, 2020, right as all the studios shut down. But with B&H's help, I started Workout with Fred. The challenge for a fitness instructor when they're streaming from home is you've got multiple sources of audio. I didn't know how complex that was, and that's where B&H came in. Whether I was on the chat or I called, anytime I had a question, they had a solution. I was like, ah, I wish I'd called you earlier. Thanks for sharing your B&H story with us, Fred. Visit us at bnh.com for expert advice on starting your next project. I take for granted all these moments sometimes. Oh, I don't need the stars to align. No matter what you love, is have my time. No matter what you love, is have my time.
Welcome everyone to this Sony Creative Space. We are so happy to have you here. My name is Brooke Shaden. I am joined by Mahesh Thapa, and we are going to be doing some portfolio reviews today. So um, I personally do sort of conceptual fine artwork, a lot of self-portraiture, and in direct contrast, Mahesh does uh, landscape, nature, um, people documentary and it's going to be a really fun mix i think to go through some of these portfolios to see exactly what it is that we can uh, critique is the wrong word i would say um look for the good and what can be improved and hopefully just love on a few people during this session and so um mahesh thank you for being here thanks to everyone for joining us today Oh yeah, thank you. It's such a pleasure. Uh, first, uh, it's I feel honored to be to be sharing the stage with with Brooke, an amazing Sony artisan, and so talented and so nice and kind. I've, I've seen your work so often, and I'm just I'm I'm just awed. I was just talking a few minutes ago that <laughs> that I've, I'm just blown away by the talent that's out there. So even previewing the portfolio, I'm like, wow, these guys are pretty amazing. So if we can help improve somebody's uh, little perspective every here and there and and praise people i think it's going to be a great session yeah so let's jump in then to the first yeah. portfolio um which is katie nielsen and i'm i'm really excited to look at this portfolio there's a lot of creativity going on here so um when we look at that very first um image that's on the home screen i think that it's important to start there the you know what your alpha universe profile looks like and um, it's kind of an interesting thing to note just that there's a flower on the homepage and then the next image that we're going to see sort of replicates that theme. Um, so we're going to jump right into the first image, I think. Okay. Now here we have um, an image with milk and flowers and a subject. And um, this is pretty indicative of how creative this portfolio is. So Mahesh, do you want to begin? Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, I was, I was sort of looking through this portfolio uh, the other night and uh, I was just amazed at, I think, I think the best thing I can say about the portfolio as a whole is that I feel like there's very little editing done and most of it is just out of camera work and whatever lighting was available. I don't think the, 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 I, I would, I'd, love, I'd love to be corrected if I'm wrong, but I don't think people, this person spent a lot of time fiddling with the technicalities, but I think it's just the raw uh, image and raw subject matter that's out there that she's, uh, that she's captured. And I love how this expression is captured in her face. Uh, you know, I like the, the beautiful mix of the, of the white background and the, and the yellow colors, and I think really complements the skin tone of the, uh, of the model very, very well. Uh, if you know, what I did notice on, on a lot of these images where everything was kind of centered and I'm sort of a stickler for, for certain compositions, I think centering works well for a lot of things. Uh, I think just varying up that, that sort of theme as, as you sort of go forward in your, in your compositions and in your, in your photography helps a lot, even if it's a, a sense of experimenting to see how, how different compositions and crops work. Uh, this, I think, may have worked very well as a vertical also. Uh, but I, but I'd really like sort of the mix of the white background uh, and the skin tones and the beautiful colors of the flowers here. And I was personally really drawn to um, something a little bit different, which is something that's a bit hard to put into words. But there seems to be this really interesting mixture of hyper realism to your images uh, mixed with magic and and kind of a sense of the otherworldly and when I look at that it creates a very interesting dynamic that sort of fits into modern magazines the way that um, a lot of people now are shooting hyper realistic images where you see the texture of the skin you see the bits of makeup on somebody and it's kind of um, like up close and personal, but then it has this beautiful milky water and these um, flowers that are stuck to the skin. So from a conceptual point of view, I find this a really interesting mix. Then as we go through the portfolio, um, I'm going to probably suggest again after this that I almost want to see you push that further. Like how much more 
like dirty and gritty can we get with these people who are being photographed while ramping up the magic in the image at the same time so that the sense that I'm getting is really kind of exploded on the screen. Great. Brooke, you want to start with this one and then I'll, I'll yeah. sort of chime in? Yeah. Sure, sure. So with this image here, um, we have a huge shift because we've just seen a, a subject in milky water with flowers. Now, there's still this floral theme going through your whole portfolio, which I noticed that there's there are elements um, of softness and beauty rolling through each image. But here we have an image that is lacking a subject, which is not to say that every image must have a subject, but I find them almost two separate portfolios in a sense, because one is clearly focused on uh, what's out there, the nature, the beauty of the landscape, while the other one is focused on the human subject. So I find these almost fitting in two separate portfolios. And from you know my point of view, when I see an image like this, I almost want to see this image if it's going to be connected to the first one or anything that comes after, almost as a diptych or a triptych or something like that, where this image is paired with an image of a subject so that we're seeing the element, of the floral element run through one to the next and they're paired together. Yeah, great, great points, uh, Brooke. I, I think, I think, your your observation about sort of sub hunting for a subject is uh, uh, is telling. Uh, I I think uh, I like the portrait images in this portfolio uh, more so than I do the landscapes because you know, my heart is in landscapes and there are certain elements I always sort of look out for even though you know there's no no classic image. Uh, when I see an image like this, this is uh, obviously uh, Yosemite with um, with that beautiful background. Uh, it is taken during midday, which is which is okay. I think you know certain images work very well in midday, but I'd love to see this uh, with a little less harsh of a light, a little bit more control of the uh, exposure, particularly of the background. And the one thing that I that always catches my eye when I look at a landscape image is the horizon or what what's conceived to be the horizon. Uh, and the horizon here to me is basically the slope of that grass meadow as it reaches the mid-ground uh, conifers or, or evergreens. And there's a slight slope to that heading downwards towards the left, which my eye is immediately drawn to. I think that if we, even if that's not the true horizon, it gives the idea that that's the horizon. So if we could correct that for some reason, uh, you know, again, at your discretion, I think it would be a more powerful image. And I personally find that for a subject an image like this, I want more things in focus because it is a landscape. So those little uh, purple flowers, particularly in the very immediate foreground that are that are out of focus, I find that to be a little distracting personally. I don't mind the background being distracting because you know I know what that that monolith, that structure is. Uh, but I want to see more of that foreground in focus. So maybe um, increase the depth of field by narrowing the aperture, uh, or perhaps choosing a different focus point so more of the foreground is in focus at at the sacrifice of the background. Uh, so I think, like I said, the portraits on this portfolio, I like a little bit more than the landscapes. Great, okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, this image is really interesting to me from a conceptual point of view, and it links to the first one, I think, pretty well. Um, but Mahesh, do you have any any uh, technical notes that you wanna bring up here? You know, I, 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 I really like this image in the sense that there's a lot of color, there's a lot of emotion. Um, you know, when I see images with smoke, and I seem to see a lot of those uh, uh, on the internet, and, and it's that, you know, the ones that are the most powerful for me are the ones where, you know, either there's a lot of smoke or there's a very little amount of smoke, there's a hint of smoke. Uh, and if it's just a little bit, it's I sort of think, huh, you know, what exactly is the function of, of the of the color and the smoke in this particular, is it really contributing to the overall feel of the image? Uh, and the fact that a few wisps of color are going over the forehead and the right cheek, uh, I find that to be a little bit more distracting than, uh, than, than actually helpful. And I feel like I want to see, what are her shoes? I want to see the shoes a little bit more. I feel like the toes are cut off a little bit, you know, too much. And maybe, you know, compose it so that, you know, I don't need, need to see so much at the top, but I want to see a little bit more uh, of the entire uh, subject matter. Again, my my reviews are going to be more technical and 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 sort of what I'm sort of wanting to see and, and wondering what else could be a, could there be. So that's that's the way I see this image. 
Great. And I feel the same way as well about this image. It it almost feels like we need to push this a lot further. And part of why I say that is because we have a subject who's posed um, very beautifully. She's got her hand up. She looks very casual. Um, But that kind of goes against the smoke that's up at the top of the frame. And my mind immediately starts to ask, but why is the smoke there if she seems to not really be acknowledging it or interacting with it at all? So from a conceptual standpoint, I would encourage you to try to match every element of the image so that it's all speaking to the same um, goal. And that goal might be an emotion that you want to elicit. It might be a story that you want to tell, but whatever it is, make sure that the subject, the location, the props, the elements that you see are all working toward that same goal. So I think that if she were even looking up at the smoke or had a hand up interacting with it, it would give more of a sense of, oh, I understand understand why that's there. But I do love the color of this image. I love, again, the same thing that I loved in the first one, which is there's this sense of realism of it being very much in the moment and tangible, and yet something magical is happening. So I just push it further. Um, that's my my note for that one. Okay, so this one, again, it's I, I see that these images are sort of alternating from... Um, you know, it's portrait to landscape or nature. And this one sort of goes back. And I do think that it's a separate portfolio. So looking at it as separate from the portraits, I think that this could sort of be a an insight into a larger story here in terms of a story about nature or this place that we're exploring. I happen to really love images like this that give us a lot of texture that are really close that just give us a sneak peek of this place. And so now I would love to see what images come after this. Like, where is this? What is it like? What's the emotion of the place? What's the color story of this place, which we're starting to get a hint of here. And I think that there are ways that we can link these to you know the the nature shots to the portrait shots for example if there were just a hand resting on that spot that would show a connection from human to nature for example but assuming that the goal is not to introduce a person I think that this is just an introductory shot I just want to know what else is there about this place so uh, when you're going out and you're exploring places ask yourself what is my connection to this place and how can I tell that story through my lens Yes. Uh, personally, I think this was the weakest image in her portfolio. Um, and, uh, and, and not to say that it's a bad image, uh, but again, what is the subject here? Is it that little um, moss? Uh, is, it, is, it, is it that uh, a fallen uh, cone or those little brown stripes in the, in, the, in the foreground? And that white on the back, on the right side, is so bright. Is that is that snow? Is that water? You know, it's 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 overexposed, and I, it just keeps drawing my eyes. I think that green and the textures that you mentioned is so beautiful, and I want to pay attention to that area. But my eyes are so drawn to that very very white area on the right hand side, uh, I, I I get distracted, and I, I I I I think this could this would be helped with cropping out the stuff on the right. So it's almost like, are we trying to make a macro out of this? Are we trying to do a shallow depth of field landscape? I have a hard time deciding what exactly it is. And you know, on the on the website for for the portfolio, I wish one feature I wish it had was the ability to make at least two separate portfolios, so we can separate one subject matter or one theme from another, so they don't all have to uh, sort of be mishmashed into one. Uh, one list of images. That's I wish I could do that, but you know, barring that, I know it's very difficult because we love all these different types of images. We love to take different types of images, uh, and I think the hardest thing to do is deciding what to show and what not to show. Uh, so, uh, although I do like elements of this image, I think this is this is probably the weakest image in the series of port- uh, of images that we've seen. Great. Okay, do you want to start this one, Mahesh? Sure, yeah. Uh, now, I like this uh, quite a bit. You know, I, I even like the, the, the warm tones here and the, and, the, and the harshness, if you will, of the light because the whole subject is harsh. It's, it's dirty. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's gritty. Kind of what, to, to steal your term, this hyper-realism, you know. Uh, I feel like I want to get even closer, you know, where I don't have to see 
uh, so much of the outside of the hands, you know, maybe focus more on the face and just the fingertips and just get the texture of that dirt uh, and be able to see the individual eyelashes and see the strands of hair where it goes from that clean blonde to this uh, mud caked uh, look. So overall, I, I, I really do like this image a lot. And I think this is probably my favorite image of the portfolio just because it is so I know exactly what the subject is, and I and I like the, the dichotomy of the clean and dirty, the dark and the light. Um, um, you know, yeah, that's what I think. I agree with much of what you just said, and I, I think it's also one of the stronger images in the portfolio. Part of why I think that is because there's a real commitment here in, in all regard. Clearly, somebody got very messy for this photo. I absolutely love that. I love getting messy for images. I think it's great to see that commitment, but there's also the connection with the subject and the camera. There seems to be a lot of thought put into how the hands are going to be positioned. Then I think that that makes this a stronger image. And just to even take it further, I would love to see if you were to take another hour to play with this subject in this particular light and all of that, you know, what could you do to even further the story? Could you have her smearing the dirt across her face, covering her eyes, um, smearing it on her lip, you know, like how else could we play with this so that it's not just showing the dirt off, but so it's really interacting um, with the subject and also playing with depth here. Um, that's something that I haven't seen a lot of in the portrait work is a, a focus on depth. So even reaching the hands or hand forward or having the subject lean in so that it's not so straight and flat onto camera would be really interesting. But I do think that this is a great image to end the portfolio on because it shows that there was a lot of thought put into it. There was intent. And I think it comes across really nicely. All right, I guess I'll get started. And we're gonna move a little bit more quickly now because we've already gone 16 minutes and we spent quite a bit of time on that portfolio. So Karthik Subramaniam, I think, I hope I'm not butchering that name, uh, but I think this is uh, getting to my forte, <laughs> nature photography, animals, landscapes. Uh, and I love this this opening image uh, of that eagle. And I think, I think that may actually be the first image, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah, it is actually the first image. I love, how you could see the droplets of snow uh, against that dark background of the wings. I love how you can see that single eye positioned perfectly between those two feathers as it comes out. Uh, the crop is a little tight. I want to say a little bit of space on either side uh, of the wings and the bird. And one other criticism is that I want to see the exposure just a little brighter because the snow here doesn't really look white, at least on my screen. It looks kind of gray and snow and the eagle's head is supposed to be white. It, just to the edge of it being blown out, and I think that may have been because you were trying to increase the shutter speed so you didn't get a blurry image. But even in post-processing, I pushed the exposure just a little bit. But otherwise, a beautiful image, uh, maybe in Alaska. I don't know. That's what I'm thinking. Um, I love this image and I, I really love this whole portfolio. This is not my forte, which means that I just find everything incredible because <laughs> I have no idea how to accomplish things like this. But what I really like about this image and subsequent images that we'll see uh, is that there's a very clear color palette to a lot of your images. And because of that, I get the sense that I'm there. Like I feel the grays of this. I feel the blue of this. It feels like I look at it and I feel cold. And I love that I can feel that from an image, even that's so that's cropped so tightly where we don't get a ton of context. We get enough that I understand this. Plus it's about the intensity of this eye. I mean, you're, it, we can't stop looking at it. It's just straight dead center of the eye. Great. We're going to move a little I think faster. It's, it's really beautiful. So let's move on to the next. Um, I, I'll start this one because I feel the same way about this that I did the other one, even though it's drastically different. There's a clear color story. The composition draws my eyes straight in. And again, I feel like I'm there. And I don't know what the goal of your work is. I can't say that you set out to do a certain thing. But what I can say that you've done for me is you've given me a sense of place and a sense of time and a sense of urgency, which I think is super interesting in landscape, nature, um, you know, shots like that, where I feel like I have to be there right now at this time to experience this. And it's a beautiful feeling. Fantastic. I love this image. It reminds me of something of like the Palouse in Eastern Washington or Tuscany. Not sure exactly where this is taken. I love the different layers uh, where the image is broken up, the light, side light coming in. 
Uh, the telephoto effect, which is probably taken with a very long lens, uh, two, 400, 200 millimeters, 400 millimeters, something like that. I love the compression that it's, that it's, that it's elicited here. Just, just love it. Not much else to say. So I'll start with this one. Uh, again, this is Yosemite seems to be a very famous place. I do like this image, but I think it is probably the weakest of all the images on this portfolio for a couple of reasons. One, I think there's there's too much vignetting, too much darkness in the left-hand side, the upper and the right side. It's uh, I don't know if it's artificially placed uh, or or there's or the wide angle made it so that there's a vignetting. But I like the color, the fall colors. I like the reflection. I feel like the reflection itself could be just a little bit brighter. Uh, and I think even if you crop this out a little bit on the left-hand side, much of the dark part going going away, it would focus my eye a little bit more in the yellow color in the foreground and those majestic peaks in the distance. I very much agree. I think that we see images like this a lot where there it's a beautiful landscape. We see the reflection. I understand why you would go for the vignetting on the outside edges to draw the eye further in. But I think that with an image like this where it, it's very popular to attempt to capture something like this. Everything has to be spot on. So for example, the amount of space um, below the mountains in the reflection versus above should probably be more equal. Um, everything just has to be so tight. So I think it's super strong, but like Mahesh said, maybe one of the weaker ones in the portfolio. Um, this for me was actually my personal least favorite only because I felt that there was so much going on that I wasn't sure where I was supposed to land in this image. And this is also uh, the one that I feel like I can speak to the least because it is so outside of my arsenal. So technically, I don't know how you did it. I don't know anything about shooting like this, but I do know that I, I wish I felt more pulled in than I actually do with this image. And it, perhaps it's the thickness of the streaks, perhaps it's how much negative space there is with the buildings. Um, but for me, it didn't quite do it, but I have a feeling that Mahesh will have a different story to tell here. <laughs> No, you know, I, I think your 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 initial raw reaction to the to the images is, is spot on. Uh, I do also think this is a slightly weaker uh, of the images in the portfolio. Uh, this is trying to be a cityscape, long exposure shot, you know, with the red tail lights and the and the bluish uh, headlights. Um, there's just a little bit too much empty space for me in the foreground, even though you've got these beautiful leading lines. And I wish. Uh, you'd gone to the, the one extra step of correcting the vertical nature of the building lines. It's a little leaning a little bit too much to the outside. It's almost like you're at a high perch, angling the lens down a little bit. That's causing the, the vertical lines to go out like this. So if you could correct that, I think that would make it a compositionally a stronger image. I'll take this one. Again, center compositions, I don't mind as long as it's not the only thing. So here is actually a pretty good job of the center composition. Uh, so because of that, I wish the sun was also centered in this composition. You've got these beautiful lines in the foreground that's reflecting the light, those 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 rails, the num amount of building on the left, the same as the amount of building on the light, the beautiful yellow light, the orange glow. Really like all that. Love the compressed nature of the telephoto lens. But now I said, oh, that sun looks a little off now because everything else is so centered. But I still, I still like the image very much. I, I feel... Um... This one's really interesting to me because at, in direct contrast to the last one, I, you know, I don't often feel drawn to cityscapes. It, it's not something that interests me because cities don't interest me. But this, to me, is not actually about the city. It's about the color and the time of day. And so now I see the story that's happening here. I'm very drawn to that. I've never really seen an image where there's just a giant white spot in here like there is for the sun. And yet I love it because it looks abstract. It, it almost looks like, um, you know, paper that's been cut and pasted and collaged together. And that makes it feel like like a, a, a mixed media piece rather than a photograph. And part of that is the compression of the image and how flattened it looks. So that's really fascinating to me. And I, I really love this one. Awesome. So... We'll go to the Gustavo, the last uh, portfolio that we have. And I, and I really like this portfolio a lot. You know, my forte isn't, isn't portrait photography, but I think in general, uh, a very good job was done with this. So let's go ahead and start with the first image. Uh, it's a beautiful portrait, great shallow depth of field. Uh, you know, I think I get enough of the information in the background to know what the environment is. The one thing that I may correct here is just the positioning of the, 
of the model, not to say that the center positioning, but I feel like that that branch is sticking out right from her head. And just a little to the left, a little to the right, uh, would just uh, it would it wouldn't it wouldn't draw my eyes to that background so much as to the model. Yeah, and I think that this is an interesting image to start with because from a story perspective, I almost feel like we're, we're pulled too far back to really feel immersed in this story. If we were to push in closer, then because the camera is so low, we might see the drape of the dress coming toward the camera more, which might lead our eye in better. The branch would probably not be sticking out of the head so much from that angle. And I think that it would create a more dynamic image to just punch in a little bit closer and really think about how to draw the eye in. Because right now she's kind of sitting on this mound of dirt, but I want to feel like I'm there with her or I want to feel more voyeuristic and pull back and maybe have some bramble in the foreground um, to give more of that storytelling element. So um, well done. It's a good first image into this portfolio for sure. Um, and then we move on to this image that has a, a, an altogether different feel. And I think that's because in this image, the model is playing toward the camera. So she's got her body rotated. You can tell that there is a pose happening here there was direction given or some, you know, some sort of creative direction. Whereas in the other one, I felt like she was a little bit more relaxed. There wasn't, it wasn't as obvious that the, anyone was playing toward a camera. And I'm not saying that as a negative or a positive per se, it's just a different feeling. So one had a more fine art feeling to me, which was the first one. This one has a more commercial feeling to me. And I think that there's quite a mix of that in this portfolio. And that's fine if that's the intent, but just keep it in mind that it does give quite a different impression to the viewer. Yeah, I, I love the lighting on this. I think the mixture of the natural light in the background with the flash in the foreground, it's done very well. Oftentimes I can tell too much that a flash has been used and the, the balance between the background and the foreground light is a little off. And here it looks completely natural. It almost looks like somebody had a reflector such that the sun was on the face, but I know that's way too much light on the on the person to, for it to be just the reflected light. So really kudos on the natural use uh, of flash photography. And I love how that light is just transilluminating the back of her hair, especially in that dress. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's lovely. Great. So this is a, a very whimsical image. I, when I first saw this, I wrote, wrote a little uh, note to Brooks and that this sort of feels like Alice in Wonderland uh, appearance to it, with the tea party and sort of the uh, that the, the blonde hair and the long and sort of whimsical attitude. Um, I really like uh, I really like the the play of different uh, using different com combining different exposures to come up with an image like this. Yeah, this is an extremely clever image. I that clock on the plate really does it for me. I love the details in this image. I think that you probably went to a lot of trouble to set this up. And I think it paid off too. Every single character, which is clearly the same model, they each have a role to play. And just like with uh, the other image that we spoke about, I just want to get into the scene a little bit more. So instead of this angle that's sort of straight on and above the table, that angle makes it seem like somebody was standing there and took the picture. Instead, I want to get closer and maybe even lower so I can see the details of that clock and what's on the table and really feel like I'm seated at the table with these people instead of standing above them and, and back. Great. This image is another very storytelling image. And I think that it's very strong because of the color story. Again, we've got this deep blue gray in the background, the red of the dress, the glow of the candle. It all works extremely well to tell a story here. And I think that I'm going to give a note for your overall portfolio, which is really make a bold choice when it comes to camera angle, because I think that if you do, it'll take your work just that to that next level where we feel more immersed in the story. So instead of just straight on looking at a, a, a centered subject like this, either give them more direction to play a character instead of standing a little bit stiffly or change the camera angle so that we as the viewer are more immersed in this. But I love this image. I think it's extremely strong. I still, I also like this image a lot. And again, going back to what Brooke was saying, I would crop this so that I don't see so much on the bottom or the right hand side. So a little off center. And I would actually make the overall image a little darker because I don't want to see so much of that background. I think the subject matter needs to pop a little more from the rest of the image and not just from the depth of field aspect, but also from the exposure aspect. If the background was a little darker, I think that glow on her face from that lamp would just be a little bit more 
oomph to it. And then again, that crop would, would really draw me into the image a little more too. Definitely. So just taking a quick look at this last image before we wrap up, I think here we have an absolutely beautiful portrait. It breaks a little bit from the rest of the images, given that it's a black background, it's much darker, but this essentially captures what I want to see in some of the other images to maybe crop it in, to maybe get a different angle where the subject isn't straight onto camera. And I think that this is a great way to wrap up this portfolio. I agree. This was my favorite image of the portfolio because of the dark colors and the and the dark tone and all i can say is if there's a little bit less light on that foreground shoulder where i can see even less of that where it's mainly just the face and the hair and the hat and the makeup uh again that would be a, i think a, a stronger composition so overall great portfolio and thanks everybody for contributing uh, we really had a great time looking at this series we'll see you later for more critiques yeah. bye guys bye Hi, I'm Andy Mann, and this is Sony Xperia Storytelling. Today we're going to work on finding your voice, style, and purpose using Sony's newest Xperia smartphones. But before we get started, I thought I'd share a little behind the scenes of what it's like to be a Sony artisan of imagery, traveling the world documenting our changing planet. So people ask me, why I go through what you go through? Crossing the Drake Passage in 40-foot seas, or swimming with crocodiles, or swimming with sharks. I do it so when someone asks me, what is it like in the ocean? What is it like in Antarctica? I can show them the most beautiful place in the world. And in most cases, an image or a short story is the only way someone's going to ever experience a place as wild as the open ocean. And we shoot the images we do so that when people open the pages of National Geographic magazine and they look at that image, that they're immediately transformed. So that they can have empathy for that subject so that they can care for it. And I shoot the images I do to give a voice to the voiceless, for those images to speak on their behalf. In today's day and age, smartphone media has changed the way that we tell stories and has changed the way we view and understand the world around us. Sea Legacy is not just Paul and I, it's this large community of people with the same inspiration to restore health and abundance to our oceans. And we need an army of storytellers. So we're excited to deploy this army of magic makers around the world. There he is. How's it going, buddy? Hey guys, good to see you. Very excited to pass the baton on to you. There's a lot of intel coming in from Central America that Costa Rica is looking to expand Cocos National Park. And so now's the time to go. This is an opportunity for the world to create the very first interconnected international marine park in history. Cocos Island, 300 miles off Costa Rica. It has all this mystique and mystery surrounding it. Pretty treacherous, there's shipwrecks around here. You show up this time of year, it's the rainy season, so it's always veiled in clouds. This history is really known for its like buried treasures and like pirate history and it's like the original treasure island. It's eerie, but it's beautiful. I mean, that's why it's so green, it's so lush, it's so full of life. And it's one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. As soon as you go underwater, all that stuff just like multiplies and amplifies. One of the first people to come dive here and document this place was Jacques Cousteau. 
He said this was the most beautiful island in the world. I think he called it the sharkiest place in the world. This place has always been a benchmark in the Pacific for the health of shark populations. If Jacques could see what it looked like now, it would be devastating. This place was just fished. It was unregulated for so long. It wasn't even until the 2000s that any part of this ocean was protected. So you just think about how many ships fishing all day long on these popular dive sites, and they're drifting their long lines into the park. They're catching everything. Think of the impact that that can have. I've met up with biologist Randall Adarus, whose shark tracking expeditions have resulted in priceless data that informs the protection efforts. Because yeah. this will tell you how close you are to a shark that you can follow it in a boat. You know, I produce this information, and then as a scientist, it's my duty to publish it. But it gets published in scientific journals, and who reads these scientific journals? Other scientists. And that's where we really need the help of communicators like Andy, because those images that capture the feeling that we need to transmit. The people that I want to be inspired, to be hit emotionally, are people that sign these into laws. And if they can connect just in that moment with the image with some pride, that can help inform their decision. They could be like, yes, we can't lose this. But getting these images and getting that tracking data is very difficult. I can't control a camera properly in these conditions. You're holding on for dear life and ripping current. In most cases, you just have one hand. I'm usually like a manual shooter. I want to control ISO aperture and shutter speed. I'm letting the A1 make all those decisions, including focus. It's been awesome. It's better if you're focused on being a good diver. Let the camera make the decision. But yeah, I mean, we've had dives where we saw zero sharks at the sharkiest place in the Pacific. Conditions, you never know, but you should be able to see sharks here. I don't know what's going on, but... Basically as void of life as I've ever seen Cocos Island. But things change quick around here. I mean, we'll keep circling the island. We'll find good conditions. We'll find the sharks and hopefully get what we came here to shoot. Things have not gone our way. We crashed a drone. We flooded a housing. We've drifted off dives. It's been incredibly challenging. We're trying to keep morale up but everything hedges on the outcomes of these expeditions. It's just struggle, 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 and then boom. Huge schools of jacks with like 100 sharks, and I'm right in the middle of it. One of the biggest wildlife scenes I've ever been part of. So let's talk about using Sony Xperia to create the stories you want to tell. My advice is, is, is to go out and use these cameras like you would a, a professional camera. At least try to. Because there's a bridge that needs to be crossed between what is considered smartphone media, which is run and gun, behind the scenes stuff, and the capabilities that this thing can actually do for you. So in order to test that theory, I went with two professional climbers, Maddie Hong and Margot Hayes. And we went up to Rocky Mountain National Park to try to make images. Not to try to tell a story, or document rock climbing, but to try to make images that I want to make, that I would want to make with the, a medium format camera. And I think this was the, the real marriage of the power and usability of this camera, was to be able to go on an adventure, go into a place where having something that's light and fast in my hands allowed me to get images and angles that I wouldn't otherwise be able to get with a bigger camera and to be able to think about crafting images the way I would think about crafting an image with a Sony Alpha camera, which is using the best athletes in the best location, finding the best angles and shooting in the best light. And if you think about your smartphone imagery that way, and you're gonna start finding that in a lot of situations, those images are available all around you all the time, and that powerful tool is always in your pocket, you're going to start finding yourself making professional images with your smartphone. My name is Andy Mann. I'm a Sony artisan. Today we're taking the Sony Xperia 1 Mark III up into the Rocky Mountains to shoot 
two very famous rock climbers, Maddie Hong and Margot Hayes, on a classic route called Edge of Time. We're setting out today to make images. We're not documenting rock climbing. We want to make an image that inspires other people to get outside, inspires other people to tie in and go rope climbing, inspire friends to go have fun in the mountains, and inspire photographers to do this kind of thing, which is hedge the best light, hedge the best climber, find the location, and make the image you want to make. Look, I love a good challenge. We're going up there with the smartphone today, but of course I would, I would go up there with my big cameras. But that's not the point. The point is that this phone can take amazing pictures. How amazing can they be? You don't know unless you take it out. You take it on a real adventure. You try to make some images that you would love to make with a Sony Alpha camera. The versatility was really awesome to have today. And, and, um, and more than anything, it was an excuse to get outside and uh, be in the mountains, which is amazing. A super grateful and super fun day, and I hope everyone loves the images we got. With the Xperia 1 Mark III, it's so easy to take high-quality images wherever I go. The images we got from that shoot are, were some of my favorite climbing images that I shot this year. I think partly because I slowed down a little bit. I started to think of the smartphone not necessarily as being a pocket camera, but how can I use the power and the technology in the smartphone to make professional images that I can be proud of? Perhaps my favorite feature in the Sony Xperia line is the ProPhoto app. It's the ability to be able to open an app and go in and have complete control over my camera. I can change shutter speed, I can change focal point, I can change my autofocus, I can change my exposure, my ISO, I can change my white balance, and I can change my aspect ratio. That gives me complete control over my camera, which is something that I could only do in a Sony Alpha camera before. Being able to have complete control over your camera really allows you to, to, to optimize the things that Sony put in this camera that make it special, which is the sensor, which is the low light capabilities, which is the burst mode, which is the three Zeiss lenses. Um, having control over your camera allows you to have control over the story you're trying to tell. So let's talk about why this is such a powerful tool. One thing that Sony did was they snuck in all this Sony Alpha technology, all these professional tools into this phone and now they're in here and they're easy to use. You don't even know what's happening. So things like using Zeiss optics and Zeiss coated glass, you know, it's something that a, a normal consumer wouldn't even know how like truly amazing that is to be in a smartphone, you know? And you see it in the images, you see it in the post-production, you see it because you're shooting raw and you're able to, to open that image up and see all the, the data that is available in an image you would shoot with a Sony Alpha phone. As a professional photographer, I can't keep up with the technology, right? And it's not my job to keep up with the technology. Because if I'm making creative decisions and I'm, and I'm, and I'm framing and I'm um, trying to find the moment, I'm relying on the camera to do what it needs to do to document the images. Most people document their lives with a smartphone. It's the way we share our lives on Instagram. It's the way we share our lives on Facebook. It's the way we share our lives amongst a group of friends. And it's an exciting time to be able to, to document and share your life because this, this is a powerful tool that's in your pocket. And, um, you know, but it's only powerful to those that know how to tell a good story. The story is coming through you. It's not coming from you. So how do you recognize a good story and how do you tell it? I like to look at a story as a landscape on a canvas, like a painting. You don't want to bring someone right to the heart of the story right away. You want to sort of document the periphery of the story you're try trying to tell. You know, what's happening around the story? What's happening on the periphery of the story? Because that's generally where the story is happening. It's important to look at the different angles of your story. Engage with this story. Who, who are you trying to reach? Do you want them to be inspired? Do you want to drive them into action? Do you want them to laugh? Do you want them to cry? Those are the questions you need to ask yourself before you start telling your story. You used to be able to pick up a smartphone and just document. 
Now you pick up the smartphone and you can make a quick creative decision. And that's a big deal for a professional photographer, anyone that wants to step up their game. It's, it's still point and click in a lot of ways, but you have more control. You have more control of the images that you want to take. You have more control on post-production. Be a hybrid between like a run and gun photographer and a professional photographer. And that's kind of the sweet spot because it allows you to, to, to get these candid moments that, that tell real life stories and bring people behind the scenes of, of the work that, that I do and the work we do at Sea Legacy. So all the behind the scenes is shot with a smartphone. It's just, that's the, that's the tool that's with you. It's the tool that's in our pocket. You don't have to, all the cameras are packed away in Pelican cases, we're flying around the world, but we're documenting that because that's an important story to tell too. The story behind the shot. What does it take to tell these stories? The ups and the downs, like that's the real story. And that's all told with this. My name is Andy Mann. I'm a Sony artisan of imagery. My type of work focuses on travel, adventure, and conservation. The Xperia 1 Mark III is that alpha power device that you always have right there in your pocket. It gives you the ability to capture alpha quality images and video at the ready when your camera isn't always an arm's reach away. always sort of shot half my images with my smartphone and half with my Sony Alpha series. This is the perfect blend of both. This trip to Panama was a scouting mission with Christina Mittemeyer for Sea Legacy. Our goals were to arrive on Coyaba Island, photograph the beautiful island, do interviews, photograph government officials on location, being ambassadors for their ocean. We needed to be light and fast and to document on a scouting mission that was full on, sun up to sundown, run and gun. It was an absolute pleasure to be able to work with a camera as small as the Xperia, and I'm just as happy with the images. I love the dynamic range of this camera. What you're seeing is as close to Sony Alpha professional imagery as I've seen yet. These images are final takes for me. A lot of the scouting images we shot in Panama, I don't plan to reshoot. I mean, there's something about being there in the moment that you cannot recreate. When those moments happen, if you have the Xperia 1 Mark III in your hand, you are going to get the image you want to take. The Xperia 1 Mark III is an essential piece of gear in my quiver. The alpha quality capability in your pocket when on assignment in remote places all over the world is second to none. The stories I'm telling about these remote places that need to be protected, I want people to feel like they're on expedition with me. I want people to feel like they're on the journey with me. And being able to document real time, all the time, seamlessly with the Xperia it allows me to do something that's less polished, that's more authentic, that's more real. You're going to throw a wider net out to your audience. You're going to interest people more. People want to know what it's like. What is it truly like? And a lot of that doesn't come through with, with the big cameras when, you're, when you have a set and, and, and people are scripted and you have control over the narrative. I don't want control over the narrative. I want to be able to tell the story two ways. I want to, I want to be able to to, to deliver something scripted to the person I want to deliver it to. And I also want to bring people along on the adventure. So I use the, the Xperia 1 Mark III a lot. This is kind of my, like, my go-to camera, um, just because it's so well-rounded. It, it does everything so well. Uh, but when I want to really, truly try to take professional images, um, I use the new Pro, Pro I. I mean, this thing is just the next level. It's the world's first native 4K 120 smartphone. The eye autofocus and object tracking focus is a step up from all the other phones. And it has a triple array of Zeiss lenses, a 16 mil, a 24 mil, and a 50 millimeter lens. And it shoots 12 bit raw. And what's most important about the Pro-Eye is they took the sensor out of this camera and they put it in here. 
And that matters, the sensor is everything. That's where all your information and data lives. You wanna use the biggest one possible and you wanna use as much of it as possible. And they've dialed this in. Um, so this is, this is the next level. This is the, the step towards the Sony Alpha camera that truly um, is making a mark. I mean, the best part of using a smartphone like the Xperia to document your life is that it's easy. It's that it's fast. It's, it's that it's portable. It's that it's non-invasive. You know, I bet 90% of the images I take in my life are taken with the Xperia, with the smartphone, just because it's in my pocket, it's right there. It's quick, it's fast. And it allows me to get the images that I wanna get, which are candid moments, which are moments that are natural and unscripted. And that's the advantage of being able to get a tool like this in a scene or in a moment to capture those images right away you know, without the setup of a big camera system. Because those moments are so fleeting. And those are the moments you hang on to. Those are the moments that have the most power. And with me, it's, it's, it's my family. You know, it's being able to be in the moment with my family, get the images that have that candid, natural feel, that remind me of being there. That remind me of what it was like um, to be in the garden with my daughter or, or be out wrestling with my son in a field. You know, the images that I take there, I want to feel unscripted. I want to feel like they're almost taken by a third party because I want to look back and think, I didn't sacrifice that moment to get a shot. I was in that moment and I got the shot. And that's the power of having a tool this small. I think 95% of the images I take with my family were the smartphone. It just is, they say the best camera is the one you have with you. And and I always have my smartphone with me. Every year I, I take all the images that I captured with my family and I print a book. Most of the images are smart, smartphone images because took a good picture. like when the moments happen, when like I feel like my family's the most playful, the last thing I wanna do is like organize a photo shoot, like go get a big camera and try to like recreate things. Like I don't wanna disrupt the magic of like being with my family and those magical moments hey, that happen just ah! once. Like, I want to be, yes, I want to document those moments, but I want to be as present as possible. And I feel like just being able to, like, get a shot that looks as good as it does and, like, put it back in my pocket and continue to play with my... Probably most people document their lives on smartphones, and so it only makes sense to me to, to use the best technology possible. Um, so you're going to get the best images possible, so you, you can remember these memories forever. And now is the time to be a storyteller. Now is the time to be a photographer. Now is the time to be a filmmaker. Because the world needs us to keep telling these stories. Because when you publish a powerful image, someone somewhere in the world who would otherwise never have the opportunity to go to a place as wild and remote as the Arctic or the open ocean, will now dream of it. And that's the power of good storytelling. I think the point of all this is to inspire you to go tell your story. Because nobody sees the world the way that you see it. And why is that important? Because your vision matters. The way you see the world matters. Because you see it authentically. And you see it differently than everyone else. And if you can document that and you can capture that, you allow other people to see the world through your eyes and through your vision and through your voice. And that matters because that builds empathy, because that crosses bridges, because that connects us. And that's where the growth as, as a storyteller is going to begin. It's the first time that, that you are vulnerable enough to tell the story that you think matters to you, and you may not think it matters to other people. People are going to feel it. It's going to be powerful, it's going to be meaningful, and it's gonna bring you a lot of joy in your, in your storytelling. So get out there and start telling stories.
Hi, everyone, and welcome to Creative Space. And thank you so much uh, for joining us here at the main stage. Uh, I've got uh, Emmy nominated director, National Geographic photographer, and marine con conservationist uh, with me, uh, Andy Mann. Uh, but before we get to too deep into it, stick around because at the end of this segment, we will be giving away an Xperia Pro I. So, um, hey, yeah, <laughs> Andy, hey. You've got the ProI right there in your hand. Um, so Andy, you make some amazing uh, images. You capture some really amazing stories. And um, I'm, you know, I was just looking at uh, Sea Legacy um, earlier and, and, and was so moved uh, and, and inspired that I did sign up for the, uh, sign the petition. So tell, me, tell us a little bit about what you do um, with your, your camera gear, what alpha camera gear you use, um, what Xperia products do you use? All that Great. stuff. Okay, cool. Thanks, Van. And thanks, everyone, that stuck around for the Q&A. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, my main gig is, is, is a senior fellow, lead storyteller at Sea Legacy. And we're an ocean conservation organization that focuses on strong storytelling and creating assets to be used to lobby, to campaign, to drive people to action in order to protect our oceans and raise awareness. And so the quiver for that for us in this sort of modern realm of storytelling is um, everything from the Xperia to you know the Sony Alta Pro gear. You know, we use an FS, FS6, we use uh, my main kit is two Sony A1s and an A7S III, and then usually two Xperia's. Um, and, and the reason for that is because, you know, when you go on an expedition, you're doing everything from, you know, your, half your gear's loaded in Pelican cases. So much of that getting on location is part of the story that people engage with. So that's all usually captured with this. And then, um, when I'm in the field, I have a Sony A1 in an underwater housing, and I use a 16 to 35 G Master with that. Um, I have one in A1 top side, um, usually with a big birding lens or something. Most of the time, I'm on a boat, so you know, in a place where there's like usually a lot of bird action. Um, and then I have an A7S III, usually built top side, with a monitor, um, in a in a nice lit like semi lens and that's sort of my running gun around the boat, pick up assets stuff. But, you know, the goal of, you know, Sea Legacy is kind of, we're kind of activated in three different tiers. Like there's, um, there's, well, it's the daily beating of the drum, right? We're posting stuff every single day for people to see. Um, and that, you know, there's a lot of growth around that. And then there's this tier, middle tier of like campaigning when we, we, with, through a local partner somewhere in the world, um, it's brought to our attention that they're campaigning for a bill to be signed or a bill to be passed or for some action to happen in their country. And then that's when we'll launch an expedition, usually with scientists, gather the assets we need to help create the assets for that campaign. And then the highest tier is like really like finish line lobby. It's being in the Royal Palace the day uh, the president's going to sign a bill. It's help, helping decorate you know, that, that leader or hold them accountable, being there to, to tell the story as it happens. Um, and so in that way, we sort of bring everyone that follows us, everyone that you know, signs petitions, who, who, who's part of the tie, can, follows these stories from the beginning to the very end. You know? And so I, that's the long-winded version of, of what I do. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, you know, I think many of us, if you haven't seen it already, you can definitely check out um, some of Andy's work. Um, where, where would you recommend that we see some of your work? Yeah, so, you know, I would say Instagram is kind of like the portal for everything, right? So, like, I would say at C Legacy and at Andy underscore man are the places. Like when there's new content that goes up on our other channels, YouTube channels or, 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 um, or websites, 
you'll know about it there first. Okay. And, and how do you go about planning um, what gear you're going to take, um, selecting, you know, different things? Are there certain yeah. features, um, eye autofocus, object tracking, connectivity, things oh. like that when you guys uh, are getting ready to, to go on the expeditions or go to, to certain things? So tell yeah. us a little bit about that, that process of gear selection. Process. Thank you. <laughs> it is <laughs> very much a process. And it's been a process for, you know, a decade for me. So, you know, packing for an expedition is a big thing. There's a lot to consider, especially if you're in a place as remote as Antarctica or the Arctic. You know, you're not going to a camera shop or phoning a friend for any help if you drop a piece of gear or, or lose something. So uh, I use a pretty slim down kit. You know, that's like, there's not, you know, in the, in the G Master series particularly, there's not a lot of overlap in focal lengths. You know, like I'll, like I said, I'll bring at least two bodies if only one is a backup. You know, I, I bring this suite of 16 to 35, 24 to 70. Um, and then I use usually a lot that the, the two to 600 on, on the far end. And then I have primes between, I, I use 24, 1, 4, 35, 1, 4, 51, 2, 85, 1, 4. That's my kit. Um, and it sounds like a lot, but you know, one or two of those is gonna be used underwater. So it's sort of in a kit that lives on the boat. One or two are gonna be like my filmmaking lenses. You know, that 35-1.4 is kind of my favorite for that in the primes. Yeah. And then I'm gonna have those, that suite of, of G Master zooms for, for, for photography. Um, and the nice part about that is obviously, you know, you know filmmaking photography so much anymore is, is they're, they're just dancing together. You know, if you find yourself in a, in a great moment, you gotta think about it like three or four different ways anymore. And so, um, you know, so I'm always, you know, throwing a variable ND on a prime lens, you know, flipping it to manual focus, trying to get that sort of floaty, filmy look. If I'm going to ask someone a question or I'm going to get a moment, um, cause that, that's sort of how I like to film. But then, yeah, it's, it's back into photo mode and I'm back 24, 70 to eight using eye tracking autofocus in both cases, a lot of times, um, and then just working angles, you know? So it's, you know, when you're filming so much, it's like you're sort of picking an angle and maybe floating around, giving it a feel. Um, but when I'm shooting photos, I am moving around like a madman, you know, just jumping around, getting angles, getting angles, getting angles. So I'm just letting the camera make all the important decisions for me. So you've been using some of the Xperia models lately. Um, which models have you used and, and how do you incorporate that in, in some of the shoots that you've done? Yeah, so I've been using the uh, Xperia 1 Mark III and the Xperia Pro I a lot. They've been sort of my, my two go-tos. And what's been really fun is, is um, you know, I've been still like, you know, like doing storytelling with Xperia phones and creating assets and little short films um, to show the capabilities of it. Um, mm -hmm. And so what's been really fun is that I'm going on these missions with only the phone to, to, to do photography or, or to tell a story or to make a short film. So, um, you know, like I said, I use it like any smartphone. I think like anyone uses a smartphone. It's just like documents my life, does my emails, all that stuff. Um, but what a lot of people don't do is like decide, okay, hey, I'm going to go up to Rocky Mountain National Park today, or hey, I'm gonna go to this remote island and I'm only taking a big spear. Um, that's what I'm doing with it because I'm trying to really show everybody its capabilities and, and what it's capable of and, and what it can do in these environments. So I'm forcing my hand a little bit to shoot a lot with this. Um, and I think that's that's really fun. It's, it's been a really creative process. And, and I think anyone that's used it or seen that the quality of, of images and, and video of this thing does that, um, I'm, you know, I'm blown away. That's great. Have you used other, uh, like RX100? Oh, uh, the RX100 Mark 7, of course, is the camera that we talk about whenever we talk about the Pro-I, especially yeah. because it has that same type of sensor that stacks CMOS, yeah. super fast readout, really great dynamic range, all that good stuff. Um, I've heard of some people using it as like just kind of a um, device to say, you know what, I'd like to come and shoot here. I just want to see what the angle would look like. 
and capture some really great um, quality. Um, so when you do, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, do site surveys and that type of thing, have you used it in those situations? Yeah, we used it on a big yeah. one in Panama. Uh, that was part of that. And the class that showed a snippet of that where uh, Christina Mittemeyer and I both used the Xperia as a scouting camera. Um, but then we also found ourselves using it by the end, you know, we did go back and shoot, but we used about half of the stuff we shot during the scout with this because it was just allowed us to, like, we were in helicopters and small spaces. And like, you know, when you use the proto for the, the photo pro app or the, you know, the, the video pro app, um, you just get all the controls you would have with the Sony Alpha camera, you know? So it's like, you, you, all, you just sort of change your mindset. You get into a more creative mindset just by opening that up. Because all of a sudden now you need to make a few decisions. By making a couple of those decisions, like, oh, do I want to stop this down a little bit? Do I want to sort of high key expose this? Um, you, all of a sudden, I think like all the other wheels start turning, you know, and you, you start really thinking about like, and it's all there for you. You know, it's like, it's right in your yeah. eyesight. You're like, you remember you have three Zeiss beautiful lenses. You know, you remember you, your white balance control is all here. And so, um, so control yeah, of the shutter speed and the angle yeah, and so aperture. Cool. Loving that, yeah. <laughs> Stuff you don't get in other phones, right? That's right. Have you thought with other phones and, and how do you feel that they compare with the Xperia Pro, Pro I? Yeah, I mean, they don't really, you know, it's also changing so fast. You know, I've been using Xperia for about a year now exclusively. Um, and so, you know, it's one of those things where I haven't like kind of looked where the rest of the race is behind, behind us <laughs> and just kind of pull forward with it. Uh, so I don't know what anyone else is doing, but, you know, I got my ear to the, you know, to the streets of, of mobile photography. And if something was better than this pro eye at the moment, we would know about it. So you know, this is the one for sure. Yeah, I think that the more that we use smartphones in our daily lives and as photographers, you know, you kind of get used to using your alpha so much when you switch over to a mobile device, your level expectation drops quite a bit. And I, I think we don't really realize that so much until you get a really great, you know, smartphone like the, the Pro-I where it has all these things built around the camera. Um, and you realize, you know what, I don't have to sacrifice that quality um, just because I want it in a small, sl slim form factor and be able to make calls with it and, you know, kill some time watching some, some content or playing some games and stuff. Um, that's fantastic. So what, what other places, uh, have you traveled with, with the, the pro I, are there other places on your bucket list that you're looking forward to taking it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I've taken it to already this year to, to, to Galapagos, to Costa Rica, to Ooh. Panama, to Norway, I took it down in a submarine to a thousand meters, it's been around. Um, but, you know, I'm home for the holidays now, you know, getting all the family shots with this thing. And, um, and then we're gonna move SC Legacy to Baja, California, um, a big ocean conference in Palau. I'll be back to Costa Rica. Um, and then um, Patagonia and a trip to, um, Svalbard, which is Arctic Norway, to um, to do polar bears, and so that's sort of like my winter. So that's like the next few months, and and so I'm really looking forward to those trips a lot. Wow, sounds like you've got quite quite the trips coming up. It's coming up. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, so once again, where can we find some more of your work uh, with, um, I mean, around sea life, and then otherwise? Yeah, well, we're doing a really cool um, series. Um, that follows C Legacy as an organization for, for Sony Alpha. So you can find that series online in the Sony Alpha channels. Um, it's a C Legacy series, and that features us in the field. Um, so that's, that's ongoing. Um, you know, like I said, I think the main portals for, for my work are going to be Instagram, Andy underscore man, and then um, C Legacy. And then a lot of our stuff's being, you know, we're funding up through the Sony Alpha channels and Sony Xperia channels. Um, the partnership has been incredible for them helping amplify the work we do and also make sure that our, we have the right kits in the field to, to capture the stories we need to tell. That's awesome. Well, I think we are just about out of time. I mean, it goes so fast, 
But uh, before we leave, we definitely want to announce uh, the winner of the Xperia Pro I, uh, which Andy's going to do a quick hand modeling for us of the, the phone. Right there. <laughs> there, there, ooh, there it is. The new Pro I is going to Matthew Town. Hey. Matthew Town. And uh, we are going to be uh, reaching out. Uh, post event with more details on uh, how Matthew is going to get his uh, pro eye. But thanks again so much. Thank you, Andy, for sharing not only the conversation, but the passion that you have around Sea Legacy and what's happening in Antarctica. If you guys haven't uh, done it, done so yet, go check that out. Uh, again, thanks, thank Dave. you very much. Have a blessed day. Take care.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. I'm Christopher Robinson. I'm sorry. Welcome to Creative Space Live. I'm Christopher Robinson, editor of AlphaUniverse.com and host of the Alpha Universe podcast. And I'm here today with Craig Coker and Travis Snyder, and we are here to talk about AirPeak. Guys, thanks very much for being here today. Yeah, thanks. Oh, uh, thanks so much. Yeah. Before we get started with our conversation, I just want to remind everybody that we are in fact live. You can submit your questions for Craig and for Travis uh, in the chat here. I uh, will try and get through some questions. We're going to be talking about the new AirPeak, which is, of course, super interesting, super popular, brand new uh, announcements coming out this past week about it. I know there will be a lot of questions. Before we um, get to the questions, I'd like to ask you guys to introduce yourself. Craig, can we uh, start with you? Tell us a little bit about yeah. yourself and what, how you've been flying. Absolutely, Chris. Well, yeah, I've been involved in the drone industry for about 10 years now. And uh, I have to say I've seen quite a bit of different platforms um, all the way to the DIY back in the day of um, building my own heavy lifts from the ground up um, and supporting 25 pound payloads uh, all the way to, you know, being a part of uh, in the background with the drone manufacturers and help helping them tune their aircrafts and stuff. So fast forward today, uh, it is certainly more plug and play, and uh, and that's why I'm really excited to share AirPeak because Absolutely. it is very capable and it's got tons of features. Totally. And uh, Travis, for our audience who doesn't uh, doesn't know much about you and and how uh, you became a drone pilot, let's talk a little bit about your background. Uh, well, I've been flying for about eight years now. Uh, I started off with building smaller systems, and then got into heavier lift systems. Uh, from there, it really uh, started consulting with a lot of utilities and municipalities and uh, doing education uh, on the educational side of SUAS, uh, fly, a, fly manned aircraft to get my unmanned aviation uh, license to, to be able to fly. I was under a 333 for a while there. And uh, now I just fly, like uh, Craig said, mo most of these systems are pick up and, and fly, and you don't have to fiddle with them too much anymore, and the AirPeak is definitely that kind of aircraft. So, Very cool. We're going to talk uh, quite a bit about the AirPeak, but before we get into some of the specifics and, and some of your direct experiences, can we talk a little bit about just in general how drones are being used in filmmaking and in photography, um, just overall creative content today? Um, Craig, over to you first. Uh, how are you seeing the, the use of drones? Yeah, well, the use of drones have has been somewhat of a substitute for other um, options in the field for a long time, uh, like cranes, um, manned aircraft. Um, and, you know, now with drones, you can kind of get in a uh, lower perspective, get closer to your subjects. Um, they're easy to... Uh, deploy and uh, a lot of people are really getting into the creative thought of it not just as a uh, uh, aerial vehicle but um, being creative that doing uh, shots from inside the building to outside a building and and tracking shots and a lot of dynamic uh, framing stuff so it's really, really excited to see so far. Yeah, it's really like, you know, you're talking about some of those tracking shots and some of that, you know, inside to outside, outside to inside. These are shots that we really couldn't do before. And it's just kind of opening up uh, a lot of new ways to to tell a story that way. Um, Absolutely. Travis, yeah. Travis, from your perspective, let's talk about, uh, you know, how you're, you're seeing drones used in in content creation. Yeah, I mean, what, what Craig said, it's really opening up your, your uh, creative capabilities, uh, what you can do uh, with, a, uh, with a shot, you know, going from inside to outside or, or vice versa. And, and you know, from my uh, side of things, I come from a more industrial side of things. I'm a, a lot of on the safety side. You know, this takes people out of helicopters and, and, it, and it, it, it's a lot safer and more cost effective to, to use an aircraft. So. Um, I'd say it's 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 helping save a lot of time. It's it's opening up uh, the creative capabilities, and it's you know it's saving money as well. So drones you have know, opened up a, a a nice door in the content creation world. And and from that um, sort of commercial side that you're talking about, things that are um, you know not uh, not in in the sort of making a 
um, a big budget movie side, but um, you know, inspections of structures, of towers, of of, of things like that, um, which I think you've been doing uh, quite a bit of. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I, I find myself doing a lot of the cell tower inspections, power line inspections, gas leak inspections. Uh, if you can throw it on a drone, then uh, then I want to fly it and and try to collect the data for it. They're flying tripods, you know, so it takes it's they're a lot safer. Absolutely. Um, both of you guys have been among a very small group of people who've had a chance to use uh, the AirPeak S1, uh, the prototypes, and and which is, by the way, shipping in um, on Christmas Eve, December 24th. It's uh, due to, to start shipping. You guys have both had a chance to use it. Um, Craig, talk a little bit about your time with the S1 and, you know, how, how it's uh, how, how you've been able to use it and, and shoot. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've already taken it in a... Um a good amount of different environments. And what I'm really surprised with is the f fact that whatever we throw at it is, is been capable to perform well. Um, you know, using the FX3 uh, and the whole alpha ecosystem, how it is, um, you know, all this integration between the the camera and the drone and the piloting app is all at your fingertips. Um, and that's very important to have uh, the, the, the features, you know, like hot swappable battery capabilities to be to land and um, swap out the batteries and be back up within seconds. Um, same with the, the gimbal and everything. And, and you can have different uh, camera payloads. Um, and it's just it's really efficient and it's and it's cool the way that it is. Uh, um, capable of things that, you know, have kind of been missing in the drone industry or not as reliable. So it's really exciting. Um, you know. Let's spend just a second more talking about that because you mentioned the FX3. And, yeah. you know, I'm not nearly as experienced in uh, in drones as, as both you guys are. But the FX3 is a, is a you know, a, a sizable camera compared to what I think of as a drone camera, which is usually more like, an RX zero, really teeny tiny, you know, kind of ultra lightweight camera. Yeah. So with, with the S1, we're talking about um, a drone that can carry a, you know, a full frame cinema camera. Yeah, ab absolutely. And the great thing about the FX3 is it's incredibly good in, in low light environments. Um, and uh, it's got a built in fan. So if you're out in the desert, like it keeps cool under that heavy processing load. Um, it does 4K 120, which is really cool. The dynamic range of the FX3 is like incredible and it matches well with a lot of different uh, other cameras out there. Um, if you go from the FX3 and you need a higher resolution, you go to the flagship A1, which does 8K 30. Um, and it does very well with photo and video, 50 megapixels uh, resolution. You know, the A7R 4 does 60 uh, and um, it's just incredible with that whole array of cameras. Whereas, you know, some of these other platforms, these drone platforms are, they have a fixed system um, and they don't have many lens options. Um, and, you know, I haven't even been able to get into all the different lens options that are available. Um, oh, sure. So it's, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, just to be able to, to have that kind of diversity. Like I said, I, I you know, um, as someone who's not nearly as experienced, my, my head immediately goes to thoughts of uh, just that really small payload and just having the kind of payload that lets you have that kind of um, versatility, different bodies, different lenses, full frame, really get some different perspectives. Um, well, also Travis, the, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm Craig. sorry. Yeah. The, the fact that it's very, the form factor is very compact and the payload that it carries is very impressive. Uh, I haven't seen that in the drone industry and that's, what's really cool about it. Travis, over to you. Um, how have you used the, the S1 and what have you noticed about its performance? Uh, it's it's very impressive. It is like like what he was just saying there with the the form factor of the aircraft. You know, it's 17 inch props. It's not much bigger than an Inspire. 
it does have a uh, the lowest flight time is 12 minutes with max payload, uh, but you have hot swappable capability, so you can swap those batteries in 20 seconds, like land swap back up the air. So it's really not a big deal. Uh, I've been using it a lot for inspection work. I've been doing some content creation, uh, doing it for uh, cell tower inspections. The system has uh, some semi-auto uh, capabilities that really assist the pilot uh, with with doing inspection work or do, doing any type of content creation work. Uh, I, it's a very customizable system, and not only with payload, but in terms of the characteristics, flight characteristics, because you have expo rates, you have, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, TPA, which is throttle pit attenuation, you have your throttle responsiveness that you can adjust within the system to make it very high responsive or very low. So you can really fine tune the aircraft to the application or to the pilot or to both, vice versa. You know, depending on the application, you may have different settings for different applications, which you can save within the aircraft. So Sony put a lot of thought into this system, uh, making it a very, very well-rounded machine. And of all the aircraft I've ever flown, uh, the first iterations uh, that a company usually comes out with, there's, there's certain things that it, it flies good, but is it really predictable? Is it really responsive? And it's typically no, you know, consistently it's no. This system is... It's just been mind blowing, really. I mean, especially when I was coming back, where I came from, with flying really, really heavy lift systems, carrying alphas. Now to fly something that's, you know, almost a thousand millimeters smaller than what I was flying, carrying an alpha, the same size payload, uh, having the flight characteristics, the stability and reliability that the Air Peak has, it's just been excellent. It's been a nice, uh, a nice eye opener. Travis, you were going through some of the you know, maneuverability and, and the, the depth of control there. And um, I'm going to keep apologizing for my own lack of experience. But just if you can sort of help explain some of this to me so, so I can understand it. Maybe treat me like a, like a smart seven-year-old a little bit oh, when you're so, talking about some of those controls. Yeah, sorry. Sometimes I get a little nerdy. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's great. I'm sure our audience is probably ahead of me, too. I'm, this, I'm being greedy right now. I'm asking for my perspective. So expo, so like if you imagine like you're, when you have your stick in the center, uh, you're, you're, you're not doing anything with it, and you like move it over to the left or something, say you're trying to make the aircraft move to the left. If you move it over to the left uh, like a centimeter, and, and if you have very linear expo, it may, it may travel, say, um, at like five miles per hour, right, if you move it over a centimeter. But if you like make your expo really high, to where it's very squishy in the middle and you move it over a centimeter, then maybe it will travel only like two miles per hour. And then the further you go out, the more sensitive it becomes. So you can make the you could you can make it even the reverse to where it's more sensitive when the sticks are further out. So you can have really squishy in the middle where it's not super sensitive. So if you're doing like orbits, point of interest shots, uh, and you want it to be very very smooth and you don't want those little tiny bumps in the controls to really affect your shot. A lot of expo helps. And rates is is the other side of that to where, like, say, when you move to the centimeter and you have very little uh, linear expo, it was moving at five miles per hour. Well, if you increased your rates, maybe it now moves to 10 miles per hour at that point. And, but it's still very linear. So that's kind of the how expo and uh, rates work together. And that is a, a, an added feature the system has to really let you fine tune how the aircraft flies for you. And... Uh, there's been multiple occasions where I've really fine-tuned the aircraft to fly a certain way for me, uh, whether I was doing orbits or we were doing these uh, some of these content creation shots, production. Uh, there's just different times you want the system to fly very erratically, very uh, aggressively, or you want it to be very damp, uh, very, gotcha. very smooth in the middle. That's great. And, and thank you, by the way, for bringing that down to my level. I, I, I get it now. Um, I'm good. I'm glad. <laughs> Both of you guys have had a chance to use the S1 in, uh, in some video shooting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the locations where you took it and how it handled? And Craig, I'm going to start uh, this question over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've been um, in some Rocky Mountains. We've been in the desert. We've been uh, over water. Um, and, and the performance is, has been exactly what I would expect uh, of a drone like this. Um, you know, having a trying out a drone for the first time or a drone that you're not used to, uh, you know, it takes a little time to figure out um, what it's capable of. But with AirPeak, you know, I flew the first flight and I instantly had 
confidence in what it was capable of. And so that really gave me confidence going forward to all these different environments. Um, you know, for instance, the desert, it can be really hot out there and uh, be very stressful on an aircraft, uh, especially for um, the cameras as well. And that's where, you know, the FX3 is so great because it's got its own internal uh, fan. Um, so is is it was very capable in all these environments and you know there's so many more that i'm going to uh take the aircraft to and i really like to stress test my aircrafts to to know the limitations of them and everything i've thrown at that uh aircraft it's it's done it's performed pretty well so gotcha yeah and travis over to you talk talk about how you've uh, you know the different environments where you do, you have used uh the s1 and how it worked for you yeah, uh, I flew with Craig out in the desert, and we were flying in the, in the mountainous areas, uh, flying over water, and it handled wonderfully, uh, especially with the atmospheric pressure differences over water. That was the most interesting thing is how it held altitude uh, going from over land to water. There's atmospheric pressure differences, and typically you see a system either dump a little bit. This does not. And even with the vision sensors assisting that, uh, that altitude hold, you're flying over water. So there's a lot going on there. Um, I flew it in Utah when it was very cold. I'd say we were around 32 degrees. We were at freezing, and we were doing a, a tower inspection, and it held just fine. Didn't mind the cold whatsoever, it seemed. Uh, windy, windy that day, too, and we were flying it by the beach, landing uh, at the beach a couple times on, uh, on sand that had been a little, that had been damp, uh, with gusts coming down. Uh, uh, it was, that was nerve-wracking. I was wondering how it was going to handle, and it was, after the first landing, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have to care about it. It'll just, it'll just handle itself and it plants. And that's a cool thing too. The landing gears do a little bit of a spray thing. So they kind of give some whenever it lands. And that like just adds to the, how it plants to the ground. So you mean like it has like a little shock absorbing, like splaying action? Is that, am I understanding you correctly? Yeah, yeah. It's just like very slight, very slight to where it's not going to cause you too much issues with rocking or anything like that. But what it does is it allows it to kind of plant itself. And uh, that's, a, that's a nice feature. Gotcha. Um, we are live with Travis Snyder and Craig Coker, drone pilots who have had a chance to use the new AirPeak S1. We're talking about AirPeak. Um, bring your questions, send your questions through in the chat for Craig and for Travis. And um, as you guys have been, you know, using the, the, the S1, you're doing some, some air to air, some drone to drone. I'd like to talk a little bit about how, how that works. And, and Craig, again, starting with you, uh, tell us a little bit about how, how it works and how it worked for you. Well, air to airs are a pretty difficult thing to uh, capture. Um, there's a lot of moving parts involved. There's multiple pilots, um, especially if you're, the, the first team is tracking another subject. For instance, uh, some of the commercials that you guys have seen, we were tracking a uh, motorcycle. And um, so you can imagine just capturing that alone is tough to track that. And then uh, there's another pilot syncing up to capture both of those subjects at the same time. So framing all that, syncing up, is a difficult thing, but what I find with AirPeak is it is uh in and knowing the limitations uh or you know much easier to uh frame up the shot and be closer to my subjects. Um, you know, we were going up to, I think, 55 miles an hour even. Um, and, you know, you, you really have to link with the other pilots, too, in a scenario like this. And Travis uh, did very well. And I think as a team, we did pretty well to, to uh, frame up those shots. So uh, it's exciting going forward into other projects and seeing what we could do with it, starting to track, you know, more subjects uh, like other cars and mm -hmm. and even extreme sports, you know. Absolutely, and and you know, having seen some of that footage, it is pretty extraordinary. And Travis, if you could talk just a little bit about you know that kind of drone to drone footage and some of the the challenges involved there. Yeah, it's it's very high stress flying. Uh, 
you know, it's it, it really takes a good team, good team effort, teamwork to, to be able to do that. It's great to have the aircraft that can handle that kind of thing. Um, you know, you're turning off your vision sensors, your collision avoidance, you're going, uh, you could hit each other. So definitely really good teamwork is important. Uh, the air peak, though, makes it so easy to frame your shot. And then and once again, going back to the custom customizations of the controls, you can really make it fine tune it to where it flies the way you want to fly. So like if we were doing this, say Craig was the leading uh, aircraft, you know, he would have his top speed set maybe at like 55 miles per hour, but my top speed would set maybe at 53. So if there was a something that went wrong, you know, he could get out of there and I would just be tailing behind him, period, you know, I'll never hit him. Um, so it, it, it's, it comes down to communication and, and smart setup of your equipment. You know, um, you guys, we, we had a chance to talk before um, we went live. And I, I know I've told you about my own experience flying uh, drones. And I guess just for our audience to so that you understand where I'm coming from on this, I'm the one person I know who has genuinely destroyed a, you know, an indestructible drone, flying it into uh, a rock a couple of times. So uh, I'm really in awe of of these guys and of the skills that they have and being able to take something like an S1 with, with that, the payload that it has and the big cameras that it can carry is is kind of just extraordinary to me. And I know we've talked quite a bit about, you know, some of those those cameras, but um, Travis, while, while I got you here, can we talk just a little bit, about, put, put that into some perspective, what it means with an FX3 versus um, other drones that you've flown with the cameras that they can carry? Oh, so you have the ability to capture, you know, excellent, excellent footage with a, with a system that's, like I said, not much bigger than Inspire. Uh, you know, you don't get that with other aircraft of this wheelbase. Uh, so the, the ability to be able to fly these alpha payloads in the FX3 and have all the different set, uh, lenses that you could swap out, I mean, really opens up your creative world once again uh, with a, at a small package. Uh, and that small package comes with a lot less stress. Uh, and, and it's also reliable. So, uh, you know, compared to other aircraft, to be able to take a, a payload like an Alpha, I mean, like I said before, I used to go from systems that were like 1,500 millimeter wheel bases, you know, three times the size of this system, uh, and just to fly an Alpha. And now I don't have to think about that anymore, you know, so. You know, you guys were talking about um, about flight times, and you were mentioning um, the the hot swappable um, uh, power su power source. Can can we talk about that a little bit again? Can you guys explain it to me so that you know, as though I'm a, a smart seven year old? Um, Craig, over to you. Uh, starting with with that. Yeah, absolutely. So the hot swapping capabilities of of AirPeak is that um, the idea of where you know you need to bring the drone down and swap out the batteries and take off as, as soon as possible, right? So what the aircraft allows you to do is bring it down, swap out, the, there's a uh, dual batteries on there. You pull one of the batteries out, take a fresh battery, put it in there, and then you take the other uh, depleted battery out and put a fresh one in there. And you know, all while you're doing this, the system is still powered on, on standby, ready to go which means, you know, that whole process can take just seconds, you know, 10, 15 really? seconds. Um, and the other great thing about this, I think, which will be very interesting for production teams is having multiple gimbals with uh, different camera lens combinations that are already ready to go, pre-balanced. And, you know, you could essentially do the same thing as you're doing with the batteries is hot swap those gimbals out. If the director says, hey, I need this other lens in a different camera, it's ready to go. You, you land, take off within 10 seconds. So uh, that's the gist of uh, the whole hot swap capability. And Travis, anything to add on that? No, I, well, it's just great. It really is a big deal. Um, to, to be able to to land and swap in seconds. Uh, every every demo demonstration I've done with the AirPeak so far, that's been the big mind blowing thing. Cause we fly, we fly, and they'd be like, okay, we gotta swap the batteries real quick. And you know, that's a normal thing, but we're not we're not turning the aircraft off. You know, the batteries are right there, we're landing it, and it's like within 30 seconds, we're back up in the air doing what we were doing again. And, and you know, a lot of these guys in the industrial world too, uh, not just the content creation world, it's time is money. They want to be back up in the air as fast as possible. 
that's that's a big deal. And same with the gimbal, to be able to swap that out. And another thing that they, they have is you can tune your gimbal, too, through the, the AirPeak uh, Flight app. You can tune to different uh, uh, settings uh, for the different payloads. So even if you don't have a secondary gimbal and you need to swap out to a different lens and you need to make s some adjustments, you don't have to open up a whole other application separate from Sony product to, to, to make these adjustments. It's all right there in the app. Gotcha. In the couple minutes we have left, I'm, I'm really interested in just kind of um, addressing a little bit about what is required as far as licensing uh, to fly a drone. We were talking about this for a couple minutes before. Travis, can you, can you sort of explain just real, real briefly, we're almost out of time, um, just the, the different licensing that is required? So if you want to fly uh, uh, commercially, then you need to have a, a CFR 14 Part 107, which is a commercial operator license for unmanned aerial systems or small unmanned aerial systems. Uh, that's, you know, through the FAA. It's about a 60-question test that you take, and it's two hours. Uh, I said before, I think someone with really good common sense could come off the street and pass that test. But if you also want to fly just for yourself personally, that's under a Part 101, and you don't need any licensing for that. It's uh, smart to uh, sign up with the AMA, though, which is the uh, Aeronautical Model Association, something like that. I might be butchering that one. But uh, you don't have to have any type of licensing if the data that you wish to capture is for personal use. Gotcha. And, you know, you're talking about someone with common sense can probably pass that exam, but it's, you know, the exam itself isn't really the point, right? You, you got to be, you got to be a good pilot here. It's not, it's not about getting the piece of paper. It's about knowing your craft. Yeah. So you might be passing the, the test and then going out to the field to go fly a drone or going to get into your commercial operator's job. And then you're, you're not able to fly because you don't know how to fly the system. But to get your 107 license, they don't require any flight time like that. So that's going to be on you. And they, they have a little tidbit there in the FAA 107 that uh, you, you have to understand your, your equipment. And so that's, that's on you. And it's so, especially with the air peak, this is a very, uh, uh, technologically advanced piece of equipment. So it's a very smart drone. So you need to go through all the manuals and watch the videos, everything applicable that you have to, to better yourself to before taking off this aircraft. Yeah, really great, great advice. And guys, I want to thank both of you for being here live with us today. Uh, Travis Snyder, Craig Coker, um, really been a pleasure talking about Air Peak. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. Absolutely. And thanks everyone for joining us here at Creative Space. fire that is within you is the same that is within us all. A spark traveling through the night. A torch burning in time. And it is how we use that time that will define our story. The creative mind can shape worlds out of thin air. Imagine the unimaginable. See beyond the impossible. We give meaning to life. And life gives us meaning back. It's not just about what we see. It's about the way we see. Together, we dream upstream.
into the headwinds. Against all odds. Come on! Seeing the world through a lens unlike any other. are the thought sparkers, the street dreamers, the wind hunters, the fire seekers, collectors of color, trappers of time itself. <laughs> and it's how we use that time that will define history. My name is Sarah Dichi, rhymes with peachy, and I am a YouTuber based in Dallas, Texas. So I'm always on the go. I need something fast enough to keep up with YouTube life. I am super excited for the Xperia Pro I. It is crazy to see the depth of field that you can get with it, and it is pretty insane that it's coming from a smartphone. Xperia has a brand new on-the-go solution called Videography Pro that combines all the features that a run-and-gun filmmaker like me needs. I can access different lenses, cine looks, and switch apertures between f2 and f4. I can check it out with a ton of accessories, an external mic on top, a multifunctional grip where I can zoom in and out, and also a portable vlog monitor. This is really great because you can still use the rear cameras and I can still see myself. It's honestly crazy that I'm recording this on a phone because it looks like a movie. It, it looks so good and it has a video shortcut key where I can just pull it out of my pocket, press it, and I am off to the races. I autofocus keeps lock on my eye, so I'm in focus whether I'm here or back here. And just like shooting with my Sony Alpha cameras, it has optical image stabilization. And that way I have assurance that my image is going to be steady, it's not going to be shaky. Shaky video footage is always very, very distracting. The Xperia Pro I is slim, it is water and dust resistant, and it is packed with a ton of features. Xperia shoots up to 120 frames per second, and I can also shoot 4K HDR, which is great for capturing beautiful colors for your video. 
One might think that being a YouTuber means that image is everything, which it is, yes, but audio is just as important. Xperia has added a third unidirectional microphone, and it almost has the effect like you're just there with the person. It also has a sound source separator that uses an intelligent wind filter. What that means is they figured out how to deal with the biggest sound killer in the field, wind and with Cinematography Pro. It also has Venice Color Science, which uh, they take from Sony's Cinema Line. So if you wanna go Hollywood, that is an option. Whether I'm in the studio or on the go, I always love to have a pro image, and that's where the Xperia Pro I comes in. And I think even my audience expects, you know, an elevated image from me. So it is really great to have that in a smartphone. The Xperia Pro I is just that. Photography in its essence is about emotion. Capturing that emotion takes more than a good eye. It takes having the right camera and the right moment. Sony took all the speed from their existing cameras, combined it with all the advanced technology from the Xperia line to create the Xperia Pro I. Street photography happens fast. The fleeting moments that create the best images are gone with a blink of an eye. Fast action, low light, wild contrast swings. This new Xperia can handle it all having a 1.0 type image sensor and dual aperture f2 and f4 lenses in the camera on my phone is a complete game changer. The bokeh, the low light capabilities, never in a million years did I think I would be able to create images that rival my mirrorless camera on my phone. With three different focal lengths, it's like having a full kit of lenses and Xperia's Photography Pro allows you to shoot in auto, manual, or any way in between, giving you full control over all its settings. It features real-time tracking and real-time IAF. It instantly locks onto your subject wherever it is. With built-in optical image stabilization, my handheld images are sharp. And its dedicated shutter button it has a feel-in function that I'm used to with my Sony cameras. Xperia Pro I has light and fast autofocus, covering 90% of the frame and it shoots in bursts of up to 20 frames per second. Xperia's high sensitivity sensor handles night scenes like a champ and with little noise and mind-blowing dynamic range. Its T-Star coated lenses practically eliminate reflection, flares, and ghosting. So whether I'm shooting into street lights or the sun, the image comes out perfect. As a professional, I always use a strap with my cameras and with the Xperia, same exact thing. Plus with a water-resistant body, I know it won't get damaged even as I carry it around the city. Because Xperia records in 12-bit RAW, it provides smooth and rich files to work with in post without any banding to worry about. And thanks to 5G capabilities, I can upload and share my images immediately. Or I can use Xperia's removable SD card for quick transfers and hot swaps up to a terabyte. Nothing captures the emotion of a moment like a perfect photo. And now with the Xperia Pro I, have the ability to capture that perfect moment at all times.
Prospering in this environment is challenging. When you give kids a voice and you give them access, greatness is sure to follow. This allows for more kids to be exposed to what their passion is going to be. We always say, you know, you can't be what you can't see. What we're creating for our community is growth. Think of the wildest and craziest things that you can do to change the world around you and then use this support to make it happen because you have a whole team behind you. At B&H, we're here to help folks find what they need. Give us an example there, Irving. There was NASA. NASA? What did they need? A unique hospital at Lens. We often have what others don't. For all your needs, big or small, check out bnh.com. This is a real B&H customer story about Fred Smith here, turning lemons to lemonade. Fred, tell us your story. I was a fitness instructor in Atlanta, and I transferred to New York March 13, 2020, right as all the studios shut down. But with B&H's help, I started Workout with Fred. The challenge for a fitness instructor when they're streaming from home is you've got multiple sources of audio. I didn't know how complex that was, and that's where B&H came in. Whether I was on the chat or I called, anytime I had a question, they had a solution. I was like, ah, I wish I'd called you earlier. Thanks for sharing your B&H story with us, Fred. Visit us at bnh.com for expert advice on starting your next project. <laughs> I take for granted all these moments sometimes. Oh, I don't need the stars to align. No matter what you always have. Hey gang, welcome back. Along with the Brooke Shaden, I'm Mahesh Thapa, uh, known as the starting photographer on Instagram and on my website. Uh, and it's a pleasure to do this portfolio review take two. Uh, Brooke Shaden is, as you know, I'm sure you know, an amazing photographer, concept photographer, fine art photographer, just an all around wonderful person and just talented in every way. I feel so fortunate to share the stage with her. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, to maximize the time and maximize the information that we can give uh, for our uh, for our audience. So yeah. let's go ahead and yeah, hi Brooke. Hey, this is awesome to do again. Um, I'm excited to get started with Carrie's portfolio here. Um, this is a portfolio that I could only dream of attaining. So it's um, a really beautiful thing to start with. Um, 
I would love to jump into this portfolio by saying that so many of the images, uh, Carrie, that you have created in this portfolio are really immersive. And so as somebody who does not create images, anything like this, I still feel like I'm following a character and I'm following a particular point of view in a story. So in this first image that we're looking at here, where we have the mountain kind of centered, the clouds all moving in, but also the subject matter of the penguins, I feel like we're seeing your perspective of what this space is like to you. So I really appreciate that about your portfolio, but I know that Mahesh will have more technical. Uh, <laughs> no, in some ways I wish, I wish I could just <clears throat> respond to images viscerally, which I, which I often do, particularly for the genres that I'm not, uh, that I'm not doing a lot of. So this is the type of photography that I, I love to do that I, that I try to do myself and, and, and capture. Uh, and I'm assuming this is somewhere around Antarctica or close to it with all the penguins there. And I really like the color here. I really like the subtleties of the hues in the sky, the, the light baby blues, uh, the slight pinks and the oranges. It's not overdone. I, I'm, I love the fact that you can get a little hint of the blue coming out of the snow also. Um, <clears throat> I think this could use a little bit uh, of processing, particularly in the foreground. I find that uh, it is a little dark. I want a little bit more detail in the rocks, a little bit uh, more imaging of the, the penguins and sometimes a graduated neutral density filter would really help in a, a situation like this. And if you don't, didn't do that, maybe, uh, taking multiple exposures, um, at various values and try to blend that in, or just if you have a Sony camera, the sensor is so great that you can expose for the highlights and then recover the shadows so quickly. Uh, I love the fact that there's a little bit of color reflecting in the pool of water in the lower right hand corner. I feel like if you went down a little bit more and got closer to that water, it would really accentuate that foreground. You know, it's all about this wide open view and getting close to that foreground will really make that thing pop and look bigger. So in general, I think it's a wonderful shot with just a couple of uh, suggestions to make it a little better. Great. So I'll start with this one. Uh, this, I mean, it's it's great. I love this. You know, I actually looked on the website to see what a group of walruses are called. It's called a herd. It's called a herd of walruses, and that's what this is. I love it. Uh, it's like a murder of crows, but no, it's a herd of walruses. And I mean, I love the fact that you know there's a little bit of like I think blood even or some stains on there, so it's really rugged. You get the sense that this is not in a zoo or some kind of a preserve. This is really out in the wild. I love that. Uh, the only suggestion I have is that I see a lot of empty space at the top and at the bottom and sort of tight crop on the sides, uh, a little bit more uh, space on the sides, maybe less space on the bottom. So this, I think, would work an amazing shot in panorama if you cut, you know, maybe half the sky and part of that uh, snowy foreground and really focus your attention uh, on these beautiful animals. Uh, that's really all I have to say for this one. I was so drawn to this image. And I think that part of why I'm drawn to it is because it looks so organized. There's the clean lines of the sky, the clean lines of the walruses. And all of that just speaks to me as a fine art image, something that you could sell in an exhibition. And I'm not sure what your aim is. If your aim is to have exhibitions, if you're speaking to conservation or anything like that, but this feels like a really wonderful image to have printed extremely large so that people can walk right up to it and get into all the details, um, which is especially fun to do with an animal as large as this to print it that big. So I'm not sure what your aim is, but I would love to see this one extra large. Uh, now, this picture grabbed me for many reasons. I think that probably most people looking at this would have an initial gut reaction of, wow, oh my goodness, where was this? What's going on here? And I think that the reason why, partially why I have this reaction to it is because it is atmospheric. And it's not that your other images aren't, but it's that most images aren't really atmospheric in that really sort of mysterious kind of way because of the fog that we have. Have here. And I think that that's something that we often get in movies rather than still images is the sense of everything's in motion. There's fog rolling in. It looks like this could be some 
epic film. And that's what I'm really drawn to about this or the extreme circumstances of it and how much implied motion there is. It's like we have these monoliths of these columns on the, the one side and then the absolute chaos of the birds on the other. And I think that it makes for an, a really inviting cinematic image. Yeah, I, I could have said it better myself. Uh, Brooke, this is a great image. And for many reasons, I love the composition here. I love the fact that uh, the most prominent verb, sort of which is at the center of the of the image, is pointed towards the right-hand side, towards all that empty space. And so you know the direction. So your eyes follows right that. And so what is over there? What's over there? It's empty space, but filled with a lot of these flying, charismatic, uh, these creatures. And I love the fact that even in this low light condition, you were able to maintain a shutter speed that was high enough that the birds didn't get blown out or or didn't get blurred out it means that, uh, you know, you really paid attention to your craft uh, and you made sure the shutter speed was still high. And I love how, like, like Brooke was saying, the monolith on the left and all of a sudden that composition just pops because you've got that monolith on the uh, left hand third uh, and you got empty space on the right hand third and the middle third is somewhere between where you can just see a little bit of another monolith but it's a little obscured, both by the birds and by the clouds and the low-lying frost. The only thing I may have done slightly is increase that exposure just a tad because, again, that, that snow should be white, in my opinion. And here it looks a little gray, a little dull, just a little bit of brightness. But, you know, that's sort of a personal touch and a personal opinion. If you're happy with the way this feels, the mood, then that's great. Just I'm telling you what I would have done. And hopefully uh, you take it in that, in that sort of vein. Okay, so I'll, I'll take this. And I think this is a wonderful image. You know, I, it's wonderful because of that shallow depth of field, because uh, it's such tiny creatures, yet it occupies so much of the space and it tells so much. And I love the inner digitation uh, of the froth of the water and the grayness of the sand. It's like fingers coming and touching each other. And right at the edge uh, of that intersection, you've got these wonderful creatures just about to begin their life. You know, they're born. Um, and hatched uh, in the sand, and they are going back towards the sea where they came from. I love the fact that the, the other one in the distance, you can barely make it out, so you know it's something that's um, uh, a group of this is uh, happening to, yet it's you're not um, inundated with so many of these things that you get lost in the image. So I love the fact that you only see two of them, and one of them is crystal clear, clear sharp, and the one is just out of focus, but you can still tell what's going on. I really like the shot. And I actually felt the opposite on this one, where I felt that this was one of the weaker shots in the portfolio for the reason that I feel like I've seen this shot before, many times before. And not that I have exactly, but I've seen pictures of turtles. I've seen this angle. I've seen this kind of composition. And your other images felt to me like there's no way that I could ever experience or see what you've seen. Like the angle that you're getting, the experience that you're getting is something that is unattainable, whereas this feels attainable. It feels more commonplace. It feels like a shot that I would attempt to get myself, not that it would be this good, but I would attempt it. And the others feel unattemptable. I don't think that's a word, but let's go with it. So for me, this one was a little bit weaker because it breaks from what you've been doing in the other images, which is to get these expansive shots. And that's not to say that it is a worse image, but for me, it's less impactful because of that. Fair enough. Now, this is such an interesting image to follow with because I was just saying I didn't love how it was more close up rather than further back, but this is a great example of where we're close up and yet it feels expansive. And part of that is because the background is completely white. The bird itself blends into the white background and it makes it feel abstract. It makes it feel like something you wouldn't normally see out in the wild. That excites me. So this shot I actually really love, even though it's closer up, because it feels feels like it could be a painting. Like, wait, how would you find this shot out in nature? I don't know, but maybe it could be painted. And so um, this really captivates me on a number of levels. That's great. No, I, I thought this was an excellent shot too. And I, I think this is an emperor and penguin, but correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a, uh, it's a great shot. And for many of the reasons that, that Brooke mentioned, you know, it's, it's a, it, and the composition I think is, is pretty, pretty good. It's almost there because the birds, uh, is on the left-hand side looking towards an empty space on the right. I think we could crop a little bit from the top, the empty on the top, 
such that the eye of the bird is now squarely in the in the, the rules of thirds. You've got the left right rule of third perfect, but I think it's a little bit too centered in the top down version. Otherwise, I think the composition is spot on. Uh, I love the just almost. You know, if the yellow wasn't there, it would be a monotone image. So it, just that little splash of yellow really pops in a, in a shot like this where everything else is either black, gray, or white. So great job. Okay, so I guess uh, I'll start off this one. Uh, Ishmael Quintanilla, uh, Quintanilla, I'm sorry, the third. I'm, <laughs> I'm so bad with things. Uh, and, you know, I have to just say straight out, I, this is not my type of photography that I do, but this was probably my favorite portfolio, uh, just because I'm not used to shooting like this. I, I only wish I could shoot shots like this. Uh, and I, and the reason I think I like this portfolio in general is because the great use of ultra wide angle for people shots, and which I think is hard to do. So let me talk about the first image here. Uh, this is definitely taken with ultra wide angle lens, and and the per, and the subject is so close to the lens, you can see that the face is is really is in your face if you, you know, sort of spay. And then you got that feet going up. You got the whole composition. It, there's distortion here, but I think the distortion works really really well uh, to convey a sense of a craziness, a sense of whimsical, sense of uh, just being in the moment. So I want to see what Brooke thinks because you know she's much more of a people person, a people photography person than I am. <laughs> well, this is I, I am going to have trouble critiquing each image in this portfolio because this is a fantastic example of somebody who has a very clear vision and understanding of what their method of storytelling is. I'm extremely impressed with this portfolio, and this image is a great example of why because. It gives off a sense of being carefree, of just being totally in the moment, yet I don't believe that this was just shot in the moment. Like, I'm just going to point and click, but that's the feeling that it gives. Like, you're you're living vicariously through this photographer in this wild and crazy space, but you can tell that it's not because of how it's framed, because of the colors that are being pulled, the lens choice, et cetera. Um, so let's move on to the next one to see some more examples of this, because I think it runs through everything. This is another example of where the photographer is making a distinct choice to rotate the image, to show off all of these lines that are moving through the image. And even turning this black and white allows us to focus on the form and the shape rather than the color and the atmosphere. So I think that was a really interesting choice um, as gets repeated throughout this portfolio. Yeah, I really like this image also. And mainly because I think of the rotation, I would never really think of doing this as a vertical shot, I think, oh, the patient, the person's on the uh, on the back. They're moving across the across the crowd. Of course, it's going to look good lying out because I can get the whole thing in this. In the technically, that's the way I, my brain would work. But artistically, I think this is a lovely choice, and I love the fact that uh, the person decided to give equal weight to the empty space on the top, or actually to the right, uh, as towards all the hands and uh, and the movement and the drinks and what have you. Uh, on the left side of the image. So uh, artistically, I think it's 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 a it's a wonderful shot. I forget. Is, is this my turn? <laughs> okay. So uh, when I first saw this, I said, you know, this looks like an old time Polaroid. Like somebody was jumping up and down. They had the flash on. They took the shot. And you know, the more I listen to Brooke, the more I think, you know. This probably wasn't just spontaneous. Maybe this was probably staged where they had the person jump and they happened. So, okay, this is the right time to jump, jump, take a picture. But I think it's done so well that it looks like a very spontaneous type of image. I love the the rose-colored glasses. I love how, you know, two people are relaxing down. One person in the center is jumping up and down or jumping up and showing all this emotion, the hat, the hair, everything. I, I you know, it looks like a simple shot with a simple flash, uh, a Polaroid, but I still like it a lot. This is the perfect example of how we could sit here and talk about, well, I can see the flash and I can see the shadow on the wall and it's kind of tilted, you know, and so, and, and it's the kind of image and portfolio where it's not really worth having that conversation because it's not about the technique in terms of getting it right. It's about the technique in terms of evoking a feeling in a story. And the feeling that's being evoked is wild, carefree, in the moment, and yet all of these elements are working together. The poses of the two guys on either side, the way that they're so laid back, the way that the one is jumping forward, all the colors and the way that it works. There's a lot of 
thought and care going on here. So, um, you know, this kind of photography just makes you feel like you wish you were there, like you missed a moment that was in some way personal and historical at the same time. Right. Totally. Um, so this was actually my least favorite of the bunch, but only because it shifted styles slightly. This feels a little bit more like a traditional band photo um, rather than following behind the scenes. It's still a brilliant image. I think that there's a lot of good to be said about this picture. Although for me, technically, um, just thinking about the overall composition, I, I think it almost would have been interesting to see without the blue coming down fully on either side, to see it just be a full black stage with the, the characters coming up. It would almost make it look like a puppet show, kind of, um, which is a little bit weird to say, I guess. But that said, it's, it's it, to me, my least favorite of an amazing portfolio that I love pretty consistently. So it's hard to, to say. Now, Brooke, it's, it's, it's funny because I thought this was a great shot. Uh, and exactly for the reasons that you had a, a little problem with it, uh, I, I like the fact that I see the, a little bit of blue on the side. You know, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, this looks like a silhouette of the Beatles. You know, I remember seeing uh, old time Beatles uh, albums and pictures with something like this where there's a, <clears throat> uh, a white background, black and white images. And technically what I like is that, you know, somehow they managed to get every single uh, band members separately. There's no overlap. Even on the left, you know, the, the 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 shoulder or the back seems to be perfectly in line with that with that with that curve of the of the raised hand. Uh, and I just feel I get this old time nostalgic feeling when I see this. So I actually like this like this quite a bit. Okay, so this is absolutely my favorite image not only of this portfolio, but probably my favorite image of all the portfolios I've seen so far. Earlier, if you, if you, if you clicked in on last session, we had this one image where the smoke was being used and I thought it was uh, probably took away from the image a little bit than, than contributed. Here, I think it completely is necessary, completely contributes to the overall feel, not only the coming you know, from the mouth, the stage, the lighting, the pose uh, of, the, of the musician, um, it, everything just, it, even, even the, the, almost the matching colors, the muted colors of the floor, how dirty it looks with the dirty shadows and the dirty light and the, and the intermixing of everything. I just, I, I really, really love this image and I wish I took something like this. <laughs> I, I can very much agree with you that it's a brilliant shot and it's not my personal favorite of the portfolio because I'm more drawn to those behind the scenes images but that said I don't think that anybody could fault this image it, it the tones of it are brilliant the blue of the smoke the way that's mimicked in the floor and in the shirt I think that it's really really strong the pose the lighting I can only imagine how difficult it is to try to photograph a performer where you don't get to control much of anything. So to be able to find this shot and recognize that the smoke coming out of his mouth is going to be mimicked in the smoke from the stage is really just a, a beautiful thing to find and to make use of. So overall, this has been an incredible portfolio. Perfect. Um, so let's go on to Margaret. Uh, Margaret's portfolio, in fact, you had just said, Mahesh, that, that 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 was probably your favorite image that you've seen so far. And this portfolio has my favorite image that I've seen so far. So starting with this first one here, I think this is such a gorgeous, understated way to start a portfolio and way to take a picture. We can see that this is a child. We can see that they're in a bathtub of some kind. And we don't get much else you know i'm used to seeing sort of documentary style images where you see a child playing in the bath or something like that and this is moving in so that we see this one drip on the cheek which is there and it's it's understated but it's there mimicked by this one little flower and i it can't get over the poetry of something like this the monochromatic feeling of it the way that it's so still and so somber i think it's brilliant Oh yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Brooke. And I, when I first saw this thing, I said, I couldn't help but contrast it to the other image that we saw earlier in the portfolio, not this one, but the other session where 
uh, the girl was laying in the milky white uh, water and a bunch of flowers. And uh, this is so much less as far as the amount of stuff there, but it just spoke to me a lot more uh, just because of all the reasons you mentioned. The understand. In fact, you know, when I saw that uh, little drop on the cheek, I couldn't tell, is that water or is that a tear? Or is that something that, that they're going for? And I love the fact that I don't know and I want to think about that. Uh, just that one little flower just floating there is it a you know is it sort of the same age kind of thing is it both uh both something that's young something that's about to develop uh you know water being nourishment for both the child uh and uh, and the flower and like you said you know it just it just speaks to me it's just the the, the understated nature of this is is just brilliant so i really like this shot too okay so this is one of my favorites also, uh, not only of this portfolio, but in general, just because I had to sit here and look at this for, for a while and think, is this something that's beautiful or is this something that's disturbing? You know, I said, what, what is it? Or is it both? You know, I, I first, I first, I didn't even notice the knife on the right hand side. You just barely catch a little bit of it. And I thought, oh, are those little pomegranate seeds? What is that? You know, the and then the perfectly aligned with the fingers like, oh, wait, wait, are those fingernails that have been cut in a weird way because <laughs> and then and then that and then that is that is that hand on the other hand a loving uh hand that's sort of caressing the hand or is that something that's more ominous that's like you know what you know uh something that's being more forceful so i love the fact that i couldn't tell what was going on yet it's such a graphically beautiful image i thought for all the reasons that you just said i adore this image i think that it is one of the strongest pieces of storytelling I've seen in a really long time. Um, and I'm not going to repeat everything that you just said, because you just said everything that I would have pointed out, but you can't tell if this is supposed to be scary, ominous, mysterious, or if it's supposed to be loving and beautiful. And I think that it should be both. I think that a great story gives you hints at multiple storylines. And that's what you've done here. It is in my opinion, I mean, my way that I would love to interpret it is that this is a really disturbing image. And I think that it is. I think you can't avoid thinking, why are the fingernails, you know, if we want to call them that, like, you know, sort of severed and up above the hand? And why is that hand there holding that one down? Um, there are just so many stories here. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I just like, I want to give you a hug for this. <laughs> I always get a little goosebumps almost when I see this, you know, and, you, and the way you describe it. But this use the use of that word "severed," I think, is it's such a such a strong word and a great description for for, for what we see. Yeah. Okay, so this image is kind of an interesting one to me in this portfolio. Um, I think that it stands alone a bit in the portfolio because suddenly it's a little bit less about the understated controlled story and it's more about this action shot. So I almost don't even see this as part of the same portfolio in, in a sense. I think that it's beautiful. I think that there's a lot going for it. I like the backlighting quite a bit. I like that we have the blur of the water in the foreground, the motion of the subject. And when we look closely, there is a story here. I just think that it's not as controlled as the others. So for me, it doesn't stand out. Now, if this were in a different portfolio and I knew I was going to look at something different, I would think, wow, what an image. This is, I can't believe that they caught this moment where it almost looks like the person is is a wave coming forward and, and sort of continuing the body of water. So I think that as a separate piece, it works really well. It might be the, the jumping point um, of a different type of work that might fit in somehow. Um, so, so yeah, I feel a little bit split on this one. Yeah, no, I, I think you said it very well, Brooke. Uh, that's sort of, I think, the limitation uh, of this type of review is that people maybe want to feel like they want to show their best images, yet it really is a portfolio review. So you probably want to show images, even if it's not your best, the ones that have the same theme. So you don't get comments like this from us. <laughs> so that, this would be great in another portfolio. Uh, but I think it's still a wonderful image. I, you know, so many times I see water images with long exposures and flowing, picturesque like that. I love it when I see water pictures with droplets. That means that, you know, uh, spur of the moment. I mean, that's what water is. It's not flowing. It's 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 harsh. 
it's, uh, it's life-giving, uh, and it's instant. And I love the fact that this is captured that way. The light, I'm assuming that's the sun in the background, uh, the, the light coming through, that's backlighting, the, whether it's, it's lens flare, or maybe the lens has gotten wet, so you see the little, uh, little bokeh balls of, of, of light going through um, the droplets of water on the lens, or maybe it's just the splashes of water that haven't quite hit the lens yet, and that's being backlit like this. Uh, and the fact that it's only on one side, uh, on the side of the water, on the left side, where the right side is completely clear. Even the tilted horizon here doesn't bother me because that's what the person is doing. They're tilting, they're distorting, they're, they're, they're turning in a way that everything works. And I think this would have been a much less powerful image had it been color. I love the fact that it's just black and white uh, because you know you can't, you don't, you don't, you're not hiding behind the wildness of different colors and hues. All you have here is the texture, the composition, uh, and the subject matter to really take you home, uh, if you will, uh, about the image. And I think, I think even though it doesn't fit in this portfolio, I think it's still a great image and something that, that, the, uh, that the author should be proud of. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, and this one I actually found <laughs> to be pretty disturbing <laughs> when, I, when I saw this. Uh, uh, obviously, this is a picture of a child, uh, and sort of it's photoshopped in a little zipper in the back, and I, it looks like it's filled with stuffing. I can't quite tell, but the, I, like one of the things I can make out is a little happy face. You can see like two eyes and a little a little mouth, uh, and it's it's in 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 probably their room. Uh, you know, it's it's sort of a, you know, the room is a little messy, and maybe the child is a little messy, and it does it does it give a sense of neglect almost, you know, not necessarily abuse, but neglect in the sense that uh, not everything is quite right about this. You know, the, the room isn't quite right. The lighting is a little ominous, a little harsh, and the sort of opening in the back to the spinal canal uh, is also a, a little disturbing. So I like this image, but I'm like, huh, I, I don't know if I, <laughs> if I, uh, if, if, if this, not, this is not, this, this makes me feel like I want to help help this person in some way, and uh, and and I think that's if that's the message and that's the feeling that that the photographer is going for. I think you know a great job. This image, I feel two ways about it, and one of them is that I get the story. I mean, I, I get the story that I get from it, which I think is all you can really do for an audience is to let them interpret it. And for me, it's a feeling of emptiness. It's a feeling of sort of being hollow, being filled with stuffing rather than filled with blood and guts. And that I think is mimicked perfectly in the pose, in the lighting, and the fact that you get just this hint of the bed and that they're in the room, um, even just wearing underwear. I mean, I think that's a really interesting choice here to have them stripped bare almost in this space. Very, very smart. I think even cutting the head off, I think is a really smart choice conceptually for this image. Now on the flip side to this, I would argue that an image like this, that's clearly heavily composited, which uh, on a technical note, I think the zipper's done very well. I think that the the stuffing and the electronics inside is a little bit bright for me. So it's it, I look at it and I think that looks composited because I don't believe that that's quite there. So if you just darken down what's inside, I think that would work better technically. But conceptually, I almost need to be prepared for this to move, not, not on a conceptual level, but more on a technical level. I need to be prepared to see images that are composited because at the beginning, going back to that um, chopping board image, there didn't seem to be any compositing. It was all done very practically, same with the bathtub image. And yet they were also disturbing images in, in many ways. And so I feel that an image like this needs to get set aside with other images that are composited so that my brain knows that we're going into the world of surrealism and compositing rather than practical effects. So I think that, um, you know, on the whole, it fits because I am on board with your method of storytelling and the stories you're telling very, very much. I just think that this might be separated out into a separate uh, series. Perfect. Uh, I think this is the last image here. Great. So this image separates from the others in that um, it's an adult, 
Um, it also contains compositing. I think in that way it goes well with the image before it. Um, and I think that it's kind it's a little bit interesting with the way that it's composed sort of tilted and she's lifted and the smoke is going one direction. There's a sense of controlled chaos here that I do really like. Uh, I, 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 I think this was probably my least favorite of the series just because I could tell the composite, like how you could tell the compositing in the other one. This one to me looks a little more obvious, particularly at the chest. Uh, where the where the all of a sudden there's blackness and the smoke coming out, uh, it that, it just doesn't appeal to me as much as the other one. And I don't know what's exactly happening. Is this is this something good? Uh, she's being uplifted, or is this something something bad? Uh, you know the uh, and and maybe that's the point. You can't tell at all. And I think the birds and the smoke. It's just a little bit too much for my taste. But I I like the fact that you're trying something different uh, and and uh, being very graphic and uh, and very uh, avant-garde with this. So in general, I thought the portfolio was excellent. I agree. Really, really strong. Thank you to everybody during this session. We will see you again soon for more portfolio reviews. All right, guys. Bye. I'm Allison Anderson. I'm a Sony Alpha Collective member and I make travel and lifestyle content online. I've been making YouTube videos for 12 years now and my favorite thing to do is travel around the world and share those adventures with my audience. Today I'm going to be talking about all things YouTube, why it's my favorite platform, how to start a channel and make your videos stand out, my favorite gear, tips and tricks for growing a channel, and how to make money from your videos. So why YouTube? If you're interested in creating content, it can be really overwhelming trying to choose which platform to start with. However, I think YouTube is the best and here's why. First, it's evergreen, meaning the life cycle of a video is much longer and videos can be discovered years after they've been published. YouTube has become a video search engine and what's really nice about that is when you put a lot of work into a video, you've poured your heart and soul into it, you feel like you get more out of it because it lives for longer. Versus platforms like Instagram and TikTok where the average life cycle of something is usually a day or two, maybe a week if you're lucky. I remember when I cut together my first TikTok video, I spent like three and a half hours on it. I was way too invested. And 24 hours after I posted it, it was dead. There were no more views, no more likes, no more engagement on it. It was so much work for so little life on a piece of content. Now it's just buried in the abyss of TikTok, never to be seen again. So the work that you put into YouTube goes a longer way. Another thing I love about YouTube is you can share so much much more in long form video than on short form video platforms like Instagram and TikTok. You can really dive into the details, whether it's teaching your audience how to do something or documenting an experience, and it allows you to connect with people who share your interests. That's one of the best things about YouTube is the community. And then another amazing thing about YouTube is you can monetize your video content. You can make money from views on your YouTube videos, and I'm going to talk about that more later on. So what is vlogging and why is it special? If you're new to YouTube, you probably keep hearing this term vlogging, which stands for video blogging, and it's really just sharing your story. It could be a project you're working on, tips you have, a travel adventure, or just a daily diary. There really aren't any rules, and I think the special thing about vlogging and why people are really drawn to it is it feels very personal. Unlike a documentary or a TV special, vlogging doesn't feel like a large production, even though for some creators it is. Like, you know how it's always really exciting when one of your favorite celebrities starts a YouTube channel or signs up for any social media platform, really. Even though you've seen them in interviews or TV specials or whatever, it feels so much more personal to see them vlog or talking to their phone or sharing photos of their weekend on Instagram. And that's a good reminder that more than anything, people like real. As long as you are just sharing something real in your videos, it's going to resonate with somebody. Now, a lot of people wonder, is it too late to start a YouTube channel? With the popularity of YouTube these days, it's easy to feel like it's totally oversaturated and way too late to start a channel and find any success in it. But that is simply not true. I have talked to people about YouTube for a very long time, and let me tell you, everybody has always thought it's too late to start a channel. In 2025, 2021 is gonna seem like a great time to start a channel. And some of the biggest, greatest YouTube channels of all time haven't 
even been created yet. So don't be discouraged. You are the only person in the world with your unique perspective and your channel hasn't been done yet. So let's talk about how to get started with your first YouTube video. First, you want to choose a niche. Chances are, if you've been wanting to start a channel, you already have a topic in mind. And choosing a niche is really important when starting a channel because it lets new viewers know what to expect from you. And that's critical when you don't have a ton of videos or an established presence on the platform yet. For example, let's say I'm interested in aviation. So I want to watch pilot vlogs and learn about airplanes. I search for airplane videos. I find a video. I like that video. And I say, hey, I want to check out what else this person has made. If I go to their channel and they have five other videos about flying, I know I can expect other aviation videos from this channel. And thus I subscribe. Now, if I go to that channel and they have five other videos that are holiday baking recipes, how to fix a sink, vacation in Hawaii, book review, and gaming. I have no idea what to expect from this channel. And while I liked the airplane video they posted, I don't feel confident I'm going to be getting another airplane video from them. So when new people visit your channel for the first time, you want it to be very clear what types of videos you're making, which is why a niche is very important. Next, you have to choose a subject for your first video. If you're looking to attract subscribers to your channel, I highly recommend starting with or incorporating topics that are highly searched for. If you're a musician, cover a hit song right now. If you want to do daily vlogs, go vlog somewhere near you that's popular. Like if you live in Seattle, go vlog at the Space Needle or Pike Place Market. A lot of people are on YouTube searching Space Needle and you'll start coming up in those searches. Next, you'll need to find a camera to film with. This could be a smartphone, an action camera, anything that you have. When I first started my channel, I was filming on an old mini DVD camcorder that I found in my my parents' house. The video was bad, the audio was bad, the lighting was bad. And my point with that is if I can start a YouTube channel with a DVD camcorder, you can start a channel with anything you have at your disposal. And then when you go to film your video, do as many takes as you need to. I think this is something that people feel really discouraged about when they first start because they have to do so many takes to get it right and they feel like they're really bad at it. But the reality is everybody does a million takes. I will retake the same part of a video 10, sometimes 20 times if I can't get it right. And a lot of creators do use teleprompters to help get around this because it is easier if you can see words right in front of you. So maybe that's something to look into if you think that would help you as well. But if you're stumbling over your words and you're doing every take a million times, don't feel discouraged. That is everybody's experience. Also, don't feel discouraged if you feel awkward, shy, embarrassed. I felt all of those things when I first started making videos, so much so that I didn't even tell anybody I was making YouTube videos for a little while. When you're not used to being on camera and seeing yourself on camera, it's really weird. And if you're filming in public, it is awful the first time. It really Really is. You feel like everyone is staring at you. It is so embarrassing. It gets better. Finding your camera presence takes time and every YouTuber that you love watching at some point posted their first video and felt as vulnerable and awkward about it as you may feel about posting yours. So what makes a good video? Number one is planning. The more planning you do, the easier the process is going to be and the better your video is going to be. Yes, sometimes you can spontaneously pick up a camera and magic will happen, but that's usually not the case. So for example, let's say I'm going to go vlog a hike. I ask myself, how is the video going to open and what visuals do I need to really share this experience? What talking points do I want to make? Is this place going to be crowded? Do I want to be there at a certain time of day? And what is the weather going to be like? I always make an outline for a video that details the talking points I want to make and how I want the video to progress. Also plan out your gear. What camera or cameras are you going to be shooting with? Are your batteries charged and packed? Are your memory cards emptied back in the camera and formatted? I think every single YouTuber has had the experience where they've gone out to shoot something and realized that they either didn't have a battery in their camera or the battery was dead, or they didn't have room on the memory card they brought with them, or they didn't have a memory card at all. Unfortunately, it will probably happen to you at some point, but the more you plan, the lesser the likelihood is that it will happen. Also, a big part of planning is is cleaning your gear. Is your gear clean? Are your lenses white? The next thing that makes a good video is story. A popular phrase in media is story is king. I believe this is one of Pixar's original mottos. And it basically means that an engaging story is key to an effective film. And it's very true for vlogging. So ask yourself, what's the point of this
this video? What journey am I bringing my viewer on? The next thing you need in your video is personality. We all have YouTube channels that we watch because we just like the person who makes the videos. We think that they're really funny. We like that they're energetic or maybe we like that they're really calming. So don't be afraid to let your personality shine through because that's what's going to make your videos really unique. The next thing a video needs is details. Highlighting details both verbally and visually are crucial for a good video. If you're hiking in the woods, stop and show everyone that unusual flower that you found or describe how crisp the air feels or get some audio of the birds chirping in the trees. And visual details are easily shown with something called B-roll. B-roll is a term for supplemental footage to your primary footage. So right now you see me here on screen talking to you. This is the primary footage. But now if I start talking about that trip to Iceland I took a few years ago, you're now seeing images of Iceland on the screen. This would be B-roll. It's supplemental footage to give the viewer more information, details of what I'm talking about or an idea of where I am. So if you're out vlogging and you say, we have perfect blue skies today, stop and get a shot of the blue sky to cut away to. Really take some time and get those detailed shots of the cobbled streets, the traffic, the sunset, the birds in the trees. Also, if you don't have a b-roll shot of something that you need, I would highly recommend checking out Storyblocks. It's a subscription service where you can download and use stock footage and it's amazing. All the time if I realize I don't have a b-roll shot of something, I just go on Storyblocks and I have it in like two minutes. It makes your life so much easier. Another thing that makes a good video is music. Music can really set the tone of a video. Something adventurous or upbeat for a travel vlog really pulls the audience in. Something zen and calming can complement a quiet morning on the lake. Also, don't forget about sound effects. Your microphone isn't going to pick up all of the ambiance around you. Adding some subtle sound effects can really bring a clip to life. Like, did you vlog at the beach, but your mic didn't pick up the sound of the ocean waves? Go get a sound effect clip of ocean waves and add it to your video. Next, I want to talk about one of my favorite things to talk about, which is gear. But first, I want to address the question that everyone asks, which is, does gear matter? Does better gear make a better video? I would say yes and no. No. It's really easy when starting out if you don't have a whole gear setup yet to feel like I can't make good videos because I don't have fancy equipment. But the thing is, there are creators that I follow that it wouldn't matter what they shot on. They are so interesting and engaging that it wouldn't matter if they were shooting on the cheapest camera out there, they would still be making amazing content. If you can figure out how to tell a story, engage your audience, include the details, the music, the sound effects, you don't need the best gear to get people to wanna watch you. That being said, better cameras, lenses, microphones, etc., are going to unlock the potential of what you can create. If you want to film wildlife in Yellowstone National Park, you're probably not going to get any really close-up shots on your smartphone. And if you do, you're probably in trouble. You're going to want a telephoto lens, which can be expensive. So gear can matter, but only if you're doing all of the other things right too. So let's talk about what I shoot with and why I love it. And I have to say, if you are just now getting into vlogging, what a time to start because gear has come such a long way, even in the last five years. So starting with cameras, there are a handful of cameras I use to shoot my content. My main camera that I'm shooting on right now is the Sony a7S III. I love this camera. If you follow me on my YouTube channel, you know this. I've done nothing but rave about it since it came out. For starters, it's phenomenal in low light, like out of this world good in low light. It also shoots in 4K resolution at 120 frames per second, which is incredible for slow motion. I prefer to shoot anything that moves really quickly in 120 frames per second because then I can slow it down and really highlight the detail. Also, the in-body stabilization is great, so handheld footage isn't shaky. It also also has a flip out swivel screen, which is essential for vlogging. It makes it so much easier when I'm trying to get a shot of myself on camera out somewhere so I can actually see where I am in the frame. And then also the autofocus tracking is impeccable. This thing does not lose my eye. I don't know how it does it. And that's so important for me because most of the time I don't have anybody behind the camera. I self shoot most of my content. So I don't have somebody there checking to make sure things are in focus. So I need the camera to get it right the first time. The camera I used before the a7S III was released and became my main camera is the Sony a7 III. This is one of Sony's most popular 
favorite cameras of all time. I swear at one point, every YouTuber was talking about this camera. I shot on this exclusively for a couple of years and it's what made me fall in love with the Sony ecosystem. It's full frame, just like the a7S III is. And actually Sony just announced the new a7 IV, which is the successor to this one, which is so exciting because it has a ton of upgrades like the flip out swivel screen and it shoots 4K at 60 frames per second, which is amazing. Now these big mirrorless cameras are a little too heavy for me to hold out in front of myself to vlog with. So for those types of shots, I use the Sony ZV-1. Sony designed this camera for the vlogger, which what an exciting time to be in where cameras are being made specifically with YouTube and social media in mind. It has a swivel screen so you can see yourself. It has a 1.8 aperture so you get that nice blurry background behind you. It also has built-in ND filters so you can still use the 1.8 aperture even in a really bright environment. It also has a pretty great internal mic and it comes with a wind cover for it, but you can also use an external microphone with it. Another type of camera I use is an action camera, especially for anything involving water, being on the water or underwater. That's a really cool perspective to be able to add to your content is if you're jumping in the lake, you can take the camera with you. And then I also use a drone for aerial footage. I think aerial footage adds such a unique perspective to any location. And it's a really great way to make your videos stand out. Next, let's talk about lenses. If you decide to get a camera with an interchangeable lens system, like a mirrorless camera, your lenses are going to determine the look of your video. And everybody's preference for lenses varies depending on what they're shooting. If you have no idea where to start, I would consider a 24 to 70 millimeter zoom lens. 24 to 70 is a really versatile range because the 24 millimeter end is pretty wide, but the 70 millimeter end is pretty zoomed in. It's great for detailed shots, B-roll, or anything that's a little ways away from you. If you're doing a lot of landscapes or shooting indoors in really tight places, something like a 16 to 35 millimeter can be really useful. I have the GM version from Sony and this thing is always on my camera when traveling. It's wide enough to get everything in the frame, get those really scenic shots. It's also wide enough to film in my car, but also the 35 millimeter end takes some really nice portraits and you can even get some detailed shots at 35. If you want more depth of field or a blurrier background, a prime lens with a wide aperture is gonna be good for that. This is the Sony 35 millimeter 1.4 GM lens, which is beautiful. I also have the 24 millimeter 1.4 on my camera right now that I'm filming with. This 24 millimeter is so great, especially for on-camera shots where you want some depth of field, but you don't have a lot of space to create that in. And then my favorite telephoto lens is the Sony 100 to 400 GM lens. I bought this for a trip to Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park last year, and it is a dream to shoot with on a landscape. The compression and detail that it captures will take something that looks ordinary to the naked eye and make it magical. Another really important component of making videos is audio. Your audience needs to be able to hear you clearly. The main microphone I usually use is the Sony ECM B1M shotgun microphone that's on my camera right now. The great thing about a shotgun style microphone is it's good at capturing audio directly in front of it and not capturing audio anywhere else around it. So right now, if I was at a park and there were some kids playing over there, this microphone would be good at isolating my voice and not picking up the sound of the kids playing. I also really like that this microphone is powered by and works directly with my camera through the hot shoe so I don't have to charge it, I don't have to plug it in anywhere. And then another type of microphone that's really popular is a lavalier mic, which is the type of microphone that clips onto you. These are especially good if you're going to be a distance away from the camera or if you're constantly moving on camera, like you're giving a home tour and walking around and you're you know going through different rooms and you're gonna be different distances from the camera at all times. It's better to have your mic attached to you so your audio isn't always changing. And then another really important aspect of making videos is lighting. Oftentimes bright natural light is enough to light a video. I filmed in front of a big bright window for the first several years of making videos before buying lights. So if a lighting setup isn't feasible for you at first, natural lighting will totally work. But if you don't have that option or you want more control over your lighting environment, I highly recommend getting some softbox lights. Softbox lighting looks really natural because there's a screen in front of the light that diffuses it. And you can strategically place the lights to create different effects, different shadows, different moods. Okay, so moving on from gear, let's talk about all the things that go into making a YouTube video that aren't filming. At first, it seems like the biggest part of making YouTube videos is the actual 
filming being on camera time, but that's actually only a very small part of the process. By far the most time consuming part of my workflow is editing. You're going to need some editing software to cut your videos together. And there are a handful of popular options to choose from. If you have a Mac, iMovie is a great program to start with. I used that for years when I was starting out. And the nice thing about iMovie is it's free and it'll do all of the basics for you. If you're looking for something more advanced, Final Cut Pro is also a software from Apple and it's what I've personally used for nine years now. I find that it's really intuitive to use and I love that it's a one-time purchase. Once you've bought it, you never have to buy it again, even with new upgrades and versions that come out. I paid for it once back in 2012 and I have the latest version of Final Cut on my computer. A couple other programs that people seem to love that are worth checking out are Adobe Premiere Pro, which has been around for a long time. And then a newer program that's gotten a lot of buzz that people seem to love is DaVinci Resolve. So I would look into all of those to see which seems like the best fit for you. And sometimes it takes trying a couple of programs to find the one that clicks. Another important part of the video process is storing data and clearing memory cards. One of my biggest tips as a creator is to get organized early on. Organize how you store and back up your footage and be diligent about doing that. You want to invest in some good hard drives, figure out an organization organizational structure, and then make sure you have two copies of it. There's a saying with data storage that if it's in one place, it's in zero places. Hard drives and memory cards fail all the time. So if you really want a file to be safe, you need it to be in two different places. Also, there's a lot of busy work kind of stuff, like filling out the description boxes for your videos and your tags for your video. There's a service called TubeBuddy that you should definitely look into that will generate relevant tags for your video, and it will show you how your video will rank for each of those tags. You'll also want to amplify your video across other social platforms. You'll spend time coming up with titles and thumbnails. I swear one of the most time consuming things about making videos is agonizing over which thumbnail and which title to use. Like I have actually lost sleep wondering which of the two thumbnails I've made is going to be the better thumbnail. Also, you'll want to add captions to your video. Captions are so important, not only for viewers who have impaired hearing, but also a a lot of people watch videos silently. I do all the time. If I'm sitting in a waiting room or somewhere and I don't have any headphones with me, I'll just watch a video with the captions on. I use a service called Rev that does them for me and it's super easy. Next, let's talk about some tips and tricks for growing a channel. You wanna make a good first impression with high quality content. We've all had the experience of clicking on a video and it's dark and you can't really see anything and you can't really hear anything and it's out of focus and clicking right off. Make sure your image is well lit, you're in focus, and your audio isn't too loud or too quiet. You also want to be consistent. Research actually shows that you will grow an audience faster when you post frequently and regularly. And I've spoken to a lot of YouTubers over the years who've gone through phases of daily vlogging or just uploading a lot. And they all have said that the period of time where their channel grew the most was when they were uploading all the time. Something that can really help with staying consistent is batch shooting your content. A lot of creators making these types of videos, especially where you just sit down at a table, are shooting two, three, four videos in a single sitting. It's a lot more efficient to shoot multiple videos at once instead of dragging all of your equipment out, setting it up, shooting one video, breaking down all of the equipment, putting it away, and then doing it all again the next day. Especially if you have a more traditional Monday through Friday work schedule, batch shooting two to three videos on a Saturday could set you up for two to three weeks if you're aiming to post one video a week. There's also a saying that goes, it takes a platform to grow a platform. One of the quickest ways to grow an account is to promote it on another account. Having social media accounts on a variety of platforms allows you to cross promote your content. Not everybody who follows you on Instagram is going to follow you on YouTube. So when you promote your new YouTube video on Instagram, there are going to be some new people who are brought over to your YouTube channel. You also need good titles and thumbnails. People click or don't click on a video based on the title and the thumbnail. So put some thought into something that's accurate, catchy, and interesting. 
And then the last thing I want to talk about is how to make money on YouTube. This is probably the area of YouTube that people are most curious about, largely because it's very vague. So let's talk about it. I want to start by saying it takes a lot of traction on your videos to start earning a notable amount of money from YouTube. It definitely isn't a get rich quick platform, but there are a variety of ways that you can earn revenue from your videos. The first is monetization through ads on YouTube. We've all seen the pre-roll ads that play before we watch a video on YouTube and creators receive a percentage of revenue from that ad. So every time an ad plays on one of your videos, you'll earn a very small amount of money. Like it could be a penny or a fraction of a penny. And the amount you earn fluctuates depending on what that advertiser is paying, which is part of why the whole thing is so vague. Every advertiser pays differently, so it varies widely for everyone and it's constantly changing. So there's no guarantee, like if my video hits 50,000 views, I'll get X amount of money. Another way to earn money from your videos is by working with sponsors. Once you build up a channel, you might be approached by brands who want to sponsor a specific feature on your channel. And then a third way to earn revenue is through affiliate links. Affiliate links allow you to earn commission on a sale exactly the same way that it works in a store. When somebody buys something through your affiliate link, you'll earn a small percentage of that sale in commission. So if you're doing a video talking about your top five favorite camera lenses and you have affiliate links for those lenses in your description and somebody clicks on one and goes and buys a lens, you'll earn some money from that sale. And there are a lot of other things you can branch out into like selling a product, creating merch, selling stock footage. If you're getting a lot of great video shots, you can sell them as stock footage. And a lot of creators use this as a form of passive income. So those are some of my thoughts on all things YouTube. I hope something in this was useful for you if you're thinking about starting a channel. And if you are at all considering starting a YouTube channel and you're on the fence about it, do it. It's so fun. The community is amazing and you could be the next big creator that everybody's waiting for. Thanks for joining me today and have fun out there filming. Hi everyone and welcome to Creative Space. I'm Christopher Robinson, editor of alphauniverse.com and host of the Alpha Universe podcast. And I'm joined today by Allison Anderson, YouTuber and one of the newest members of the Alpha Imaging Collective. Allison, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to have you and um, really enjoyed that, that video that you, you just uh, showed us. Lots of great information in there. Before thank we get you. started, oh, thank you. Before we get started talking about it, I just want to remind our audience that we are, in fact, live with Allison. You can submit questions through the chat. We'll be trying to take your questions throughout the, the program here. And Allison, I want to kind of kick it off and just ask a little bit more about how you got started um, as a filmmaker and in YouTube in general. Yeah, so um, it was back in 2009, the the Wild West days of YouTube where having a YouTube channel wasn't a thing. And I, I had discovered a few YouTube channels that I liked and I, I thought, wow, there's people who intentionally create videos. And it was summer and I was on break from school and I thought, you know what, I wanna try this. And so I rummaged around my parents' house and found an actually a Sony mini DVD camcorder uh, and started recording videos on the floor of my childhood bedroom. And then I had to have my dad rip all the footage off of the mini DVDs with his computer because nothing could edit it back in that day. Um, and it was really fun and exciting and I fell in love with it and I stuck with it and I never anticipated that YouTube would become what it has become today and it's been a really fun ride. It seems like you really love just doing things on YouTube, being a vlogger, being a filmmaker. Um, was that something that just has been kind of within you? Was it kind of, you know, looking, looking to get out or um, did it start through photography or anything like that? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, at the time that I started my YouTube channel, I was in college and I could not for the life of me figure out what to major in. Um, 
And I, I was trying to pick all the practical things. I was like, well, I could try to be a doctor. I could try to be a lawyer, an engineer, something very practical. And I never considered pursuing uh, something with cameras. Um, but looking back, I, I started having an interest in cameras as early as seven years old in middle school. I would spend sleepovers filming videos of friends on an old VHS camcorder. I was always interested in creating and it, it was just never apparent to me. Um, so I always had a love for it. I just never saw it coming. And then I, I, it's no wonder I was drawn to YouTube and, uh, yeah, it, the time has flown and it, it did become something that became a career, which is really exciting, but I didn't see it coming. Gotcha. You mentioned that when you started your channel, it was in those kind of wild west days of YouTube. And we got a question, um, and I know you talked a little bit about this in, in the video, um, but the question being, do you think starting a YouTube channel is harder now uh, because the platform is so popular? And I know you really did talk quite a bit about, you know, the don't think that it's too late that you've missed the boat. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, there it's absolutely true that it is harder to get visibility these days because there are so many creators on the platform. But the platform is also so much better than it was back when I started. There weren't a lot of people on YouTube consuming content back in 2009. And then, of course, the opportunities for actually turning it into a career weren't there. Um, brands didn't want to work with YouTubers. Um, it was you had to apply for uh, the YouTube Partner Program, which back then was a really difficult ordeal. Um, so, yes, it is harder to get visibility these days, but everybody's on YouTube now. Everybody goes to YouTube to search for anything. So you have more eyes on the content. I think there's a lot more material out there um, to learn about the algorithm and the best way to get visibility on YouTube. Um, so there's pros and cons to starting then versus starting now, but there absolutely is a truth to that, that it is harder to get visibility at the beginning today than it was 10 years ago. You know, and I think that um, while it might be harder to get visibility, it's harder to, to, to stand out. That whole notion of um, it's not too late. That does, just because it's harder doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile. It doesn't mean that it's not something that you can succeed at. It's, it may be more difficult, but it's still possible. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, there are so many great channels that haven't been created yet. And it's, it's funny because, and I say this in the video, everybody has always thought it's too late to start a YouTube channel. I remember back in 2011, two years after I started having conversations with people that are like, oh yeah, you know, I feel like 2010 was the cutoff point. And it's like, now today that sounds absolutely ridiculous right? to think that 2010 was the last time that you could start a channel. And we, we don't see it now because we're in it, but we are at the very beginning of the social media explosion. It's really happened in the last 10 years. Think what's going to happen over the next 30 years with social media, that this is still a great time to start that YouTube channel or grab that domain name that you want for your website, whatever you want to do. We're still in the early era of it. And to think it's too late to go and start a YouTube channel these days I mean, think of everybody who's young, all of the preteens and teenagers right now who are going to grow up and start really amazing YouTube channels or maybe in the process of starting them right now. Um, it's not too late. It's definitely not. And five years from now, you'll wish that you started today. You know, I, I, I love hearing the enthusiasm with which you talk about this and that, that look to the future sort of sense. Um, I find it, you know, really inspiring. Um, and because there is so much conversation about, oh, it's too late, I missed the boat, the, the, you know, the golden age is, is past us. I, I like that you're saying you know, so, so emphatically that no, that's not, that's not the situation. Yeah, definitely. And especially any women watching this right now, there are so few women making photography, videography, camera based videos on YouTube. That is a niche that is so unfilled that if you think it's too late like it is it is a very male dominated space on YouTube and there are a lot of very very talented men creating content as we've seen um but yeah especially women if you're interested in cameras and you want to make videos about photography or anything 
there is absolutely so much room left for that. So definitely, it's not too late. And you know, on, on that, I'm, I'm also going to mention that we have the, uh, the Alpha Female program. Um, and you can find out more about that at Alpha Universe. And for all of those women creators out there, I encourage you to come to the website, find out about the Alpha Female program, and apply for a grant. We're giving out those grants. We've got more, more to, to give, and we're excited um, to have you apply. Allison, we got a question um, about your channel and, and your transition from lifestyle to travel. Um, how did you transition your YouTube channel from lifestyle to travel? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it was a scary thing to do, to be honest. Um, so if you aren't familiar, back in 2009, when I first started making, making videos, I started by making beauty videos. So makeup tutorials, product reviews, the whole beauty sphere. And I, and I built my channel up really on that niche. But as every human being has, I have more interests than just that. And my interests evolved and I became more interested in travel and lifestyle and, and other types of things. And it's a scary thing to depart from the niche you started with and what your followers expect from you. Um, but I just little by little, started doing more of the stuff I was really interested in. And the the amazing thing is when you start any kind of social media platform and you build an audience, there's a, commu there's a community there that's there just because you, you guys feel like friends. You feel, you feel like you're all into the same thing. And it was really amazing that I found that a lot of the people that were interested in my earlier content were still interested in new adventures and new things that I was doing because they also were evolving their interests in their own life. So um, yeah, the transition was a little scary to do, but it's totally worth it. And that's something that I would recommend because anybody who has a YouTube channel or any kind of platform for a really long time, you're naturally going to evolve with your interests and you can feel really intimidated to step out of the box of what people expect from you, but I'm so glad that I did. And you discover new people and a new community that also shares those interests. We are live with Allison Anderson. We're taking your questions, submit your questions in the chat. Um, Allison's just given us a, a great look at, at becoming a YouTuber, becoming a successful YouTuber in her video, and we're answering your questions. And we got a, a question, um, about how long it actually took you before you went full-time as a YouTuber? Hmm. So that is a good question. I don't have a, an actual uh, exact specific period that I can think of. So I started my YouTube channels, uh, my YouTube channel, well, I did have two at one point, um, when I was in college. And I would say it was about two and a half years after I started my channel that I decided to go full time into YouTube. Um, it, it basically was when I found that my hours that I was putting into my channel were as lucrative as the hours that I was working at my job that I had at the time um, was when it kind of became a no brainer for me that I wanted to do the switch. I think it was about two and a half years. Um, we also got a question just kind of um, about the, the evolution of your channel and uh, about, you know, um, the subscribers. Did you find a difference in the number of subscribers when you made the, uh, the transition uh, in your videos? Talking about from lifestyle to travel. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is I, I did. It probably uh, plateaued a little bit because as I was losing people that maybe weren't interested in the new content, I was gaining new people who were interested in the new content, it, it didn't dip as much as I anticipated. I had prepared myself that it was going to be maybe a year, a year and a half of just a straight kind of downslide as people who weren't interested left to follow other channels. Um, but it, it really, it was pretty amazing how many people were interested in the newer content and how quickly I also found new people that were, were interested in what I was making. And on that topic of, of subscribers, what is more important um, as a YouTuber, especially a YouTuber who's looking to, you know, monetize, to make a living doing this? Mm -hmm. um, subscribers or views or a combination? How does it, how does it net out? Mm, this is a great question. Um, the biggest thing is engagement. So a lot of people think 
I need X amount of subscribers or X amount of views and that's the best thing. But really it's something that's called an engagement rate. It's an actual rate that brands who want to work with you will look at. And it's the a percentage of your audience that's actually engaging with your content. So if you have 10,000 subscribers on YouTube and you're averaging a thousand views on every video, that's a 10% watch rate from your subscribers. But if you have 10,000 subscribers and you're getting 5,000 views per video, that's a 50% watch, watch rate from your subscribers. Um, same with like Instagram. If you have 100,000 followers and you're averaging 1,000 likes on a post versus 100,000 followers and you're averaging 5,000 likes on every post, um, that engagement rate is really important. So I wouldn't say that it's getting the biggest number that you can it's getting the most engaged community that you can. Um, so that's why things like buying followers, bot accounts, all of that, it inflates your numbers and to the average person just glancing at your profile will make them think that you have a very large impressive following. Um, but really the, the most impressive thing is the people who can build these communities with really high engagement. So I, think I would focus on building a community of people who are really interested in the topic that you're talking about and the stuff that you're making. And I think it really can't be overstated that Google, you know, YouTube, um, they're really good at looking at, at the, this kind of engagement. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a thing if you really want to kind of keep growing to be building that engagement, because that becomes very much a, a virtuous circle. You know, the more engagement, the more Google is sending, the more YouTube, I, I say Google and YouTube interchangeably, are sending people to your your content to your channel. Yeah, definitely. And it's, I mean, it is a, a statistic that brands look at if you are looking to monetize your content. And it's something that when you're negotiating with a brand, you can leverage, you can say, hey, like I believe the average engagement rate on Instagram is just under 2%. It was at one point. Um, so if you have a 4% engagement rate on Instagram, that's something you can say, hey, like I charge this much because I have double the average engagement rate on this platform. So it's it's really an important thing. It's, it's important from the business side and it's also important for the community side. We got a question um, about, about your content specifically. It says, I check out your blogs from time to time um, and notice you visit more places during your trips than what's included in your videos. How do you choose what to keep in the video and what to take out? Oh my gosh. It's, I think this is a really great question. <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard. It's part of why there's such a lag between the time I go on a trip and the time the video gets posted. It, sometimes it, it'll be like nine months for me to get a video together because I, I shoot a lot. Um, my Alaska video was... 12 hours of total footage when I imported it and I ended up cutting that down to 10 minutes. So I, I, sh I shoot probably more than I should. Um, and then I just, when I'm going through like my 100th pass through the editing, I just, the, the most important thing when making a video is when somebody gets to the end of it, I don't want them to feel like it's just dragged on forever. Mm -hmm. I want a video that when it ends, there might be someone who's like, I actually want to watch that again, or I want to go back and watch that part again. And I think, I think as viewers, we all feel that way as well, is we like things that are snappy. We don't like things that drag on and, and get really wordy. So I just try to choose the, the best parts of the trip and um, what shot the best as well. Like sometimes there, there can be really cool things that I go see or do and the footage just didn't really turn out or the footage didn't really convey the experience. And uh, yeah, I just try to, to keep the flow of the video really snappy and um, show the best parts. It's hard though to choose what to leave in and, and what to take out. I know exactly what you mean about, you know, wanting to keep things so that, you know, you end with the audience wanting, wanting more. You don't like to see things that just kind of slowly fizzle out to, to nothing. So I totally get that. Carlin has asked, how do you deal with the idea of imposter syndrome, say from watching other creators and not wanting to feel like you're copying their styles? Oh yeah, imposter syndrome is so real. Uh, I still feel it very much. Um, I would say it, it's okay to take inspiration from other people, especially to start because you, you gotta kind of figure out your own thing. It's kind of like, 
if you're if you're starting painting, you're probably going to watch Bob Ross or somebody much more maybe more relevant in the painting world. I wouldn't know, um, and and kind of learn those techniques. And then it, the more comfortable you get, the more you'll have you'll have your own ideas of things to do. Um, I think I think the thing to know is everybody has imposter syndrome. I think everybody to a certain extent has this fake it till, till you make it mentality. Um, and I, I don't know if that ever goes away. There are a lot of really, really successful people in all industries who speak about having imposter syndrome. And the way that I combat it is I just try to tell myself that everyone else feels like imposters too. And then maybe we can all feel like imposters together. Definitely. Um, yeah. You know, I, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to interrupt you there, but I just, I, I'm sitting here nodding emphatically because I know just what, what you mean. And, you know, there's the old saying that um, good artists borrow, great artists steal. You know, it's, it's um, you know, being inspired by others and, um, you know, kind of wanting to incorporate bits and pieces of other ideas because they really, they really speak to you. That's, you know, that's not a bad thing. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of like, what, what can we do together to, um, to raise the level of the content that we produce, all of us, you know, it's, it's, um, so I get what you mean. Yeah, definitely. We got a question um, about on the marketing side. Do you have a strategy for growing in terms of marketing your videos or channel um, that you mentioned using other platforms, but what is your usual flow? Yeah, so I think the, the best thing you can do is uh, promote across other platforms. Um, the whole, it takes a platform to grow a platform perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just really learning um, like SEO, which is search engine optimization, um, algorithms, how those work. Um, I mentioned in the video, a service called TubeBuddy, which um, has a whole ton of tools. You should definitely check it out. Um, but it'll help you generate the best tags to be using for your videos. It'll help you... Um, test two different video titles and see how those would do in the algorithm. There's a lot of stuff that you can do, but yeah, people who are getting a lot of visibility on videos, they know how to work the algorithm. They know search engine optimization. So that would be a good place to really educate yourself in and spend some time. And then also, yeah, it's, it's good thumbnails, it's catchy titles mm -hmm. um, and it's being consistent. I feel like so much of it is, is a game of inches. Like there's no magic bullet. It's, it's just, you kind of got to keep pushing forward on all these fronts. And, you know, it's, uh, you get this cumulative score. It's not just one thing. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's uh, a lot of different things going on at the same time that you want to stay working on. Getting back to what we were talking about a minute ago regarding engagement, we got a question that asks, do you have any advice or suggestions on what you can do to get more engagement from your audience? Hmm. Yeah, so... Um... A, a very easy thing that they recommend everyone does is ask your audience to like or subscribe to your video. That's why you see so many people doing it. Um, that shows, research shows that that increases engagement significantly. Um, also saying something in the video, like let me know down in the comment below what you think. Um, another huge thing for engagement and um, boosting your video's uh, visibility in the algorithm is something called watch time. So if you have a YouTube channel and you go into the creator studio in the analytics section, you can see what your average watch time is for your videos. And watch time is something that the algorithm um, really pays attention to. So if your average video length is eight minutes and your average watch time is four minutes, then if you post a video and your average watch time on that is five minutes, the YouTube algorithm knows that this video, there's something special about it. People are watching it for longer and so they'll boost it in the algorithm. But if your average watch time per video is lower than your average, then the algorithm will suppress it. So the best thing to do is keep your videos um, moving along, keep them snappier so that people aren't clicking away, but also keeping them accurate for what they are. Um, that's a, a big thing is if you, if somebody clicks on a video and the video is not accurate for what the title and the thumbnail suggested, they're more likely to click off early. Also, they say that the first five to 10 seconds of the video is the time 
to hook people in. So you don't want to have a really slow start. You want to open that first five to 10 seconds really strong with something that is going to make the viewer want to stay around. And it's going to make somebody who's new to your channel stay around because I think we're all the same when we go check out a new channel and we click on somebody's video after five seconds, if I'm bored, I'm just going to click right off. Like yeah. that's how we all are. So you want that, those first five seconds to be something like, Hey, today I'm going to do this or, or something that makes people really get invested quickly. Otherwise they just want to go watch something else. You know, and, and talking about that, um, that, that watch time, it's a matter, I, I think, of, of finding the sweet spot for your audience and your content. You know, there's no golden or there's no hard and fast rule like a video has to be two minutes because people only want to watch, you know, two minutes of, of video. Mm -hmm. If your content naturally is keeping people engaged for 5, 10, 12 minutes, then you can make 5, 10, 12 minute videos. On the other hand, if, if your audience is saying, you know, I, I kind of am, am moving on from this after two or three minutes, then you got to kind of adjust accordingly, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it really varies uh, by topic as well. Some topics can can be longer and be really interesting, and some topics don't need a lot of minutes um, to cover them. You talked about you know the the importance of consistency and of of frequency. Um, you know, posting a certain amount of content over a certain period of time, getting your audience really used to that cadence. Um, that can be, you know, really draining. Um, Braxton asks, how do you prevent burnout? Uh, and also, um, by st but also stay consistent with engagement and posting. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think any creator totally avoids burnout for starters. I think everybody is susceptible to it. Um, the, the biggest way is to plan, plan ahead. Um, you know, I have like a Google calendar all set up with months out of video ideas and, and my shoot schedules and how I'm going to pull everything together. Um, and I think a way to avoid burnout is to make sure you really like what you're making. Um, if you're creating content that you don't love, just like anything else, it's, it's going to burn you out. You're going to feel bored with it. Um, if you're really passionate about what you're doing and everybody should be, you, you won't get burnt out as easily, but plan and, and it's okay to take breaks too. That's something that I've experienced. I remember the first time I took, you know, a, a month break off of YouTube and I thought like, oh my gosh, everyone's going to leave. I'm going to come back and no one will ever want to watch me again. And I mean, we all have lives going on too. I, you know, if somebody I love takes a, a couple months off and they come back, I still want to watch them. So yeah. Kind of on, on a similar similar note, um, how do you balance travel editing, working with brands and all that comes with being a, a YouTuber? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes not very well. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Uh, I'm still learning. Um, one is just is planning. And, and I also like to compartmentalize um, what I'm doing. So when I'm traveling, I'm not posting anything like nothing that I post on Instagram ever stories or anything has ever been in real time. When I'm shooting, that's the only thing I focus on is shooting. Then then I'll go into the editing stage. And the only thing I'm focused on is editing. And then I'll go into the posting stage where I'm actually pushing out content. Um, and I just try to stay organized with, um, with working with brands, making sure I'm not taking on too much at once. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a learning curve, and I would recommend maybe looking into hiring people to help you. That's something mm -hmm. that I think I should have done a lot sooner, and I'm still working on. But a couple years ago, I hired an assistant, and she's fantastic. That I, you know, if I need help with something, I can just ping her, and she'll have great ideas or or be able to take some of the smaller stuff for me. Um, she has completely transformed my Pinterest. Uh, which is amazing. So, you know, look into expanding your team as well. If you feel overwhelmed, hire somebody. A lot of people hire video editors. Um, so there are ways that you can outsource things as well. I think that there's just so much to be said for the kind of organization that you're talking about, just kind of keeping yourself on track, using calendars, you know, getting a, a system set up that works for you. You mentioned that, you know, when you're shooting, you're just shooting. When you're editing, you're just editing. Um, and that works for you. Other people may want to just run through one piece of content, but whatever works for you, just kind of 
getting into that zone and, and sticking with it. Yeah. We got a question about um, other influencers. Who are some other YouTubers or artists that influence you? Oh man, there are, there's so many. I mean, in the, in the tech sphere, I love Sarah Dietschy. Uh, Lizzie Pierce makes great videos about photography if you don't watch her. Um, Donna Did It is a channel I discovered in the last year that I think he makes really great stuff. Um, on Instagram, there, oh, there, I mean, there are so many great like travel accounts on Instagram. Um, recently, I discovered Asa Steinars, I think is how you pronounce her name. She okay. lives in Iceland and she makes like the most amazing images and, and drone shots. She's incredible. Um, I like Lexi Limitless's content. She, I believe, was the youngest person to visit every country in the world or the youngest American recently. She broke a record, which is super inspiring on the travel side. Um, Gerald Undone, for anything technical, is amazing. I could watch his videos all day long. Um, there, there are so many great creators that it's hard off the top of your head to even list them all, everybody that I love. Um, I know what you mean. And, and there is so much great stuff being made. And, but it is, you know, it's important to, I think, um, look at other people's work, watch other people's work and not be afraid that by doing that, you're going to somehow unconsciously or consciously be copying them. I mean, it, it, I, what I said before we were talking about, you know, being influenced is, is great and, and kind of raises everybody up together. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's really exciting and it's it's amazing to see how the platform has transformed. I mean, back in the day with YouTube, everything, like the standard, the fancy creators, I didn't have a MacBook at the time, but the fancy creators were shooting on a, on a MacBook webcam. That was like the high, the high tier quality of YouTube. And uh, it's, it's so incredible to see where it's, where it's come and the tools that are available for creators today. And, and yeah, it's everybody lifts everybody up. When somebody reaches a new cool achievement, it's, it's good for everybody. We are just about out of time. And I got a question in that I'm really interested in, in finding out more about. Do brands reach out to you or do you reach out to brands for, for work? I would say 90 to 95% of the brand work I do is the brand reaching out to me. However, I have reached out a handful of times in the past to a brand and, and really pitched them hard to work with me. Um, if, the, if you have a dream brand that you want to work with, definitely reach out to them and, and tell them why they should work with you. Um, I've been rejected by some of those brands. So that is going to happen naturally. But I also have had some of them say, okay, yeah, let's work together. And they've been some of the best experiences I've had. Um, I think that that's, uh, that's great insight. Allison, it's really been a great pleasure having you here today. I loved your presentation. A lot of great information. And, and this Q&A has been just great. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. fire that is within you is the same that is within us all. A spark traveling through the night. A torch burning in time. And it is how we use that time that will define our story. The creative mind can shape worlds out of thin air. Imagine the unimaginable. 
see beyond the impossible. We give meaning to life. And life gives us meaning back. It's not just about what we see. It's about the way we see. Together, we dream upstream into the headwinds against all odds. Come on! Seeing the world through a lens unlike any other. are the thought sparkers, the street dreamers, the wind hunters, the fire seekers, collectors of color, trappers of time itself. <laughs> and it's how we use that time that will define history. My name is Sarah Dichi, rhymes with peachy, and I am a YouTuber based in Dallas, Texas. So I'm always on the go. I need something fast enough to keep up with YouTube life. I am super excited for the Xperia Pro I. It is crazy to see the depth of field that you can get with it, and it is pretty insane that it's coming from a smartphone. Xperia has a brand new on-the-go solution called Videography Pro that combines all the features that a run-and-gun filmmaker like me needs. I can access different lenses, cine looks, and switch apertures between f2 and f4. I can trick it out with a ton of accessories, an external mic on top, a multifunctional grip where I can zoom in and out, and also a portable vlog monitor. This is really great because you can still use the rear cameras and I can still see myself. It's honestly crazy that I'm recording this on a phone because it looks like a movie. It, it looks so good and it has a video shortcut key where I can just pull it out of my pocket, press it, and I am off to the races. 
eye autofocus keeps lock on my eye. So I'm in focus whether I'm here or back here. And just like shooting with my Sony Alpha cameras, it has optical image stabilization. And that way I have assurance that my image is going to be steady. It's not going to be shaky. Shaky video footage is always very, very distracting. The Xperia Pro Eye is slim, it is water and dust resistant, and it is packed with a ton of features. Xperia shoots up to 120 frames per second, and I can also shoot 4K HDR, which is great for capturing beautiful colors for your video. One might think that being a YouTuber means that image is everything, which it is, yes, but audio is just as important. Xperia has added a third unidirectional microphone, and it almost has the effect like you're just there with the person. It also has a sound source separator that uses an intelligent wind filter. What that means is they figured out how to deal with the biggest sound killer in the field, wind and with Cinematography Pro. It also has Venice Color Science, which uh, they take from Sony's Cinema Line. So if you wanna go Hollywood, that is an option. Whether I'm in the studio or on the go, I always love to have a pro image, and that's where the Xperia Pro Eye comes in. And I think even my audience expects, you know, an elevated image from me. So it is really great to have that in a smartphone. The Xperia Pro Eye is just that. Photography in its essence is about emotion. Capturing that emotion takes more than a good eye. It takes having the right camera and the right moment. Sony took all the speed from the existing cameras, combined it with all the advanced technology from the Xperia line to create the Xperia Pro Eye. Street photography happens fast. The fleeting moments that create the best images are gone with a blink of an eye. Fast action, low light, wild contrast swings. This new Xperia can handle it all having a 1.0 type image sensor and dual aperture f2 and f4 lenses in the camera on my phone is a complete game changer. The bokeh, the low light capabilities, never in a million years did I think I would be able to create images that rival my mirrorless camera on my phone. With three different focal lengths, it's like having a full kit of lenses and Xperia's Photography Pro allows you to shoot in auto, manual, or any way in between, giving you full control over all its settings. It features real-time tracking and real-time IAF. It instantly locks onto your subject wherever it is. With built-in optical image stabilization, my handheld images are sharp. And its dedicated shutter button it has a feel-in function that I'm used to with my Sony cameras. Xperia Pro I has light and fast autofocus, covering 90% of the frame and it shoots in bursts of up to 20 frames per second. Xperia's high sensitivity sensor handles night scenes like a champ and with little noise and mind-blowing dynamic range. Its T-Star coated lenses practically eliminate reflection, flares, and ghosting. So whether I'm shooting into street lights or the sun, the image comes out perfect. As a professional, I always use a strap with my cameras and with the Xperia, same exact thing. Plus with a water-resistant body, I know it won't get damaged even as I carry it around the city. Because Xperia records in 12-bit RAW, it provides smooth and rich files to work with in post without any banding to worry about. And thanks to 5G capabilities, I can upload and share my images immediately. Or I can use Xperia's removable SD card for quick transfers and hot swaps up to a terabyte. Nothing captures the emotion of a moment like a perfect photo. And now with the Xperia Pro I, have the ability to capture that perfect moment at all times.
Prospering in this environment is challenging. When you give kids a voice and you give them access, greatness is sure to follow. This allows for more kids to be exposed to what their passion is going to be. We always say, you know, you can't be what you can't see. What we're creating for our community is growth. Think of the wildest and craziest things that you can do to change the world around you and then use this support to make it happen because you have a whole team behind you. At B&H, we're here to help folks find what they need. Give us an example there, Irving. It was NASA. NASA? What did they need? A unique hospital at Lens. We often have what others don't. For all your needs, big or small, check out bnh.com. This is a real B&H customer story about Fred Smith here, turning lemons to lemonade. Fred, tell us your story. I was a fitness instructor in Atlanta, and I transferred to New York, March 13, 2020, right as all the studios shut down. But with B&H's help, I started Workout with Fred. The challenge for a fitness instructor when they're streaming from home is you've got multiple sources of audio. I didn't know how complex that was, and that's where B&H came in. Whether I was on the chat or I called, anytime I had a question, they had a solution. I was like, ah, I wish I'd called you earlier. Thanks for sharing your B&H story with us, Fred. Visit us at bnh.com for expert advice on starting your next project. I take for granted all these moments sometimes. Oh, I don't need the stars to align. No matter what you always have my time. No matter what you always have my time.
fire that is within you is the same that is within us all. A spark traveling through the night. A torch burning in time. And it is how we use that time that will define our story. The creative mind can shape worlds out of thin air. Imagine the unimaginable. See beyond the impossible. We give meaning to life. And life gives us meaning back. It's not just about what we see. It's about the way we see. Together, we dream upstream into the headwinds. Against all odds. Come on! Seeing the world through a lens unlike any other. are the thought sparkers, the street dreamers, the wind hunters, the fire seekers, collectors of color, trappers of time itself. <laughs> and it's how we use that time that will define history. My name is Sarah Dichie, or rhymes with Peachy, and I am a YouTuber based in Dallas, Texas. So I'm always on the go. I need something fast enough to keep up with YouTube life.
I am super excited for the Xperia Pro I. It is crazy to see the depth of field that you can get with it and is pretty insane that it's coming from a smartphone. Xperia has a brand new on-the-go solution called Videography Pro that combines all the features that a run-and-gun filmmaker like me needs. I can access different lenses, cine looks, and switch apertures between f2 and f4. I can trick it out with a ton of accessories, an external mic on top, a multifunctional grip where I can zoom in and out, and also a portable vlog monitor. This is really great because you can still use the rear cameras and I can still see myself. It's honestly crazy that I'm recording this on a phone because it looks like a movie. It, it looks so good. And it has a video shortcut key where I can just pull it out of my pocket, press it, and I am off to the races. Eye autofocus keeps lock on my eye. So I'm in focus whether I'm here or back here. And just like shooting with my Sony Alpha cameras, it has optical image stabilization. And that way I have assurance that my image is going to be steady. It's not going to be shaky. Shaky video footage is always very, very distracting. The Xperia Pro I is slim, it is water and dust resistant, and it is packed with a ton of features. Xperia shoots up to 120 frames per second, and I can also shoot 4K HDR, which is great for capturing beautiful colors for your video. One might think that being a YouTuber means that image is everything, which it is, yes, but audio is just as important. Xperia has added a third unidirectional microphone, and it almost has the effect like you're just there with the person. It also has a sound source separator that uses an intelligent wind filter. What that means is they figured out how to deal with the biggest sound killer in the field, wind and with Cinematography Pro. It also has Venice Color Science, which uh, they take from Sony's Cinema Line. So if you wanna go Hollywood, that is an option. Whether I'm in the studio or on the go, I always love to have a pro image, and that's where the Xperia Pro Eye comes in. And I think even my audience expects, you know, an elevated image from me. So it is really great to have that in a smartphone. The Xperia Pro Eye is just that. Photography in its essence is about emotion. Capturing that emotion takes more than a good eye. It takes having the right camera and the right moment. Sony took all the speed from the existing cameras, combined it with all the advanced technology from the Xperia line to create the Xperia Pro Eye. Street photography happens fast. The fleeting moments that create the best images are gone with a blink of an eye. Fast action, low light, wild contrast swings. This new Xperia can handle it all having a 1.0 type image sensor and dual aperture f2 and f4 lenses in the camera on my phone is a complete game changer. The bokeh, the low light capabilities, never in a million years did I think I would be able to create images that rival my mirrorless camera on my phone. With three different focal lengths, it's like having a full kit of lenses and Xperia's Photography Pro allows you to shoot in auto, manual, or any way in between, giving you full control over all its settings. It features real-time tracking and real-time IAF. It instantly locks onto your subject wherever it is. With built-in optical image stabilization, my handheld images are sharp. And its dedicated shutter button, it has a feel-in function that I'm used to with my Sony cameras. Xperia Pro I has light and fast autofocus, covering 90% of the frame and it shoots in bursts of up to 20 frames per second. Xperia's high sensitivity sensor handles night scenes like a champ and with little noise and mind-blowing dynamic range. Its T-star coated lenses practically eliminate reflection, flares, and ghosting. So whether I'm shooting into street lights or the sun, the image comes out perfect. As a professional, I always use a strap with my cameras and with the Xperia, same exact thing. Plus with a water-resistant body, I know it won't get damaged even as I carry it around the city. Because Xperia records in 12-bit RAW, it provides smooth and rich files to work with in post without any banding to worry about. And thanks to 5G capabilities, I can upload and share my images immediately. Or I can use Xperia's removable SD card for quick transfers and hot swaps up to a terabyte. Nothing captures the emotion of a moment like a perfect photo. And now with the Xperia Pro I, I have the ability to capture that perfect moment at all times.
Prospering in this environment is challenging. When you give kids a voice and you give them access, greatness is sure to follow. Welcome back everyone to the Sony Creative Space Portfolio Review Sessions. I am Brooke Shaden. I'm a fine art conceptual photographer and I'm joined by Mahesh Thapa and he is a landscape, nature, many other things, super <laughs> passionate photographer. And I think it makes for quite a nice balance during these portfolio reviews, which we are going to jump into right now. Um, we are starting with Marina. And I'm really excited about this portfolio because there's a lot of diversity in it. So let's go ahead and look at that first image and see what we can see. Um, with Marina, um, I want to I want to share specifically um, a little bit about the stories that you're telling and the ways that you set it up, because I think that you go about your portfolio in two very specific ways. So for this first image, um, it's really direct. And I think actually thus far in the reviews, we haven't really seen anything that's super direct like this. And it's refreshing in a sense. I think that it's really um, a very modern and interesting way of storytelling is to go about it where this person is dressed in a way that matches the environment, it's casual, it's relaxed. So from that point of view, I actually find it quite entrancing to look at this image. From a more technical perspective, though, I want to start to look at how we can make this even more engaging. So what kind of um, feeling are you trying to elicit and how can we do that in a way that's more engaging with the surroundings? So it looks very casual. We've got these gloves, this puffy jacket. She's smiling. And I even like the lighting in this, this sort of noon kind of direct sunlight. But aside from that, I would question where could we put her that would be more engaging for the story, more engaging for the background um, and the foreground. And so my, my only question and critique here is how could we do this in a way that's just slightly more engaging for the environment? Yeah, I completely agree, Brooke. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. It's it's technically a good picture, you know. It's 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 well exposed. Uh, the model looks great. Uh, the environment is awesome, uh, but it's it's a snapshot, in my opinion. It's a snapshot of somebody sitting on a bench, and uh, uh, I don't know what. There's no story behind it that I can tell, uh, and uh, you know, I, I it's uh, it's 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 a it's a lovely model, uh, uh, you know, sitting down posing for an image in a winter scenario, and things sort of sort of sort of just sort of stay there. And I also want to see a little bit more uh, creative, if you will, in the posing maybe, or uh, maybe even a little lighting or, or composition. Uh, I think it would just, everything else is there. You know, I think you've got the technicalities down just perfectly. And I think uh, the other images in the portfolio uh, uh, are, are much more telling, I think, of the talent you have. Uh, this to me is just like a snapshot. I agree. So the next image is pretty interesting then in that regard. What do you think? Oh yeah. I love the shot. I love, you know, I love everything, anything with kids, you know, kids and puppies, you know, you got me, <laughs> uh, you know, but what's great about this is, is 
is the snow uh, <clears throat> and, and the chef's hat uh, and, and, and the checkered appearance and just that that just that gorgeous expression on her face and even the way you've composed it with all that empty space on the left the eyes closed that 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 feeling of glee happy you know i i remember i talked to my son the other day and you know there's, there's snowing here and he said oh great snow day you know no school and, and that's that's when i knew i'd become an adult and lost my sort of uh child <laughs> child likeness like oh my oh great snow how am i gonna get to work <laughs> so this is sort of the feeling i get when i see this is like hey you know, this kid is happy that it's snowing. <laughs> I may not have been. And I actually thought this was flour and not snow. Oh, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> Maybe it is flour. Yeah, well, it makes more uh, sense with the bakery <laughs> theme. But to piggyback off of what you were saying, it does look like snow. When I first saw it, I thought it was snow and then I looked closer. And the benefit of doing something like this is that it evokes a sense of the holidays, a, a time of the year. And I think that when you create an image like this, you're creating a feeling. It's not, it's not just a person in a place. It's a sense of some emotion that comes up. So I think that whether you see snow or baking or this little girl just enjoying this moment, you're immediately transported to another place when you felt that same emotion. And that's the magic of this image. I think everything about this is utterly fantastic. Like I, I could imagine seeing this as, you know, a billboard advertising something for Christmas totally. or, you know, it would just, it just works on so many levels from the composition to the lighting, to the way the negative space. I mean, it's really beautiful and I have no faults with this image. I love it. So let's move on to the next one. And this one has that exact same feeling for me. I look at this picture and I feel such a sense of nostalgia. The black and white works beautifully here. I think the lighting on the face, that almost glow coming around the side is really well done. And then look at the way he's dressed, this hat and the paintbrushes and the suspenders. And <laughs> when I look at this image, I've looked at this probably six times by now today. And this is the first time that I even thought like, oh, what's in the background? Like it never even occurred to me because it doesn't really matter what's back there. It's about the lighting, the costuming and this expression, which, you know, all of those things individually are important. But when it's put together like this, where the light is coming from behind, the outfit is the way that it is, the expression, it gives me such a sense of like I'm looking back in time at something. And I think it's really beautiful. No, totally. I, I... When I first saw this, <clears throat> I was reminded of those uh, pictures that they had. It used to be very popular where just a certain part of the image was colored and everything else was black and white. I think it would work great that way too, but it's, it's, it's wonderful as, as a complete black and white. And you know, <clears throat> like you said, it's, it's everything. It's the expression, it's the clothing, it's the way he's holding the brush with uh, one hand and the, uh, and, the, and the rest of the uh, handles with the other, the suspenders, the pan, you know, it just, it just works in so many ways. And I, I just love this image. And I, I mean, you're right, Brooke. I, I kept on coming back to the shot and I said, man, that, that is so good. It is. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> here's, I, I like the um, sort of the family atmosphere. I get the feeling that this is a family that has spanned multiple generations. Uh, maybe father, grandfather, mom, kids, or whatever, uh, and it and it has that sort of uh, portrait, family portrait appearance without actually being stuffy and formal. It's a lot more casual in appearance, uh, and I I wish that maybe a little tighter composition on this. Uh, I like actually the way this has been processed. The toning is just beautiful. I think the skin tones look great, uh, and it has a little bit of that artistic contrast to it, the micro contrast, and the blacks are just perfect as far as the toning goes. Uh, and I like this actually a lot more than the very first image where, where that felt like a snapshot. Uh, this feels like you just happened to catch a moment. Even if it was posed, it doesn't feel that way. Uh, again, I'll just crop in a little bit more uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, just, uh, and just highlight the people a little, but I think it's a great shot of a, maybe a multi-generation family. 
Yeah, I agree. I think it's a really beautiful image. And and I think I, I, I am not someone who takes family portraits, so I can't speak to the difficulty of it. But I can imagine having what looks like teenagers in a picture is difficult to try to get them to cooperate and do what you want them to do. So I think this is a great approach to that. And something that really stood out was I, I keep going back to the boy on the right hand side and how he's standing on the, the railing and kind of looking at the father figure sort of like, you know, putting himself up on that level. And I think that's a really sweet detail of this image. Um, you know, I would probably say go even more casual with it or even more formal with it um, just as a personal preference so that because it does look a bit posed yet like the guy in the middle looks like he's not really into it. <laughs> you know, he's like, well, <laughs> you know, I'm just I'm doing this to please somebody. So um, so I would go even more casual or the other way, but I, I still think it's a great shot. And so let's go into the last image then. And um, looking at this picture, it's it's such an it's such a beautiful photo. I just smile every time I see this picture. And I think that a lot of it comes down to the the expression here. And I think about people who buy portraits of their family and they're not going to look at the lighting and like what time of day it was, even though we might look at this and say, oh, it was shot at noon. Like, what if this was shot in the evening and the sun was backlighting them? That would be so beautiful. Yeah. Instead, they're going to look at that girl's face and say, well, obviously, I'm going to buy this picture as large as I could possibly have it because look at her expression. And so I think that's really what should be focused on here is the fact that you, you've managed to capture this moment. And I think it's just such a beautiful moment. I completely I feel like I've seen this all the time, but I completely agree with what, what Brooke is saying. Uh, and, you know, I even love the composition. It's a centered composition, but everything works so well here because I think the leading lines of the flowers that are flanking the, the people really lead your eyes directly uh, back towards the, I'm thinking the parents back there. And whether you cropped this the way this is or you cropped it vertically uh, and you excluded much of the left and right, I think it works in so many ways. And, and like Brooke was saying, it's at this point, it's not about the lighting. It's not about uh, less or more depth of field. It's about the happy child running towards the camera, getting, I mean, she's awfully close to the lens right now. So, and I, and I think kids do so much more, so much better than adults when they're very, very close to the camera because they're so darn cute and their expressions are so joyous. It's, and I think white angle does a really good job of capturing that. And that's really accentuated when they're very close to the lens, uh, like this little little girl is. So just, I, I really like this. So just a great, great shot of the family. I can't stop smiling at it. <laughs> so uh, I guess we'll move on to uh, Javi Garcia portfolio review. And and I think this is just, this is great. I mean, I, I just, this is my type of photography as far as the type of stuff I like to shoot. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's landscape, but it's intimate landscape in the sense that, you know, a lot of the shots are not broad sweeping, but, uh, more zoomed in less depth of field, uh, more about shapes, uh, and textures and colors, but still having that sense, uh, of, of great lighting, that sense of composition. You know, I love how on this one, the little wave, the microwave, mini wave, whatever you want, is pointing right to the setting sun or rising sun, what have you, how the light is hitting the curve. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's like, it's just so smooth. Everything just flows, you know, with, with, uh, with great composition and great lighting. So I really don't have very much to nitpick about this. You know, even the shallow depth of field, it's, it's a minimalistic image that doesn't feel too minimal or too simple. I guess that's the best thing I can say about this. I completely agree. I'm looking at this like I can't believe that wave is touching the sun just exactly how it is. And it looks like it's just giving it a kiss kind of. And it feels so intimate, again, so smooth. Um, we've got a six month old and Moana is on every day. It totally reminds me of Moana. <laughs> <laughs> intimate, um, just beautiful little moment. And, and I think it's also expertly done. I think any other choice in terms of angle, um, shutter speed, things like that would have been probably not that a choice could be wrong in this regard, but it wouldn't have been impact as impactful, I think. So this was really brilliant. Yeah. And I know this is intentional because look at that beautiful horizon. It's lovely straight. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <clears throat> Okay. Now this is, I, I am so drawn to images like this one. And the reason is because 
I love a good landscape. I could look at them all day long. And yet I'm really drawn to people. And so often I look at a landscape and I think, oh, what if we could just put a person in there? Like, that would be so cool. And here we've done that. And so I'm very drawn to this because it gives a sense of scale. And the way that this person is standing is almost like they're trying to kind of balance on this rock that they're standing on. And we all know this feeling of overlooking this massive expanse uh, when you're standing at an ocean or a mountain range or whatever it may be. So I think that a lot is working here because it gives me a sense of, I know this vast feeling, but then elevated because we've got the super smooth sunset colors that are just wisping over the mountains and flowing into the color of the ocean. So it's a calming, epic feeling. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, I think this <clears throat> is all about the light for me. I love that glow in the sky. I love how a lot of the light is being reflected on the distant landscape. On the on the white shore, the curves, the the, the rolling hills, um, and and even the 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 highlights are just at the border of being overdone, but not quite. So it's just perfect, you know. If there's one thing I would change about this, and this is again nitpicking criticism, just because I have to say something, I can't be satisfied with <laughs> with an image. Uh, is I would place that person a little bit more towards the left. I don't think the left side of the image is contributing very much. Uh, I think I want to see more of that color in the sky on the right. I feel like there's an abrupt cutoff of that very bright area in the sky. And, I want, and I'm wondering how much, how much does it go on to the right-hand side? How much brighter is it? What's, what's over there? I'm not as, so, not as interested in what's happening on the left-hand side. So I would probably crop about a third of the way from the left uh, and, and see how that looks as far as compositionally. Again, personal taste, that's how I feel about this. Okay, this is this is great. Uh, I remember looking at this and saying, "Oh man, I need to go swimming," <laughs> even though I I I I would never look this good in a in a swimsuit. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I whether it's real or it's artificial, uh, but those lights coming from the top are just spectacular. Like you know, when I think of an underwater shot, when I want epic lighting and I want that feeling of God, I really want to be there. This is what I'm thinking of. And I love the difference in the patterns and textures on the top half of the image versus the bottom. I love that floor of the water, the ocean. You know, it's sort of a corrugated uh, appearance. It sort of fades off into the, into the mid-ground water. And from there, it's another gradient of texture as you go towards the sky and towards the water where you've got these light rays and a little bit of, you can see the little hint of texture on the surface of the water and how that swimmers just reaching up, you know, from uh, from where she is uh, up into the, almost like to the heavens, if you will, uh, if heaven was just above the water. So I think this is a wonderfully done shot. And and just like Mahesh said, the, the, the word that comes to mind is texture throughout your entire portfolio, from that wave to the sky in the last picture to the, the sunbeams coming in. It's really impressive to me, the attention to the texture in each image, which really lends itself to a particular emotion, a particular feeling. Here we've got these really dreamy rays coming down. It feels like tendrils of light. In the other one, it was almost like a watercolor painting. And in the wave, it, it felt so dreamy and creamy and just so beautiful. So I think texture is what, in my opinion, sort of connects each of these images together, though each are quite different in their own right. Um, everything about this it says, you know, it's inviting, it's beautiful, it's ethereal. And I don't really even know how to critique something like this because we've got really beautiful lines from the lines of the light to the line of the person throughout the sand. The composition's beautiful. And I do feel like there's, it's been touched by, you know, this very particular heavenly light that is so hard to capture sometimes. Yeah. I love that description that you gave tendrils of light. I'm going to, I'm going to steal that one day. <laughs> oh, what a gorgeous image. Yeah. Um, you know, this is, this is another example, um, just like before, where there's this sense of epicness because of there, there being a person in this landscape, it, it, especially the flow of the fabric 
that we have here where it, it feels like the wind has just come through and just brushed past her. And that's is sort of exacerbated by the fact that there are clouds in the sky. It feels very wispy um, and, and very epic. The greens in contrast to the purple, I think that's a really interesting choice. Um, the only thing that bothers me in this picture is I wish that the line of the clouds were straight at the top and in the middle. And that's not something that you can obviously control in camera, but it's something that if you're willing to do a little post, I would probably straighten it out a little bit because then it would just be such a, you know, so grid-like almost, but in a really satisfying way. But I think this is so beautiful. I'd love to have it on my wall. Yeah, I, this is, this is, fan. you know, I'm always talking about don't center the image, but this is the one where I don't mind it because I think the right side of the image is just as interesting as the left side of the image. And I think that person uh, is placed just beautifully. And I like the fact that uh, whether this was by accident or you did this intentionally, that the top of the head doesn't encroach upon the, the, the crater of, of that, of that mountain or volcano or whatever that is. And it's just perfectly, I mean, any, any higher and you would lose that that head. You would lose it in that blackness of that crater. But I saw it's perfectly positioned just right. And um, as far as the clouds go, uh, to me, it may be an optical illusion, but that's, you know, that's the whole point is that we can't tell. And I think you're right. If that was a little straighter, whether post-processing or doing it in camera, um, it would just make it just that much better. But you know what, even if not, like Brooke was saying, this is an image that I'd be I'd be proud to have hanging on my wall. Just just awesome. This is so cute. <clears throat> you know, I you know, I'm not much of a macro and and but this is like a sea macro, you know, and and I have seen some wonderful pictures in the uh, about the sea. And and I love what's done here. I love the fact that you can see a lot of the environment that that little fish is in. Um uh, and I think it could be a little bit more powerful if you were able to, if you were able, it may not have been possible if you could get even a little tighter into this, because I don't think we need all of that environment to let us know what exactly we're looking at. Uh, and I think if you were able to tone down those very, very bright dots on the left-hand side, whether that's from the flash uh, or underwater lighting, I'm not sure, but I think this has a chance with 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 a little bit of cropping or a little bit of magnification to be that much more powerful because I really like how the scale is captured here. Um, uh, yeah, I I agree with that because with this image, I either want to be very close to that fish or. Um, my personal preference would even be to pull out further so that the blue of the ocean is surrounding this, uh, whatever this is called, <laughs> this yeah, on three sides so that we can really get that symmetry of the blue surrounding it and we get a sense of this singular organism in this space, um, that or moving into the fish. But I really like how the environment feels tilted, but, and the fish is sort of perpendicular to it. I find that very interesting. Um, for me, it's the, it's the least engaging of all the images that we've seen so far, but that said, I still think it's a very strong image. Perfect. Okay. So now we're going to take a look at Catherine. And um, so Catherine has an interesting portfolio because it's really varied. And this is going to give us a chance to talk about a lot of different things. We start with this image here. And the first thing that I appreciate is how painterly this image is. And I think that the way that the leaves are photographed all out of focus, the way that they sort of blend, the colors blend right into one another. I think that's really well done. I think this was a, a, a space that was well chosen, especially coordinating the the outfit of the subject with the fall leaves. That said, I think that it's a little bit bright for me in terms of the outfit that the person is wearing. If it really matched, if the color tone were brought down into that autumn tone, I think that would make it an even stronger image because I do love the composition. I love the flow. I love the painterly feeling. I just want a little bit more color cohesion and it's almost there because all those details were thought of. Yeah, no. I think I think you're so correct, Brooke. Uh, I I really like the feeling behind this, but I think if that Gaussian blur filter or whatever that's been applied to the background where it gives it that that glowy, uh, you could you could maybe um, 
darken the highlights, maybe uh, uh, you know, brush away some of the some of the bright areas. I think the brightness takes attention away, if you will, from this this beautiful lady, uh, uh, you know, who's about to experience an amazing new chapter in her life. Uh, and I like the colors, but as you mentioned, Brooke, it's a, just a little too bright and a little too glowy uh, for my taste. I think if it's glowy, it's fine, but it needs to be a little bit dark, a little bit more tamed. Uh, so yeah, I, and I, but I like the composition. I like how you've given more room towards the left than towards the right, how she's not centered, how she's looking down. I love her positioning. Uh, but yeah, I think you're right, Brooke. The brightness is a little, little much. Okay, I, I love a, is it my turn? <laughs> I forget. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I, I love nightscapes. I love, I love Milky Way, uh, and I love uh, being out there at night, and this I get the feeling of that here. But I think to do a really good Milky Way shot is hard because there's a lot of technicalities that have to go right. Uh, you have to make sure you're using the right lens. The aperture is nice and wide. You try to keep your ISO down to a minimum. You may even have to stack images uh, at higher ISOs just so you can get the noise down. And I think technically this image suffers a little bit from noise. There's a little bit too much color noise, particularly noticeable in the horizon where the bright changes into the darkness. That bothers me a little bit because I know that with the with 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 a little bit of technical know-how that can be completely eradicated. And I would like that upper part of the sky to be just a tad brighter and maybe the horizon to be tad uh, less bright, so the transition isn't so abrupt. Um, and I don't get the feeling that there's, besides the Milky Way, there's any other subject matter. What makes a great astrophotography is the context of the Milky Way around something else, maybe an arch or maybe a, a bed of wildflowers or a mountain in the background, something like that. I mean, that being said, I think if your purpose was just was to capture the Milky Way, and because you've never done it before, because it looks great, this is this is good. I think I think you can only get better from here. Uh, so keep trying. I agree with everything. So let's move on to the next image very quickly here. And just taking a quick look at this, I think that this shows more technical know-how in this image in terms of thinking about composition, lighting, and really creating engaging contrast in the structure of the building here, which I find really interesting for an image like this. Um, it's something that everybody wants this shot and not many people get this shot. And so I think that that makes this especially intriguing to me because I've been there, I've tried, I didn't do it, <laughs> you know? And so it's a, I, I think that it's really an engaging image. No, I agree. And I, and I like the composition. I like the fact that you've excluded some of that uh, Eiffel Tower on the left-hand side. And I love how the light rays just emanate from, from those beautiful clouds. And you can see the light rays at the top. It almost like it's a, uh, inverse of the Eiffel Tower itself as the light rays sort of go like this while the Eiffel Tower, Tower comes like this at the at the corner. So great composition, great use of black and white. I like it. Okay, so again, we this is, to me, it's it's a picture of some flowing water. Uh, and I don't, and I, and I wanna, and I wanna like it, uh, but I think either make it, a shorter exposure or a longer exposure. This is sort of the in-between exposure where the water to me is not as interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, and the composition is a little bit more centered than I would like. Uh, you know, if you really want to focus on the water, maybe I'd crop the top down a little bit. I think technically it's a good shot, uh, but I would either slow it down or, or speed it up as far as the shutter goes. And, you know, for me with this image, what I actually want to see is darker or brighter. So, like, I want this to either be a happy, bright, beautiful shot or a really dark, mysterious shot of the woods. So I would love to see this just a lot darker and more mysterious to give it a little bit more atmosphere. But I personally love this image because I would love to be there right now. And it gives me that sense of home. Okay, and then the final image here, we have um, something quite different from the rest of the portfolio, which is why I find this an interesting portfolio. Technically, I think it's hard to find any fault here because it's lit beautifully, the contrast is lovely, the crispness of the water is there, I'm intrigued by the black backdrop. I just think as a subject, 
I preferred the other images because I would, they're just subjects that I would personally rather see. I think this feels more like an experiment than something really worthy of its own shot. However, in the food photography realm, that's a whole different conversation that I'm not really qualified to have, but I think it does work on that level. Yep. Exactly what you said, Brooke. I think this, this was part of another portfolio that included food or product photography or interesting lighting and flash photography, this would be great. Uh, still technically a great shot, but a little out of place in this portfolio. Agreed. Yeah. Um, awesome. So I think that brings us to the end. Um, and that means that we are going to see you again soon for another final portfolio review session. And thank you so much for watching. Yeah, see you next time, guys.
Hi, everybody. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Uh, we are here today with Gonzalo Amat, ASC, a director NDP who recently uh, shot a new project on the new Venice 2. So Gonzalo just came off of directing some episodes of SEAL Team, but is probably best known for his work as a cinematographer on Man in the High Castle and Outer Banks season two. So Gonzalo, first, hi, it's great to see you. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good to see you again. Great. Um, congratulations on being accepted into the ASC as well. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an honor to be be part of the society when, you know, I dreamt, dreamt about it when I was growing up. So it's, it's an honor. That's very exciting. Super exciting. But so you've had a busy year. Um, you started out shooting and releasing Netflix's popular series, Outer Banks, and then filming Under the Banner of Heaven, created by Academy Award winner Dustin Lance Black, before you stopped out here in L.A. to direct a few episodes of CBS's SEAL Team. Uh, right now, you're also working on and directing a Belasco Aran, a period limited series for Netflix in Mexico. I, I, and um, so tell us, which do you prefer? Do you prefer shooting or do you prefer directing? I, to be honest, I like both. Like, you know, depends on the project. I really like uh, being able to, when you're shooting something then collaborating with someone's uh, image, like in, in the case of uh, the pilot, like Under the Banner of Heaven, you know, someone has been working with this project for 10 years, then it's nice to be able to shoot it for them, you know, because it, then you can try to get your vision through and then make it uh, sort of make it with them, you know. But directing is also great. Like directing is, um, it's in a way like using everything that you've learned as a cinematographer and then being able to add other things like, you know, acting and, and things that have, uh, that I wasn't too familiar with. So, and I like, I like the challenge. So I'm always uh, looking for different things. Uh, so I would say both, I still like to shoot stuff and I, I love directing. So I try to combine both as much as possible, which is what I did on this piece that I ended up doing for, um, for the Venice too. Super cool. Um, so, Let's start with Outer Banks first. So Outer Banks is known for its beautiful cinematography um, and actually its beautiful skin tones and, and for shooting at the golden hour. I mean, it's really, it's a beautiful show. It looks amazing. So can you tell us, before we get into some photos, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to shoot the show? Yeah, I mean, the show is, is really great. Like it, it's, uh, it's a really nice team of people behind and in front of the camera. And then it does feel like you're doing a small project, even though it's not a small project. Uh, and it has that quality of uh, being able to improvise a lot. And there's a lot of uh, improvising in the actors. There's a lot of improvising in our side too, behind the camera. But at the same time, you still have to make the day. You still have to make the, what you had planned for. And especially when everything that you get on the scripts is always like a magic hour, you know, sunset, sunrise. There's no like middle of the day. So what we end up doing is to really plan so we can have the best light in the best location. And then when the light's not good, then we, you know, either do either driving stuff or we go inside for, for long dialogue scenes or we go on the stage. But then we always try to use the best light to be able to shoot the, the most powerful scenes. And that way you get, you, you do get those beautiful skin tones and then you get um, the sense of uh, the eternal sunset, which is uh, kind of a benchmark of this show. You know, it's um, the signature of the show. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. One thing I want to say really quickly to everybody watching, we have a chat, and if you any questions that come up, put them in the chat, and we'll try to get to them. This is a conversation, so we want everybody to feel involved. Um, so, Gonzalo, that's really interesting. Let's start showing some of the photos from that we have for Outer Banks, and if, if there are any that you find that you want to stop and describe a little bit more in detail, let's do that. But Yeah, the show I can talk about this such, first one if you want <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go that, back to the first one, guys. Yeah, the first one. Just because it's such a, a iconic Outer Banks moment when it comes to conditions and that we, which we, the ones that we shoot, which is, you know, you shoot in a real location, you shoot in a real swamp, then you put the car inside, and then you just have the cameras, and then you have no time or no space or no even no power to be able to do lighting there. So you have to pick the right time of day. You have to pick the pick the right angle to, so you have the sun in the right spot. And then uh, at the same time, you still have to make the storytelling work, you know, all the, with all the time and, um, and the dialogue and everything that works on each scene, you know? So 
but yeah, I just wanted because that's such an iconic picture of uh, typical conditions of shooting of Outer Banks. So let's very quickly, before we scroll forward with the photos, was Outer Banks your first experience with the original Venice camera? And what was your impression of that camera? Yeah, yeah, that was the first time I used uh, the Venice camera. Uh, my impression, you know, I, I really like it. Uh, I think it's a camera that's kind of perfect for this type of shooting. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's very versatile when it comes to, to um, the dual ISO that, that you have um, a possibility of changing the ASA and then also the internal filters. And there's a bunch of things that really made it a, a, good, um, a good piece for this, uh, a, a piece of equipment for this show. So let's, why don't we keep going with the photos? And um, so very interesting because you're shooting at a lot at the golden hour, I would imagine you're really taking advantage of the built-in NDs to be able to, you know, extend your day and, 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 and adapt very quickly to the changing lighting conditions. Yeah, I mean, one of the advantages that I find on this uh, camera is that you don't need to put any filters in front if you, in terms of um, ND filters. And sometimes you're dealing with uh, the changing light, if it's clouds or if it's a magic hour and you're losing the light slowly. So you can really play with it. You can do, you can uh, basically have the ASA at the level that you want it, that you know you're going to end up. And then just with the NDs, you can start dropping uh, like stop by stop which is the, not something that other cameras have. And then sometimes you just want one stop, but you don't want like two stops like other cameras do. So I do think that's a, a huge thing for this particular show because there's really no time or sometimes not even if you're in a boat in the middle of nowhere, you can't just have like, okay, I'm going to bring all the filters now and I'm going to have to take a filter when the water is moving and then try to put the filter in the camera. So it's just a lot faster, just push a button and then you, you got what the sort of the, the stuff that you wanted, you know, without, yeah, you know, without yeah, you're making, it's much more efficient to make your day and to get your shots. And you could even probably get more shots in more takes in because you're saving time with not having to change NDs, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the case. Um, and so what lenses did you use on that show? Just while we've got you for that. Yeah. So the, the, the show was shot with the Panavision, um, Panavision Primo lenses. So, which are a little older and then they they have this thing that they do which is they uh, they it's called detuned so it's a detuned panavision primos and then primo zooms we shoot like 90 percent of the show on the on the zooms just because it's also faster and then it's just faster to be able to readjust and then you, a lot of the things that the director of, of the show jonas uh, likes to do is sometimes he really wants to almost edit in camera so you if you're shooting a face and sometimes you want to go down to a hand and you want to do a little, it's a little wide, maybe you adjust a little bit on the lens. Not necessarily that you'll use the adjustment of the zoom, but it's just a way to flow. The, um, and then you have the actors kind of flowing without having to, okay, I'm going to change the lens, you know. So that's that's one of the uh, styles of the show to try to capture the, and edit in, in camera and uh, visually telling the story that you want to tell. Um, so, and then they tuned, they have a several sort of recipes of the tuned. And then, you know, in season one, it was picked a certain recipe, which they never really tell you in Panavision what they do to the lenses, but it's basically probably just removing coatings or internal elements to soften. The idea is to just make them feel older and more analog. In that case, getting easier to flare and just gentler on the skin and, and things like that. We're going to come back to that idea of editing in camera because I remember in New York you were doing so much of that. So that we're going to come back around to that. Sure. Um, so tell us actually a little bit about the challenges. You know, you were shooting multiple cameras, golden hour. What were what was that like? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, the the show is shot typically with two cameras. This season uh, two was shot probably half with three cameras because we had a lot of action and we had a lot of uh, dialogue to get through and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of characters too, because we have our main cast is, is big, you know? So at the same time, you have to shoot the relationship between the actors. What, when you someone's talking to someone, you have to capture the reaction, but sometimes important also to capture someone else's reaction if that character is still in the frame. And instead of trying to do like, you know, we're going to do shots of each one, like it's uh, sometimes common in TV, you have like three cameras sort of doing different things. And then you kind of vary the, like if you start on chase and you go to Maddie, the second take, you do the opposite. And then the other camera kind of does something different. So you have different angles with different variations. And it does give it a very realistic sense, a very sort of documentary style look 
Um, but the challenge is that you have to be aware that there's another camera there, that you have to light for three cameras if you're lighting an exterior night or interior day. Um, if you're outside, it's if you're shooting in the right time of day, then it's, it's perfect because then you have the soft light. But at the same time, if it's not the right time of day, then it's really tricky because you have to be sort of pointing everyone in the same direction and then cheat the actors in a certain way. It's very challenging. I know it's very also very challenging for sound. Uh, it's challenging for the actors too because sometimes you don't know in which frame you are. So it is, it is an interesting style um, and it, it is challenging. But at the same time, I do think the result really works. Uh, in an emotional level, like people really connect with the actors and really feel like they're watching something that's real, you know? Yeah. I mean, what, so for that kind of the feel of that show and, 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 you know, I want to get into very quickly uh, your experiences color grading when you were doing that. But before we even get into that, um, just lighting, the lighting, did you have like go-to lighting that you were using for, to get that look that you wanted for Outer Banks? It was just, you know, it's so natural. It's so warm. It's so clean. What were you doing? Yeah. I mean, most of the exteriors, we don't do any lighting, like not at all. Like you know, sometimes not even like a small bounce or anything because, you know, you get this, the camera is so sensitive that you put a white bounce and it's just going to be so obvious on the actor's faces. So sometimes what I personally do, sometimes I'll just underexpose a little bit so I can expose for the sky, for example, because I want detail in the sky. And then I know that I can, that the face might be a little darker, but I know I can bring it back when I do the color grade. And then even if it's a little dark, it's still the way that the eye sees, you know, if you have, if you're outside and someone's in shade, which is most the case that we do, his face is not going to look perfectly bright. It's going to look a little darker. And I think that's sort of the logic of my shooting for exteriors. And then when we're doing interior or exterior nights, it basically you have to light the space. So you think about, okay, maybe you find one background that you know you're going to sort of master from your good background in, in the case of day it's always where the sun is you shoot towards the sun in the case of night well you find the best background that tells the story if it's a street or if it's a building and then from there you 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 kind of start building your lighting but also to know that you're going to be turning around everywhere uh so we use a lot of led lighting a lot of like sky panels a lot of um, um led maxi brutes um uh, astera tubes titans stuff like that because we do want to be able to change the color at any point. And then I, I think there's no, there's no regular color, at least when I'm shooting the show, everything is different. Like the camera's never at the normal color, like we did on the Venice 2, same thing. Um, the lighting is never the right color. It's always never like 3,200, never 6,500 or 5,600. It's always like 47 here, the lights at 6,000. So I really like to play with color because I think that's the way that the eye sees, you know, your eye, and then that's sort of also trying to do a little bit of um, to give it a vintage look. Like if you were shooting on film and you would shoot fluorescence, it would look green. If you're shooting a sodium, it would look very warm and then not try to correct for it. So that's sort of uh, sort of my approach to, to lighting, you know, in this show. Right, 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 right. Um, so let's just take this a little further then. Um, how did you help evolve the look of the show during season two? Yeah, so, you know, season, the look was established on season one. And then, uh, you know, we had conversations on season two when I when I joined the show about how to, Jonas, uh, show, the showrunner creator, uh, wanted to be, to make it a little edgier than the first time. And then, you know, when you have a first season, everyone knows the actors. So season two is like, let's go a little edgier. The stakes are higher on, on the story. So why not try to make, you know, play a lot of with silhouettes, play sometimes a lot when you can't really see the actor's face which is uh, not something that's very common to do when you're doing a, a TV show. I mean, more and more people are uh, a little braver when it comes to, to lighting, but at the same time, I do think that in this show, we, we try to just be a little edgier, you know, and try to make a little, mm -hmm. uh, and then same thing, lighting, try to light it um, more natural and then try to just make the story work with the, the mood. So I would say it's a little moodier, and then how did I achieve this? Well, you know, you talk to the, to my equipment, to my crew, and then you try to, every time that you go to a location, you, you say, okay, let's make it moody by doing this or color, or let's play with this, or let's light it more like silhouette, or let's expose for this, let's let them go dark, it's stuff like that, you know? So it's a whole uh, conversation, depending on the scene also, um, on each scene. So it's, it's interesting, that's cool. It's interesting that you said that, uh you know, you were under exposing a little bit for the sky. 
And mm -hmm. so how did that, I mean, it says a lot that you were able to underexpose and everything still looks so clean. So how was that going into grading? How did that affect skin tones and, and how, you know, that the skin tones are still so clean, even when you're underexposing. So tell me a little bit about all that. Yeah. So, well, well you need, uh, that's one of the things that you, you get when you get the sort of the, um, a good sensor is that when you do an underexpose, you don't necessarily get green when you bring it back up, back up you know, and uh, that's a, a very common thing for, uh, for some other sensors. Um, when you do underexpose, then you'll get sort of, and you bring it back in post, you'll get the gain, which is kind of a, a noisy, and then you'll get noisy face, the phases are noisy, uh, blacks and stuff like that. On this case, we didn't. And uh, the latitude of the camera also helps a lot because when you are sometimes not intentionally, but you also maybe shot something and the cloud came by and you didn't have time to adjust either the iris or the, the IS, IS of the camera then you were able to go back and say, I want to see the raw and then get from the raw, try to build up the same look that you had on the other angles. And then what do you have the, the sensor with the, uh, with the, ben, the case of the Venice, then you have the latitude to be able to adjust um, and achieve what you wanted without getting any weird grain or anything like that. And the cleanliness, because for me, everything's about just making the actors look good and, and real. And if anything gets in the way, if you have grain that gets in the way, then it's, for me, it's like, I prefer to not get it in the way of the storytelling. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So you're in the grading suite. Um, I'm assuming they're on either Resolve or Baselight or something like that. Um, how are you finding, you know, the files to work with, the latitude um, and, you know, the color, how you're able to move the files and get them where you want? Yeah, I mean, really, really good because, uh, because uh, we do underexpose a lot especially in the night exterior, sometimes you're shooting on the zoom lenses and you have no, when we're shooting in Barbados, we didn't have a lot of resources to be lighting those night exteriors. So sometimes you just sort of go with it and you know, okay, I'll go like 2,500 ASA, I'll go wide open and then we'll see what happens. And you know that you'll get, you'll be able to pull it, pull it up quite a bit, you know, or you look at the run and you realize that you have a lot in the, in the range. The same thing if you're inside and then you're shooting a, um, a face, with no lighting and you have a window that's blown out, you know that you can bring back the blown out quite a bit because the, the sensor has a really good latitude. So I think it's a show that, and then a lot of times we do end up shooting, like we were shooting in the winter in, in South Carolina with the sun is low, but the light is not really warm. So we had to play with um, in, the, in the color at the end to try to warm it up and make it feel like summer, even though it was pretty cold. So that's another thing that you can do when you have a good, uh, a good, you know, a good resolution and good uh, raw file to work with. Great, great, cool. So I, that's about all I've got for uh, Outer Banks. Is there anything else that you, you'd want to touch on before we move on? No, that's, that's kind of about it. I think that's, that's sort of uh, the idea to just having, um, you know, it's all about teamwork and, and then how do you put all those pieces together to tell the story and then just having yeah. the right tools to do it, you know? Did did you guys ever use Rialto on uh, Outer Banks? Yeah, we did. We did the first season. We used the Rialto, and we ended up using for a lot of sort of the driving thing, the driving uh, scenes, or uh, when we were a little limited. On the season on season two, we ended up switching the Rialto for a third, like full body, so we had three cameras to work with. Um, but that, I think the Rialto is uh, it's still a really really good tool for when you have space constraints, you know. Cool, cool. All right, so let's discuss the new project, the sure. new film, uh, and the new camera. So you had the chance to use Venice 2, and Sony was lucky enough to have you direct and DP a short film using Venice 2. And so we're going to premiere that right now. So, or, yeah, let's show it. Um, this is ungraded. Uh, is there anything you want to say to set this up for us? Yeah, so I, I mean, just people who are watching have in mind it's not being color corrected. So it's just, it just comes straight from the camera with a, just the, law, the um, Rec 709. And then also think that it has no, it's all available, like there's no lights involved, like zero, no, not, not even the LED, nothing. Because that was, for me, that was the idea. I'm gonna sh shoot a piece that I can show what a camera can do with no lights. Because if you can do something pretty with no lights, then imagine what you can do with when you have control. Um, and then, you know, we chose the subject, which was this uh, amazing, talented musician. And we wanted to follow her around and tell a little bit about her, her life and her story. 
and showcase her talent at the same time um, that we show her in uh, different parts of New York. Um, so yeah, that's that's all I have to say right now, and then we'll talk about it later. Let's roll the videotape. <laughs> I'm tired of being this person I have to be, not that I want to be. I'm gonna live the life I want, not the one that's safe. I wanted to go, wanted to escape, leave that place where I didn't feel accepted. A place where I couldn't be who I am. There was so much prejudice in the environment I grew up in. I had to unlearn so many things I was taught. So many of their truths that deep down felt wrong. In New York, my true self could come out. I realized people are just people. Being, becoming an artist that can make a life of their art in New York. It's a challenging journey. You have to be tough. Believe in what you do and who you are as an artist. You quickly realize people, while talented, may not have the drive, passion, and commitment that is needed. You have to put your heart and soul in every word, every note. New York was a dream and is now my reality. Skating is, I would say, a metaphor of life. When you fall, you just have to get up and keep on going. 
and you can only get better by doing it, living it. I love spending time around children. And seeing how they view the world with no judgment and joy. It feels pointless to do something if you are not enjoying it. Nothing really matters or has a real point or value if you aren't happy and enjoying it. So be happy. Do what you love. And that's it. Wow, that was really fantastic. That's, you know, that was my first time also seeing it. And I was with you guys in New York. So I got to say, having been there, I have so many questions now having seen it. Um, so let's, let's discuss. So, so great. It's so good to see it come together. And the fact that it looks that good on graded um, and that the skin tones look that good on graded. Let's discuss, let's first talk about the sensor and the skin tones, because for me, that that was ungraded and looks so good, I'm still, you know, processing. Um, yeah. So, so 8.6K sensor that was shot in full 8K resolution. Um, we saw at the end of the credits, you shot on the Zeiss Supreme Prime Radiance uh, and the Leica Noctilux. Uh, what was your motivation for those lenses? And tell me what you think about the skin tones and the sensor. Yeah, so the logic behind, I just came from uh, using those lenses on the pilot that I did in, in Calgary, and I really love them. I love the, sort of they have this slightly older quality to them, but it's still very easy to use as uh, modern lenses in terms of focus and all of that. Um, and the flare, I mean, I love the flares. Those are sort of bluish flares that I that, that come with them that you can see a lot of those in the, in the, in the film. Uh, and then the Noctilux, the Noctilux, I wanted to try just something that was really sensitive sensitive in the end i had to like mb so much because it was so <laughs> there's a lot of light coming in so yeah i wanted to just get lenses with a little bit of character not nothing that would be too because i knew the sensor was very sharp and you know with a lot of um with a big resolution so i wanted to just have something that uh, that i was also familiar with very recently so i could compare um yeah so and then the skin tone yeah i mean basically uh, as you say you know i play with the color and every shot, basically every shot has a different color, you know, like sunset and then uh, fluorescent lighting and everything. And it just seems to um, to make, it just feels very cinematic. Like the, the, what I like about the, the, the Venice 2 was that it just feels really cinematic in, in the way that it just handles the face uh, with different colors. It still has just a really great quality that, uh, and for me, it's all about the faces in the end. It just, that's what tells the story. So, uh, not only the color, but also the red, sort of the quality of the, um, it feels like it's not too sharp. Like I, I feel like 
it's sharp where it needs to be. It's almost like it's sharp on the buildings, but it's not necessarily sharp on the face because you don't want to see too much detail on, on someone's face. You don't want to see pores or, you know. So I do like that from this camera. Well, I use no filtration. It's like straight from the, from the lens, you know. And that's kind of really difficult to do when you have an 8K sensor. I've done it with other 8K sensors and it's like, you cannot look at the face. It's just like really, it's too much, you know? And I really like this because it was very cinematic. Uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of what I thought about the, the color and, um, and the skin. So cool, so really more filmic and rather than hyper real and you know, that the resolution is helping the skin tones and the skin textures as opposed to, you know, being too too hyper sharp and exactly it, it just feels almost like film and when you had film you had the the sort of the, the layer that was the sensitive to the skin color was the bottom layer so that that meant it was a little softer and it feels like this has a similar vibe to it where i don't know exactly i didn't talk to them about it but it just the result for me is like i can use a lens and an 8, 8k sensor with no filters and still have someone look just glow. I mean, well, Colony has a beautiful face and great skin uh, skin color, but at the same time, it's not overly electronic and overly defined, you know, like with the other 8K sensors. So I really, really appreciate that from um, from a camera. So let me ask you this, but um, before we get into dual base ISO and some other things, um, this was ungraded. What are your plans for the grade? Well, I want to keep it very similar. I, I really don't want it to do too much to it because same thing. My idea was to really show the camera and not, not show because you can do so much, especially if you have a, a neg well, a negative. If you have a, um, data like you have on these files, you can do pretty much anything that you want. But my idea is to just basically keep it very similar, just uh, balance it a little bit because I was doing pretty much everything on it. So sometimes it's a little bright here. It's a little dark there. Um, and I just want to balance a little bit. I want to play with the color a little bit in the performance, make it slightly warmer, but nothing major. I, I want to approach it almost like if you were grading a, a film, uh, old school, where you only can, you can only go like warm, cool, dark, or, or light. I don't want to do anything special with any any other colors, uh, because I wanted I wanted the people to be able to see the most authentic image from what I shot, without tweaking. You know, because you can do so much to it. And uh, for me, if, if you're going to test the camera, that's what you want to see. You want to see what uh, what it's good at, uh, at doing, you know? Yeah, for sure. Actually, I, I have a question that's going to take us, kind of lead us right into dual base ISO and that camera's capability there. Um, shot craft. You know, yeah. it, it was very obvious to me when we, when we were all in New York that you had a plan uh, in your head that you you were creating the scenes and you were shooting the scenes kind of, you were shooting for the edit, obviously. Um, so tell me how you were constructing those scenes in your head and that in your yeah. approach when you were shooting. Yeah, I mean, for me, I knew I wanted to show like on every location that we had, which are locations that um, uh, Kalani chose because she that's where she hangs out, like the skate park, the ferry, the bridge, the parks. So I wanted to show the record store and all of those. I wanted to just show the place and then I knew I wanted to see her face doing things, you know, and um, try to convey sort of emotion. So I knew I wanted to be on a wide shot and then you eventually I wanted to get close and then get some detail of hands some face, uh, playing guitar, stuff like that. So my approach was instead of doing like a, a pass on each one, I just did a wide and I just, I just sort of walked in. You can sort of see it on the skate, um, in the skate park where it's just a wide shot and comes in and it's only one shot. So I just kind of approach it as one shot. And then I know I'm going to have, okay, I want this piece of her reading, uh, the writing on the notebook. And I want this piece of her playing the guitar. And I move around so I can get variety of shots, different backgrounds, sometimes looking for a flare, sometimes looking for a uh, you know, bridge in the background or New York. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of what I was uh, aiming to do. you know, And uh, just also to be able to shoot quickly because we had like probably eight locations each day for two days, we only shot in two days. So I really wanted to be able to be efficient. And um, that comes also from my Outer Banks training. <laughs> and then at the same time, try to keep her, not like overly direct her, because I wanted to, her to come through as authentic as she is. So I wanted to be like, okay, I'm just, you know, be there, do what you do. And I came with a camera and just play around. So I wouldn't be directing her like, do this or do that, you know? It was more like finding moments. So that was sort of my approach to it. Uh, did you feel that you had a favorite focal length that you kept going back to? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I ended up using, I only got like four focal lengths for this on the radiance and then one on, on the Leicas. I got a, but the most uh, that I wanted was the 40. Um, Cause I just, for me, that's, it's kind of a very uh, classic lens, which I really like. And that uh, at the same time, the model of the um, Radiance Prime 40 flares beautifully, like really does flare beautifully. And then you don't have to try to find the sun necessarily behind the character to, to flare. You just, you know, you know the sun's there, so you play a little bit and you can find it really quickly. Uh, and then it's also kind of a nice favoring. Um, um, it's not a portrait lens at all, but it is a lens that people will uh, make people look good with, uh, with the same time seeing enough background because it was all, uh, also a piece about New York. Uh, and then uh, I ended up using the 18 a lot more than I thought, just because I was operating is easier to sort of walk with the camera and keep it, you know, smooth on a wider lens and show more, you know, show like more New York, show more the bridges and uh, and the, the scale of the city in, in that in that case. So that actually that actually brings me right to my next question, um, which is the sensor size and the lens coverage, and how did that help you tell a more intimate story? How did that help you tell the story? Well, I, I mean, I knew I sort of wanted to use a whole sensor and uh, the lenses that cover the whole thing. So yeah, I mean, it, 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 for me, it felt like the 40 was doing exactly what I wanted to do in terms of the coverage. And it, it didn't feel like I needed to think, okay, now I'm using this, this lens, which covers on a different format, you know, like having to have that thing when you're trying to figure out which lens you are on. Um, so it just felt really natural, um, the sort of having that, uh, the, the sensor size and the, the, the lenses match easily for me to be able to design the shots. I, I never really, I mean, when maybe once or twice, I was like, oh, maybe this is not what I thought in, in terms of lens. But if I put the lens on, it was kind of exactly what I was trying to, to plan for. And then uh, it just makes you more, you know, more efficient if you don't have to be changing lenses that much. Cool, cool. So let's talk about dual base ISO and the camera's dual base ISO capability. Um, did you use, I mean, I, it was over the course of two days. It was, it was bright, it was dark. That cafe where she was playing guitar was really dark with the blue lights. Um, obviously, I'm assuming you used both 800 and 3200. Uh, tell me about your approach to the dual base ISO in the camera. And then did you stay at those dual base ISO values or did you vary from there? Yeah, so I did use um, quite a bit. All the exteriors mostly I, did, I shot except uh, sunset. The sunset I did shoot 800, but then the sort of the rock skipping sequence, I shot that on uh, 3200, they say. Um, I did, the performance was also 3200. The studio, when she's playing the guitar and with the headphones, uh, all that's 3200, which, uh, and then the rest is 800. I do change to, like, like to play with ASL a, a lot, especially on, uh, on the higher end, if I'm like at 3200. Sometimes it's a little too much, so I'll do the base at 32, and I'll probably tweak the camera maybe to a 1600, so I don't have to put any in this. Um, when I'm at 800, I, I tend to keep it at 800, unless I don't have enough uh, in this, which is never the case on this camera. Um, but it, it, it would be, I would play it with it like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the ability to change the ASA uh, just with a button is just huge, you know, because you don't have enough light and you know i mean on this we had no light so i, I knew on the on the um, performance i i wasn't even worried when i i didn't scout the location i got there i told the guy what what do you have for lighting he switched it on and i'm like that's great let's shoot it put a 3200 sa and i was still using some nd to be able to shoot wide open um which was great you know and i think i got what i wanted from the from the camera very cool very cool so let's um Talk about highlights and shadows and how the mm -hmm. Venice handles highlights and shadows. That seems to be a question a lot of people are interested in knowing. Yeah, for me, like highlights, the, this camera has an, is an upgrade on the, on the Venice, on the original one, in terms of highlights and shadows. And I was playing with it quite a lot on, the, um, on every, almost every shot has a very bright element and a dark element. Like when she's in the fair, you have a building behind it, it has the sun reflected, and then you have the coat, which is black. So. I do think that it's um, it has great, really great latitude. Like uh, uh, compared to the previous one, it's an improvement. Uh, and same thing, it it just really allows you to to not be worried about the, the highlights and what's going to happen with those highlights when you color correct. And for me, that I, I don't like necessarily blown out highlights. It's a huge thing that you can uh, 
you can do like that. Or you, you, you know, you're shooting a um, close up with a flare behind the, the face and you know that you, you have detail. So the, the answer, the short answer would be it's a really good improvement on the first version of the camera. And then let's, let's kind of extend that into thinking about HDR. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I would say thoughts? as people um, move more into HDR streaming, like Netflix and other studios, if you have the ability to, to capture in your original or original negative, in this case, uh, the sensor, all the range, then when you do your color, it's really easy to translate that, that to HDR instead of having to compress your um, signal when you're shooting. You, if you're shooting, you have to underexpose a lot to be able to keep the highlights and you probably have to light the, the, the shadows to be able to have the, the range. In this case, it's like, I'm just gonna let it go <laughs> and basically everything is there. You know, so it, you have you are able to to um, to capture more without with less effort in a way, which was something that I wanted to to, to test on this camera. You know, so uh, and it comes great for the new HDR generation of projects. Yeah, super cool. Um, so let's discuss really quick the the color science and how mm -hmm. that helps you achieve the look that you wanted with this film and with other projects. Yeah, so I think, I mean, what I really liked about this camera too was the, the fact that it's almost like what you saw was what you were getting in, in terms of color. Uh, and I was playing with the color quite a bit, you know, in the, uh, the pool and, uh, the, the you know, when she's playing the piano and that's sort of warehouse play. So I was, it's, I was kind of impressed at the fact that um, it does have a very kind of subtle rendition of the color. In, and uh, even with diff very difficult colors to replicate on digital, like that blue, deep blue on the performance with a deep warm, I think it still had a really, it, it did a really good job capturing those, almost the way that the eye sees them. Uh, same thing with the sunset, you know, I was able to capture kind of the, the subtlety of the colors of the sunset with a cityscape uh, in a way that it didn't have to be, okay, now I have to play with the color and, and you know, whatever, change the color way um, a lot so uh, I was able to saturate that wasn't the case so that's that's also a great improvement on on the uh, previous version and in in the comparison to, in comparison to other cameras in the market pretty solid color, color rendition and especially especially on faces which is uh, you know for me number one priority when I'm telling them you know a story nice nice um were there any shots specifically in this film that you thought kind of showcased the quality of the camera? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think my favorite shot is when she's playing the guitar in the studio and then she's singing on the microphone. This is kind of the same shot, uh, sort of very warm uh, color. That same thing, no lighting, we, they had on the studio, they had just a little bit of uh, like a strip of, uh, of lights, uh, like and some tiny lights that I, I pointed it to the lens directly. The rest was just like whatever was there. Um, that because it was shot with no lights, and it was so it was so great on the face, and it was so great on the texture of the of the flare, of the highlights, and so great on the on the texture of the headphones. So um, I, that's my favorite shot because it's also probably the biggest close up with it on the on the whole thing. So yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, I remember that studio being really small. <laughs> <laughs> super small. And so it was super small. And so I think another thing that really benefited you about the camera is that it's now smaller and more compact. Yeah. Which was one of was when I, space, yeah, you know? yeah. When I, I talked to the people at Sony about the first version of the camera, I always told them, I wish it was a little smaller, you know, more compact because most of the time right now in, 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 um, in the projects, you always, need portability, you're moving always faster than you want. So you do need uh, something that's small to be able to, to do that. And in this case, you know, I operate the whole thing and it felt really good on my shoulder um, and it felt really good walking. It has, it's really well balanced. So I like that a lot for, as compared to the previous version too. And it's a lot, it's shorter too. So the camera is not as long too, which is nice on the, on the shoulder, you be able to do a, smaller locations without, you know, too much hassle. So we have a, super cool. Uh, we have a question. Um, Travis McQueen is asking, how is the fall off compared to some other cameras? The highlight, the roll off. Yeah, uh, on the highlights, it's really great. Like I would say it's, uh, 
It's, I would say it's very similar, if not superior to, to the other cameras in the market. Uh, I don't want to name names, <laughs> but um, it does feel like it's, um, it's really great on the highlights. So you have, like when we were shooting, you would have a building with, um, you know, the sun in the bottom part of the building and then just sort of the gradation of the sky. And you could really see the, it wasn't just like, okay, the sun's there and it's just white. It was really subtle. Same thing on the water, which is, uh, She's with the flare behind there. The water just had so much detail on the highlights. And then from there, it, it, it just it just didn't feel like it was just clipped. And then uh, and then the water, it did feel like it had a really great rendition on the highlights. I mean, in the fall, in the shadows for sure too. But I think when we always on, um, on video, we're always more worried about highlights and shadows. Sure, sure, sure. Um... If anybody has any other questions, please send them now because we're kind of getting towards the end of our time. So, um, Gonzalo, in the meantime, what is your overall impression of the new camera? Well, I think it's a really nice upgrade. Uh, and, you know, you can do upgrades on uh, technology, but if you don't listen to the people that actually use the technology, then it's kind of pointless. And in this case, I do think like Sony really listened to what people were asking for, which is, you know, I want a better color we want a little smaller camera we want better resolution without being overly defined and too elect electronic and then um you know the, the internal filters just everything that uh that worked from that camera is still there and everything that was uh, that could be improved was improved so i would say it, it is pretty much like um like the the best improvement of the first version that could have happened, you know, in every single aspect, including like so the viewfinder, including the the way the handling, the um, and the, just the operation is very intuitive and very easy to use. And uh, I think in the end, that's what you want. You want to you want people who make cameras to be in touch with people who use cameras and not just like this is what we're doing and that's it. No, so I, I like that a lot. Super cool. So I think, you know, we can wrap real quick here. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to touch on before we kind of say goodbye? No, I mean, just, you know, um, um, the fact that this, for me, it was about doing something that was very small and we ended up using like almost no crew. Like it was me. I mean, we co-directed my wife and I, and then we had a camera assistant, another second camera assistant, and, you know, our DIT, but that was it. We didn't have any any crew, so I think my idea was like to try to do something that was uh, beautiful, but at the same time was intimate. And then because I didn't want like 30 people with us, you know. So um, I think that's sort of the, the objective of it. And I think it, it, it was sort of, I sort of achieved what I wanted, which was to make something that showcases a camera with a with a kind of interesting subject and make it poetic and artistic at the same time, you know? So, and I think with the camera, I was just able to do that. Well, I will say this. I think that you did a lovely job. I mean, I'm really having, like I said, having been there those couple of days, seeing you piece this all together and watch you shoot it. And then to see the final product, I'm very, very excited to see the final final. Uh, but I think you did a beautiful job and I really appreciate your time. This has been a great conversation. And I appreciate everybody joining us. And Gonzalo, thank you so much. And enjoy thank the rest you so of your much. day. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. fire that is within you is the same that is within us all. A spark traveling through the night. A torch burning in time. And it is how we use that time that will define our story.
The creative mind can shape worlds out of thin air. Imagine the unimaginable. See beyond the impossible. We give meaning to life. And life gives us meaning back. It's not just about what we see. It's about the way we see. Together, we dream upstream into the headwinds. Against all odds. Come on! Seeing the world through a lens unlike any other. Are the thought sparkers, the street dreamers, the wind hunters, the fire seekers, collectors of color, trappers of time itself. And it's how we use that time that will define history. My name is Sarah Dichi, rhymes with Peachy, and I am a YouTuber based in Dallas, Texas. So I'm always on the go. I need something fast enough to keep up with YouTube life. I am super excited for the Xperia Pro I. It is crazy to see the depth of field that you can get with it, and it is pretty insane that it's coming from a smartphone. Xperia has a brand new on-the-go solution called Videography Pro that combines all the features that a run-and-gun filmmaker like me needs. I can access different lenses, cine looks, and switch apertures between f2 and f4. I can trick it out with a ton of accessories, an external mic on top, a multifunctional grip where I can zoom in and out, and also a portable vlog monitor. This is really great because you can still use the rear cameras and I can still see myself. It's honestly crazy that I'm recording this on a phone because it looks like a movie. It, it looks like a movie.
looks so good. And it has a video shortcut key where I can just pull it out of my pocket, press it, and I am off to the races. I autofocus keeps lock on my eye. So I'm in focus whether I'm here or back here. And just like shooting with my Sony Alpha cameras, it has optical image stabilization. And that way I have assurance that my image is going to be steady. It's not going to be shaky. Shaky video footage is always very, very distracting. The Xperia Pro Eye is slim, it is water and dust resistant, and it is packed with a ton of features. Xperia shoots up to 120 frames per second, and I can also shoot 4K HDR, which is great for capturing beautiful colors for your video. One might think that being a YouTuber means that image is everything, which it is, yes, but audio is just as important. Xperia has added a third unidirectional microphone, and it almost has the effect like you're just there with the person. It also has a sound source separator that uses an intelligent wind filter. What that means is they figured out how to deal with the biggest sound killer in the field, wind and with Cinematography Pro. It also has Venice Color Science, which uh, they take from Sony's Cinema Line. So if you wanna go Hollywood, that is an option. Whether I'm in the studio or on the go, I always love to have a pro image, and that's where the Xperia Pro Eye comes in. And I think even my audience expects, you know, an elevated image from me. So it is really great to have that in a smartphone. The Xperia Pro Eye is just that. Photography in its essence is about emotion. Capturing that emotion takes more than a good eye. It takes having the right camera and the right moment. Sony took all the speed from the existing cameras, combined it with all the advanced technology from the Xperia line to create the Xperia Pro Eye. Street photography happens fast. The fleeting moments that create the best images are gone with the blink of an eye. Fast action, low light, wild contrast swings. This new Xperia can handle it all having a 1.0 type image sensor and dual aperture f2 and f4 lenses in the camera on my phone is a complete game changer. The bokeh, the low light capabilities, never in a million years did I think I would be able to create images that rival my mirrorless camera on my phone. With three different focal lengths, it's like having a full kit of lenses and Xperia's Photography Pro allows you to shoot in auto, manual, or any way in between, giving you full control over all its settings. It features real-time tracking and real-time IAF. It instantly locks onto your subject wherever it is. With built-in optical image stabilization, my handheld images are sharp. And its dedicated shutter button it has a feeling function that I'm used to with my Sony cameras. Xperia Pro I has light and fast autofocus, covering 90% of the frame and it shoots in bursts of up to 20 frames per second. Xperia's high sensitivity sensor handles night scenes like a champ and with little noise and mind-blowing dynamic range. Its T-Star coated lenses practically eliminate reflection, flares, and ghosting. So whether I'm shooting into street lights or the sun, the image comes out perfect. As a professional, I always use a strap with my cameras and with the Xperia, same exact thing. Plus with a water resistant body, I know it won't get damaged even as I carry it around the city. Because Xperia records in 12-bit RAW, it provides smooth and rich files to work with in post without any banding to worry about. And thanks to 5G capabilities, I can upload and share my images immediately. Or I can use Xperia's removable SD card for quick transfers and hot swaps up to a terabyte. Nothing captures the emotion of a moment like a perfect photo. And now with the Xperia Pro I, have the ability to capture that perfect moment at all times.
Prospering in this environment is challenging. When you give kids a voice and you give them access, greatness is sure to follow. This allows for more kids to be exposed to what their passion is going to be. We always say, you know, you can't be what you can't see. What we're creating for our community is growth. Think of the wildest and craziest things that you can do to change the world around you and then use this support to make it happen because you have a whole team behind you. At B&H, we're here to help folks find what they need. Give us an example there, Irving. There was NASA. NASA? What did they need? A unique hospital at Lens. We often have what others don't. For all your needs, big or small, check out bnh.com. This is a real B&H customer story about Fred Smith here, turning lemons to lemonade. Fred, tell us your story. I was a fitness instructor in Atlanta, and I transferred to New York March 13, 2020, right as all the studios shut down. But with B&H's help, I started Workout with Fred. The challenge for a fitness instructor when they're streaming from home is you've got multiple sources of audio. I didn't know how complex that was, and that's where B&H came in. Whether I was on the chat or I called, anytime I had a question, they had a solution. I was like, ah, I wish I'd called you earlier. Thanks for sharing your B&H story with us, Fred. Visit us at bnh.com for expert advice on starting your next project. I take for granted all these moments sometimes. Oh, I don't need the stars to align. No matter what you always have my time. No matter what you always have my time.
fire that is within you is the same that is within us all. A spark traveling through the night. A torch burning in time. And it is how we use that time that will define our story. The creative mind can shape worlds out of thin air. Imagine the unimaginable. See beyond the impossible. We give meaning to life, and life gives us meaning back. It's not just about what we see. It's about the way we see. Together, we dream upstream into the headwinds. Against all odds. Come on! Seeing the world through a lens unlike any other. are the thought sparkers, the street dreamers, the wind hunters, the fire seekers, collectors of color, trappers of time itself. <laughs> and it's how we use that time that will define history. My name is Sarah Dichi, rhymes with peachy, and I am a YouTuber based in Dallas, Texas. So I'm always on the go. I need something fast enough to keep up with YouTube life. 
I am super excited for the Xperia Pro I. It is crazy to see the depth of field that you can get with it and is pretty insane that it's coming from a smartphone. Xperia has a brand new on the go solution called Videography Pro that combines all the features that a run and gun filmmaker like me needs. I can access different lenses, cine looks, and switch apertures between f2 and f4. I can check it out with a ton of accessories, an external mic on top, a multifunctional grip where I can zoom in and out, and also a portable vlog monitor. This is really great because you can still use the rear cameras and I can still see myself. It's honestly crazy that I'm recording this on a phone because it looks like a movie. It, it looks so good. And it has a video shortcut key where I can just pull it out of my pocket, press it, and I am off to the races. Eye autofocus keeps lock on my eye, so I'm in focus whether I'm here or back here. And just like shooting with my Sony Alpha cameras, it has optical image stabilization. And that way I have assurance that my image is going to be steady. It's not going to be shaky. Shaky video footage is always very, very distracting. The Xperia Pro I is slim, it is water and dust resistant, and it is packed with a ton of features. Xperia shoots up to 120 frames per second, and I can also shoot 4K HDR, which is great for capturing beautiful colors for your video. One might think that being a YouTuber means that image is everything, which it is, yes, but audio is just as important. Xperia has added a third unidirectional microphone, and it almost has the effect like you're just there with the person. It also has a sound source separator that uses an intelligent wind filter. What that means is they figured out how to deal with the biggest sound killer in the field, wind. And with Cinematography Pro, it also has Venice Color Science, which uh, they take from Sony's Cinema Line. So if you wanna go Hollywood, that is an option. Whether I'm in the studio or on the go, I always love to have a pro image. And that's where the Xperia Pro I comes in. And I think even my audience expects, you know, an elevated image from me. So it is really great to have that in a smartphone. The Xperia Pro I is just that. Photography in its essence is about emotion. Capturing that emotion takes more than a good eye. It takes having the right camera and the right moment. Sony took all the speed from their existing cameras, combined it with all the advanced technology from the Xperia line to create the Xperia Pro I. Street photography happens fast. The fleeting moments that create the best images are gone with the blink of an eye. Fast action, low light, wild contrast swings. This new Xperia can handle it all having a 1.0 type image sensor and dual aperture f2 and f4 lenses in the camera on my phone is a complete game changer. The bokeh, the low light capabilities, never in a million years did I think I would be able to create images that rival my mirrorless camera on my phone. With three different focal lengths, it's like having a full kit of lenses and Xperia's Photography Pro allows you to shoot in auto, manual, or any way in between, giving you full control over all its settings. It features real-time tracking and real-time IAF. It instantly locks onto your subject wherever it is. With built-in optical image stabilization, my handheld images are sharp. And its dedicated shutter button it has a feel-in function that I'm used to with my Sony cameras. Xperia Pro I has light and fast autofocus, covering 90% of the frame and it shoots in bursts of up to 20 frames per second. Xperia's high sensitivity sensor handles night scenes like a champ and with little noise and mind-blowing dynamic range. Its T-Star coated lenses practically eliminate reflection, flares, and ghosting. So whether I'm shooting into street lights or the sun, the image comes out perfect. As a professional, I always use a strap with my cameras and with the Xperia, same exact thing. Plus with a water-resistant body, I know it won't get damaged even as I carry it around the city. Because Xperia records in 12-bit RAW, it provides smooth and rich files to work with in post without any banding to worry about. And thanks to 5G capabilities, I can upload and share my images immediately. Or I can use Xperia's removable SD card for quick transfers and hot swaps up to a terabyte. Nothing captures the emotion of a moment like a perfect photo. And now with the Xperia Pro I, have the ability to capture that perfect moment at all times.
Prospering in this environment is challenging. When you give kids a voice and you give them access, greatness is sure to follow. This allows for more kids to be exposed to what their passion is going to be. We always say, you know, you can't be what you can't see. What we're creating for our community is growth. Think of the wildest and craziest things that you can do to change the world around you and then use this support to make it happen because you have a whole team behind you. At B&H, we're here to help folks find what they need. Give us an example there, Irving. It was NASA. NASA? What did they need? A unique hospital lens. We often have what others don't. For all your needs, big or small, check out bnh.com. This is a real B&H customer story about Fred Smith here, turning lemons to lemonade. Fred, tell us your story. I was a fitness instructor in Atlanta, and I transferred to New York March 13, 2020, right as all the studios shut down. But with B&H's help, I started Workout with Fred. The challenge for a fitness instructor when they're streaming from home is you've got multiple sources of audio. I didn't know how complex that was, and that's where B&H came in. Whether I was on the chat or I called, anytime I had a question, they had a solution. I was like, ah, I wish I'd called you earlier. Thanks for sharing your B&H story with us, Fred. Visit us at bnh.com for expert advice on starting your next project. <laughs> I take for granted all these moments sometimes. Oh, I don't need the stars to align. No matter what you always have my time. No matter what you always have my time.
the fire that is within you is the same that is within us all. A spark traveling through the night. A torch burning in time. And it is how we use that time that will define our story. The creative mind can shape worlds out of thin air. Imagine the unimaginable. Hey gang, last final session, portfolio review here at uh, Creative Space. I am uh, happy to say that I'm again joining Brooke uh, as we uh, go over uh, some beautiful portfolios here, three more. So we, we don't have a little less time today. We can go right to it. Uh, Brooke is a great uh, conceptual fine art photographer. I do a little bit of everything. So uh, let's get started. Uh, oh, sorry, I have the wrong one. So this is, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back one slide. I, I forgot to look at the uh, look at the initial image. Oh, that's just, uh, I, okay, say this name for me again, Brooke, would you please? Karun, I think. Karun. Right, thank you. Uh, so I had a really good time looking at this portfolio just because it's just so very, very polished. You know, it's from the capturing to the editing, uh, to the lighting, to the attention to detail, you know, so, so I'm not going to say a lot of negative things or nothing to critique like this particular image i love the attention to detail because that horizon is beautiful that 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 tangential line that corner line starts exactly from the upper left corner there's 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 nothing out of place here and that light is just fantastic you know a little bit of light in the sky that just gets sort of mirrored against that uh, concrete background and that smooth water just just gorgeous i think that's what struck me too was the attention to detail as you said it's it's kind of perfect. Um, and even the smoothness of the water, which I think can't be overlooked because it's all about texture here. If there were tons of ripples in that water, it would totally detract from the all other details in the sky, in the pattern of the concrete as it is. I think it's really kind of flawless the way that it's reflective and the way that the textures flow. And I think we'll see that a lot in this portfolio yeah. um, as we do in the next image as well. So in this image, um, for me, it's about light first and foremost, and then about lines. And I say that it's about light first, even though the first thing that really strikes me are all of these wavy yet vertical lines. But the way that the light is pooling in the bottom center of this image gives it an anchor. And I think that at least for me, I've shot a lot of images in forests. It's something that, you know, eventually everyone probably does. And the hardest thing about shooting in a forest is that there's dappled light everywhere in a forest and it really gets confusing to look at. But in this picture, it's so smooth across that horizon line. You can't even see where the horizon line is exactly, but then the light is brightest right in the center on the ground. Like it's just coming in just to fill that space perfectly. And I think that this is the type of thing that is so incredibly hard to achieve. The smoothness of this image works well with the quality of light, the colors. It's so monochromatic. I think that's a huge boon here. So um, I, I just wish I could be there so badly. Yeah, great, great. Technically, it's a great shot. And, you know, 
Um, I've sort of noticed throughout this portfolio this theme of this sort of uh, Gaussian blur sort of uh, effect on the highlights here where it has that glowing effect. Uh, I think sometimes it can be overdone uh, in images and uh, and sometimes it becomes a little bit too obvious. Uh, I think this one is right at the border of becoming a little bit too much for this particular image, but it's just on the right side, the correct side uh, of where it is. You know, and the only thing that I want to say about, it's a great image. The only thing is it's something that you probably can't even control is I think the pathway is not, it's not, not a natural pathway. You know, I just wish this was like a forest. It feels like this is a paved pathway. If you look at the margins of that pathway, it's like concrete. And I don't like that cut surface of the, of the fallen trees, you know, it just, and again, it's nothing that you can control as the photographer, but that just catches my, it just, it has a little bit of this slightly unnatural appearance in this otherwise very natural looking scene. But again, nothing that you could have controlled. Ah, uh, oh yes, this is the quintessential, you know, sun's up, let's go, uh, let's go surfing. And it's just a beautiful use of lines and composition. I don't mind the centered composition here. I love the leading lines, not just the road, but sort of the markings on the road, the little uh, dotted pathway. And it seems like the, the, the individuals are just perfectly placed right at the center with the little edges of the, uh, of the surfboard touching or kissing, if you will, what uh, Brooke used before, sun-kissed uh, edges of, that, of, that, uh, of the board. Uh, and uh, the sky is gorgeous, the, the vertical lines leading up to the sky. Uh, it's, you know, it's not a very complex, and, and here, I think it's a, the perfect use of that little bit of glow that, that I sort of see sort of pervading many of the images in this portfolio. That little glow is just, just perfect without being too much. Yeah, I, this is the type of image where I wouldn't necessarily choose this spot to set up an image if everything were going to be created and chosen and in, in, with intent. But if this is the space that you've been given and these people are here going to the beach at this place, I think it's probably the best use of all of the tools that you have as an artist to create an image that's really impactful here with the leading lines, with the way that the sun is positioned and the people are positioned. I think that with what you've been given in this space, because you know, I wouldn't normally say, take a picture of a big sign at a beach, for example, but it's there and it works because everything else is in place as best as it could be. So I think that, that it's a, a really good job of what you should do with your, with what you've been given. Now, I just, I don't know who can look at this and not love this picture from just a gut level. I think that it's right. so beautiful. And, but, but here's the thing about it is I mean, I've seen cows and whatnot. I've tried to take pictures of cows. It doesn't look like this. Why doesn't it look like this? And I think that there are several factors here. One is that you have this foreground that's out of focus. And not only is it out of focus, but it's a stark contrast in color to the background. In fact, it's a literal opposite um, color. So if you if you look in curves in Photoshop, for example, you'll see green and you'll see magenta and they're two opposite sides of the spectrum. And that's happening here in just the perfect subtle amount of opposition. So we've got the foreground that's really warm, the background that's cooler, and then right in the middle is this anchor of a cow. And then of course we can say a million different things about the cow itself. Obviously the eye that this is giving us is incredible. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. But it's also the composition of that horn coming up the thirds that it's placed in, the creaminess and softness of this image, everything is working perfectly. No, I, I agree. I think this is a fan. I mean, I really have nothing to criticize about this image. And I just want to point out that this is a very, very difficult image to get right because this cow is backlit and it's heavily backlit. You could tell by the amount of light that's sort of uh, is outlining uh, the ears and the top of the head and the back. And so, and it's not only backlight, but a lot of, a lot of top light is happening on this yet the i think the exposure is just perfect just the right amount of detail everywhere and like you said the composition of where that cow is placed that eye is placed the horns the out of focus foreground this is where out of focus foreground really works because you know i don't find it distracting i find it something that actually complements the image rather, rather than takes away from it so flawless i really love this image too right um this is very, very artistic. It's, it's, I think this is a technique or it's either a, a Photoshop technique or it's a, a shot where 
the photographer has panned down uh, uh, vertically as they take the, a longer exposure. So it blurs uh, the vertical lines. Uh, it's moving from top to bottom. So in some ways, I think it's a little bit of, of editing, a little bit of Photoshop, because if, if it truly was all in the camera, the bottom part of the image would be blurred too. Uh, so I think I like the artistic use of, uh, of, of that effect uh, because there's a sense of motion to stillness from top to bottom. And that color palette here really works well. Again, I think uh, this person really knows the color wheel very well because when you mentioned before the green and the magenta, they're sort of complementary. Just a little bit of green and all of the bottom is brown. There's a hint of magenta. So it's very pleasing. It's almost like, I don't know what I like about this image color wise, but it really works. It works because it's part of that color wheel that you talked about. Uh, and it's a nice mix of the of the of the motion on the top and stillness on the bottom. You know, this for me is an image that I would love to hang this in my house. I think it is beautiful. I love the artistic part of it. I also love that it gives me an otherworldly feel when I look at this. I mean, I look at the blur in the background, the stretch of the pixels. I, I look at all of that and I feel like I'm about to be taken by a UFO or something like that. <laughs> Space. That said, I actually find this to be one of the weaker ones in this portfolio simply because I've seen this done before many, many times. And I actually think this portfolio is of such an incredibly high caliber that I think you can go a step further than this. So take that as a compliment and not exactly as a criticism because I'm simply saying you're so good that I think there's another step beyond this that you could go to. Amazing portfolio. Nice. Okay, so we're gonna look at Tef next. Um, and since there's no image here, we'll go on to the first one in the portfolio. And this is a really fascinating portfolio because I think that what this artist is doing is working a lot with character um, in real life scenarios. And so looking at this image, it's all about the details. It, first and foremost, beyond looking at the technique. So first I'm looking at, you know, the holding the cigarette or the cigar in the hand, the tattoos, the way that the face is being blocked, the outfit choice. And, and all of that comes first before I consider that there's no real background here. There's just a wall. Now, would I prefer more atmosphere than that? Probably yes, but I can very much appreciate that it's all about the character. I think that where a lot of artists start to fumble is when there's a character and there's a lot going on, but then the background is also busy and we're trying to put too many details all in one space. So while I'm a little bit conflicted about wanting a little bit more atmospheric detail, I really like how this is shot. And I think that the lighting is also appropriate, plus the black and white. Yeah, I, I think this is incredible. I think the whole series of image uh, images in this portfolio is credible. Uh, and you know, whenever I see pictures of interesting people, I always am drawn to their face and what's interesting about their face and you know their wrinkles or their facial expressions or their hair or their age. Here, that that's there, but also as equally important is what's everything else about this person, uh, you know, about the tattoos. You know, I, I like the fact that, you know, it, it's almost like he's pointing a gun away from you and towards you. And you can actually see a little bit of the writing on the, on the hand and the forearm that says, I think one of the words is death. Uh, it's a little morbid, but I think it's very in character with the type of shot. And this again would not have worked. I think if it hadn't been for black and white, black and white, really, again, brings out the feeling and the textures and the mood uh, and doesn't doesn't rely on on the color to wow you. So I, I really like this and the whole portfolio, port, port, portfolio in general. Uh, having said all that, I think this is probably the weakest of all the images in this portfolio because uh, it's to me, it's just it's a portrait. It's a well lit portrait. And had this image been in somebody else's portfolio, which is, I think, uh, uh, maybe not as strong a photographer. I was an incredible image, great job. But to me, in this portfolio, uh, it's just a picture of a person looking into the camera with, with some uh, winter gear or sporting gear. Uh, in lovely use of light, lovely use of lines, you know, there's nice uh, exposure, balance. But besides saying it's technically good, I'm not, I'm not feeling a story here. And what I can appreciate about this image and especially the following image, which we'll look at in a second, 
is the fact that there is a color story happening. There's the blue eyes, the blue jacket, the blue in the background. This was clearly shot at a time of day where that blue would be mimicked intentionally in throughout this image. So I really appreciate that about this. And if we go to the next shot, then we can talk about this even further because this next image that we're going to look at plays with color again in a very specific way. We've got the green of the fabric. We've got the sneakers. We've got the tree in the background. And all of these things are contributing to creating a sense of character that's very strong and very specific. I do like this image a lot. I even like it more than the previous one. And I think part of it is that the lighting is, is very controlled here in a way that feels really commercial. Like I feel like this would be an amazing advertisement for something, but also a great character story. So um, yeah, this one really stands out to me. No, I agree. And you know what? I'm Thank you for pointing that out about the blue and the greens and uh, something that I hadn't really paid as much, much, much attention to. But but here, the green, I agree with you, just is totally complimentary. And, uh, you know, not just the sneakers and the, and the clothing and the, and, the, and, and the background, but it's almost like even the court has a hint of green in the blueness, you know? So it's not just a pure uh, blue color, but it's maybe it's been adjusted to bring out a little bit more of the teal, which is slight slight mixing of the greens uh, into the um, into the texture. And I and I love the fact that there's you know uh, you know <laughs> whether this is intentional or not, but it's like is that crack leading right to his butt crack? I don't know. <laughs> what would <was> the... <laughs> I, I sort of I sort of popped my mind, but it's it's probably not intentional. <laughs> but I think it's a it's it's a great image, and I'm just trying to make a little a uh, little light of it. But 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 I agree. I, I I this one speaks more to me than the prior image. Ah uh, yes, I I really love this. And again, you know, I think what I like about the series again is the use of color, uh, the complementary color. You know, it's not just the the pants and the shirt but look at how it it's it's mimicked in the environment uh, whether it's the lighting on the uh reflected on the on the dark chair uh in the stereo system uh, behind it even that faded appearance of the of the of the processing you know where the black isn't completely black but it's faded a little bit the colors are a little muted uh yet the lighting is still strong it still evokes uh a feeling of of, of being there and and it's it's almost like you know, this person knows music. This person can create art uh, because he's seen it and done it all. Uh, and he's like, the, the, he's the man to go to if you want to know anything about the recording system. So I really like this one a lot. I totally agree. I When I look at this, I feel like this person is the king of this studio. Right. Like the way sitting, the posture, the, they're just owning this space. And everything that you said, I totally agree with about the, the color matching. And I think that it takes a lot of skill to be able to create an image like this in somebody's space. Um, clearly, this person belongs there. This is their environment. So to go into somebody else's space and then to pull out all of these similarities and to create a sense of cohesion, I think is really a great talent. Now, I, I think this one is strong for the same reasons that the previous one is very strong. In this case, we've got these warm colors. It almost looks like everything surrounding this person is copper. Like everything, this glow, this texture, this me metallic feel to it. And the fact that there are mirrors on either side, that can be really problematic <laughs> depending on what's going on in those reflections. But it's so symmetrical. I love that he's centered. I love that his face is right there, the brightest thing in the upper third. And then the lines that come out from that face are so intriguing. And the fact that the red is the only bright color here, it's really beautiful that the surroundings are also so warm so everything is in that same color family again yeah no and you know what i i think some people may appreciate fail to appreciate is everything is warm except the skin tones are still great on all these images it's not like everything's like a copper here the skin tone on the prior image everything was green but the face and the skin tones you know the natural tones of the people still come through so that this is a a master of somebody who knows his or her craft and knows how to light, not only the background, but the person also. There's no glare here. And it's almost like everything is, has a beautiful polarized appearance. It's very polished, very finished. Like you're saying, the mirrors, usually if you have anything with mirrors, you have tons of problems with the glare, but this is just perfectly done. Nothing is, you know, over the top. And, I mean, this person knows how to do 
lighting and how to do environmental portraits. And that's, I think, the, the, a great use of the genre here in, in his portfolio. Agreed. Okay, we'll move on to Nico here. And uh, Nico is, it has a lot of, I think, beautiful natural uh, landscapes. Uh, this is a great use of the composition. I think it's a great use of the two-thirds, one-third rule, where you have two-thirds sky, one-third foreground. Uh, I wish there was a little bit more uh, room for those people at the very bottom. I, it's almost like they're so silhouetted that they become part of the landscape and part of the ground and the rocks. At first, I kind of missed where, uh, what, what it was. I had to look a little carefully to realize what exactly they were. I love the reflections in the water. Uh, I think it's a good image. Uh, I think it may be just a, maybe the processing a little bit more, maybe bring, bring a little bit more of the shadow detail. Uh, yeah. I agree. For me, it was an issue of the people because I I didn't even notice them on my first pass of this image. I only noticed it on the second pass. And once I noticed the people, I thought, are those people an afterthought or they are they intentional? And so if they're intentional, I want them to be either centered or very intentionally placed in the frame, probably moved up perhaps a little bit more of the focus. And if they're not intentional, then I would get rid of the people because then it almost seems like someone just kind of stepped into a landscape shot by accident. So I think that the image itself is beautiful for all the reasons that Mahesh pointed out. But I think that the people create a problem when it's not very clear what the intent was. Agreed. Now, this is an interesting image. I thought this was so clever. I love the straight lines of the pier and the people who look like the straight lines of the <laughs> pier. I mean, I th thought this was just such a, a really fun image. And I think that what threw me is just simply the, the foreground on the right-hand side, having this, I don't know, piece of fabric, um, maybe a towel or something draped there. And if this were just a clean image where maybe the horizon line were straightened up and we didn't have that, it would, could be just so wonderfully symmetrical and so quirky. So I think that if we could just, you know, kind of just tilt it a little, take out that foreground, I think this would be phenomenally fun. Nope, ditto. That's exactly what I would have said. Uh, yeah, there's nothing else I can add. You know, I don't even mind the slightly overexposure of the sky because in this summertime, fun, outdoor, Caribbean type of theme, that works. But again, that horizon and that, and that distracting element of the foreground, spot on, I completely agree. Uh, yeah, this is a nice winter scene. Uh, I like the complementary leafless branches sort of at the bottom and at the upper right hand corner. You know, but uh, the composition leads me something uh, a little distracting for me. And I see a little bit of the tree on the right side that's sort of encroaching into the, uh, not, not the one on the upper right, but in the, in the distance, sort of the right side of the screen. It's a little encroaching. Uh, I don't really know what the subject matter is. You know, where is this leading my eye to, to the sky? Uh, you know, it's it's sort of hazy. I like the textures. I like the mood of this image, but I think we could work on the composition a little bit more. And as someone who generally entirely ignores composition, <laughs> which isn't a great thing to admit, but I do, um, I really love this image. I love the color of this image so very much because I think that it's really evoking a sense of the dead of winter, the, the quiet of this time of day. So for me, I, I do notice the things um, that Mahesh has pointed out. However, um, I am so much more drawn to the color of this. And I do love the, how the tree leads straight up into the sky that I'm pretty enamored with this as it is. Um, I can see where the improvements could be made, but I just, I just really love the, the fact that this has a cohesive story to it. And I think it's really beautiful. That's great. Okay, moving on to this image. Now, I I feel conflicted about this picture because on my first basic gut level, I love it. I am such a sucker for an image that gets into the nitty gritty of nature, where I feel like we've been taken down to the level of the water, of the rocks. 
I love the detail of all the textures. I like the slow shutter to get the moving water. Um, I'm just not a huge fan of exactly what is in the frame in the way that it's shot. For example, I don't love that there's something out of focus in the foreground because I almost want to go deeper into this cave of rock and see the water moving through there. I almost feel like that's the interesting part of the image. And I want to go see what that, you know, the, what kind of cave that makes and what shapes those make up close. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think the foreground is a little distracting with the blurriness. Uh, and I do want to, I want to see a, a tighter image with the margins of the image actually being that little cone shape or the triangle shaped opening into the water. And I think this is a little overexposed. The white of the water is too white. It's a little blown out. So I think if there's a little bit more attention uh, paid to the, uh, the exposure time and a little bit tighter crop, this would be a, a stronger image. And this is, I think, our uh, second to last slide. A fun image, sort of a, a couple of people doing yoga type poses. Uh, it's a nice shot. It's 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 whimsical. Uh, it's something that you know I see. I like to see every so often. Uh, it's a great environment. Uh, very natural. Uh, I think uh, for what it what it's trying to convey, it's doing a good job. Again, I'd like to see a slightly tighter tighter crop of this, maybe off center, uh, getting rid some of some of that foreground and the on the right hand side the darker the darker branches the darker roots and the trees and focusing more just on the uh, people and the in the left side of the plants you know um this is actually our last slide so oh, this sorry. Is, um, i love this image for the same reason that I loved the image on the pier, where I didn't mind the overexposure of the background. I didn't mind a lot of things about it because it's all about that feeling that it gives you. I feel like if this were a tourism shot, for example, people would be there. People would be like, I'm going to where they're going because there's so much dynamic movement happening in this image. The atmosphere is so inviting that I think it's really strong. So overall, this portfolio was a really an interesting glimpse into these spaces that really make people feel something. And I thought it was really a beautiful example of that. Um, so thank you to everybody who has submitted portfolios for these review sessions. We have had such a good time today. Thank you for coming to Sony Creative Space. Um, Mahesh, thank you so much for doing this with me. And it was so much fun to do this with you. Oh, Brooke, it was a pleasure. It's, uh, it's great to sort of look into the mind of somebody who's so creative and so talented and sort of get opinions, uh, you know, about what we shared, uh, our, our differing opinions, the things we thought similarly. And uh, I learned a lot today from the people who submitted the images and from you. So thank you very much. And thanks, Sony, for inviting us. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.
everyone and welcome back to Creative Space. We made it. This is the final session of the day. Congrats, everyone. Woo! Well done. <laughs> had some amazing workshops on the, on the stage. We had some incredible live shoots, saw all sorts of things, heard all sorts of things. <laughs> really excited um, to be able to, because this is the first time we've been able to do it in a couple of years now. Yeah. Two years. Wow. So it's weird um, not seeing the boxes around you guys. You know? it's, it's weird. It is weird. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's I can actually Where put my boxes? hand and I'm in the box. It's That's crazy. You know? It's cool. So before we get started, uh, a couple of things. Stay tuned up until the end. We're gonna tell you the winner of the A74 kit and the Xperia 1-3. So everyone is interested in that. And uh, ask your questions. I have actually the stream right here in front of me. So I will see your questions live as they come in, and I will be able to ask these guys uh, whatever you want to know. So this is your final opportunity of this event and of this year, because it's our final event, Ooh, wow, uh, virtual yeah. event of the year. We're wow. headed into the holidays. So ask away. So without further ado, let's get started. And we started talking about how this is the first time in person in two years' time. How did it feel? Um. It, it felt great. I was a little nerve-wracking initially, but once I got into the flow of everything, it you know, was amazing. Uh, like handling that A7 Sony Alpha 4. <laughs> um, it was it was really great to get my hands on that device and like see how it would perform in a live music setting or or our imitation of that. So um, once we got into the flow of everything, it felt really cool and natural and put me back in the headspace of being in a live music event. So nice. It was just so nice to see everybody. I, I know on camera you don't, but like I know all the crew too, and right. And mm -hmm. so coming back, it was like almost like seeing your family again, right? And and it was it was it had been two years since the last creative space. I think it was in New York City, right? That's right. And now just to hang out and you know talk to people and chit chat, and it was it was really good. It, it feels like we're going back. We're coming yeah, back. Yeah, coming back. Coming, coming back. back. For sure, normal, which is what you want. Really cool. Yeah. So obviously, the Alpha Seven Four was the the uh, live shoot camera because we just launched it. It starts to ship in a couple of weeks now. Uh, how was your experience? You just mentioned a little bit, Greg. Uh, what did you guys think? You that was your first time today shooting, right, Jeremy? First time ever. First time ever. <laughs> Good um, job. No, it's me. I missed, I missed working with your people. Your first time shooting the Alpha. Yeah, 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 we know. We know. And yeah. your first time shooting uh, puppy shots. Puppies. So yeah, it was a lot of firsts today. So yeah. it's yeah, it's good to be back. I love working with people and meeting some new faces, reconnecting with some others, and just uh, yeah, just working in this environment is really exciting for me. And tr testing out new gear and photographing puppies. It's a good day. Yeah, <laughs> good day. Anita, what did you think? Yeah, no, I love it. I think it's. I mean, first, it's very weird to be around this many people. <laughs> I feel yes, like the, we are weird. Yep, yep, yep. The inner introvert <laughs> that's in me. every day. That's, yeah, that's true. Know. The inner introvert in me is screaming. But, uh -huh. <laughs> but no, it was amazing. And testing out the camera for the first time as well um, was really cool. Um, I've shot on the 7, uh, A7R4. That's what I have. And, you know, just testing this one out is, is really cool. It's a great camera. It has so much to offer. So... It was nice to see the photos and use the light setups in the studio because I usually shoot outdoors, so it was quite a different mm. setup for me as well. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was fun. Good. You had it a while before launch. I did. I did. I was very fortunate. Cool. Very fortunate. <laughs> um, and it's it's always uh, impressed me. You know, I feel like uh, really since the A7 III series um, or the Alpha 7 III, Thanks for, yeah. Um, so with the Alpha 7 III, you know, they, they started on this path of just making these like amazing basic cameras that really, you know, do everything that most people would want to do. And then now with the A7, the Alpha 7 IV, like it, it just takes that ball and runs with it much farther. So it's pretty awesome. And, you know, in terms of being like here in person, you know, it's kind of funny because I'm very much an introvert as well. Uh, and yeah, believe it or not, it's only for the camera. This is literally off the show where I'm like, hey, what's up? You know, if you see me like off camera, I'm literally just like, you know, very chill. So. so it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, you have to like dust off those social skills. Like, <laughs> hey, there's somebody in person. Hey, uh, I don't know how to approach human beings anymore. How's it going? You know, yeah. so it's, it's awesome. This is a cool opportunity. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I've said it yet, but big thanks to Sony for, you know, putting yeah. us uh, all in the same room and um, getting to just rub shoulders. It's cool. 
Uh, completely agree. So since we're talking about alpha cameras, we started talking there. We do have a question from Sam Downey, who mentioned very specifically that he is from England and he's watching Ooh. this in the late into the night. So wow. thank you, Sam. Thanks for, thanks for saying it. Saying it. Oh, if yeah, you yeah. could choose <laughs> just one favorite alpha camera, what would it be and why? Ooh. The a the alpha one. <laughs> I mean, it's just the best camera I've ever used. I don't think there's anything like it. And a big issue I had with like previous oh, bodies no, is it, it, what? I just what is it? <laughs> what is it? I mean, when she can I guess? Yes. When yes. photographing concerts, sometimes there's that light flicker. The banding. Yeah, yeah, that's banding. Exact, that's exactly yeah. it. And and not only just shooting concerts, but like uh, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, shooting like unit photography where there's you know, like a specific light setting that won't change at all, it's constant. And uh, sometimes you're required to shoot with no shutter. And because of that, that increases the potential for banding. And uh, I used it for the first time on this Apple Music shoot. Is that okay? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> 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 Perfectly fine to say. <laughs> on, this, on this shoot uh, earlier this year, and it was, it was insane. No shutter the entire time, and I didn't get any banding the, the entire two days that I was sh on that shoot. It was incredible and that sold me on it immediately yeah. like i remember when uh, we were photographing gumball together mm -hmm. we were both talking about it and you yeah. mentioned that and yeah, that was when i was first started it, yeah. with it too uh -huh. and i love that feature as well as i love how quiet the yes. shutter is yes not even in silent uh -huh. mode it's, it's just, like is this thing is yeah. it working right so yeah. quiet. <laughs> it's so I love quiet. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah okay. definitely the alpha one all right me too you a too yeah. <laughs> Zito. the alpha one is a one okay but my my question is <laughs> alpha one i have a question Sorry, what is your favorite steak sauce <laughs> oh, <laughs> i don't use steak sauce How i used to you? use it all the time as a kid and it was very funny because i would immediately like it i didn't even taste the steak i was like can i please have some steak sauce and they're like you haven't even tried it yet so I got super self-conscious about asking <laughs> and I don't use it anymore because people oh, wow. are like, oh, they're offended because I'm like, you haven't even tasted the steak. I'm like, I just like steak sauce. And now you have a different kind of A1. <laughs> sorry, sorry. He asked yeah. about steak sauce and I didn't know why he asked. <laughs> I was like, I don't use it. I, I can tell. tell. I can tell. <laughs> But yeah, full circle, that it's your favorite camera just now. Just click, just click. From steak sauce to camera. See? I feel uh, like it's easy. Like, the Alpha One obviously does everything, and it's, like, super good. Um, so it makes our lives super easy. Yeah. I mean, for me, I'm really big with the Alpha 7 R4. That's been, like, my baby. But, funny enough, we've been giving away ZV-1s today. I really love the ZV-1. I love the fact that they have the multi-interface shoe. And funny enough, for a lot of my studio stuff lately, I've actually been using it. Um, and you know, maybe this is a little controversial, but like my most recent video, I had some shots, you know, one with the Alpha 7 R4, one with the ZB1 in a controlled studio lit environment. And it's hard to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Obviously you could blow one up and you'll be able to do more with it. But most of us are posting on social, mm -hmm. posting on our websites and it's hard to tell the difference. It's a really good camera. So yeah, I gotta try that out myself. Yeah, yeah I've tricked a lot of people. Even I've even tricked myself. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll go through the files, and I have no clue until I start looking at the exit data, and I'm like, oh, that's ZV1. <laughs> the technology has evolved so much. We have a question here from Nelson. I'm gonna ask Miguel and Scott because um, I I kind of know how long ago this was. Hmm. What was the first Sony Alpha camera you used when you switched? When Ooh. you when you when you came on board as a Sony artisan? Right. Oh, okay. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, mine was, was the many years um, ago. A 850. Okay, yeah. That's it was, right. it was a there. mirrored it's camera. It's right before A900. A, right, and it was one of the first full-frame A-mount yes. Sony cameras. What year, was it? what year was this? I don't know, <laughs> 2010 or something like that? Yes. You can it was look about it 10 up. years ago, that's yeah. right. Yeah, mine was actually the original A7 or the Alpha 7. Um, oh, you're just a young person. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. You know, and it was it was a very interesting thing because at the time I shot with a DSLR, um, and it, it really was just going to be a dedicated video camera. Mm. That was all that I bought it for. I was still going to continue to shoot with my DSLR and then just use that to basically give me a DSLR look to my video, but still have autofocus in video, which my my DSLR didn't have. And um, and then I started playing around with it and got kind of curious because it's small, it's light, and I started using it. I'm like, man, this is this is really good. And it was a little depressing because the combination of you know the kit lens and the body was like seventeen hundred dollars U.S. at the time, 
and my DSLR setup was like $5,500. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, in a way, like there was like a little bit of like snobbishness in a way, like yeah, yeah. this should not happen. I spent $5,500 <laughs> on this, you know, but, um, but it, it's awesome. And here we are now, you oh, know, years yeah. later and it's like, I, I couldn't imagine if I would have stayed that course, you know, <laughs> the, the tech is so good. Right. And speaking of the tech in the A7 IV, Michael is asking, would you buy the Sony A7 IV, Alpha 7 IV for general photography? Oh, yeah. For yeah. Who? For general photography. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think if you have the money, you know. Um, it's that's Yeah. That's, I mean, that's <laughs> the thing. It's always like a budgetary thing. Um, you could make really great images with an Alpha 7C or, a, you know, Alpha I own that too. Yeah. Which is a great camera too. Uh, but there's something to the look of full frame cameras to me at least i don't know about yeah. you guys but um yeah i mean that's like the do all well camera well so i think as, especially if you're i mean nowadays i feel like you know photographer has to learn video too sure, to stay sure. relevant mm -hmm. and so the new um alpha 7 4 does 4k 60 which is amazing has the eye focus yep. with yeah. it and so you can't go wrong whether you're shooting stills with it or doing video it can take you a long way with that camera. I actually have a question for you guys because I'm, I'm curious. I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway, and we'll go okay. down the line. Do you guys all do video? Because you you mentioned that you know it's becoming a thing. I personally think this started like probably three, four years ago, where like photographers really needed to start at least dipping their toes mm -hmm. into shooting video. Um, and I'm curious to know on this panel, do you guys all shoot video? I mean, I do, I do video because of YouTube. Right. So I mm -hmm. mostly film my behind the scenes, but I do see the power of like B-roll and taking behind the scenes videos. A lot of the time, if I post on my Instagram, mm -hmm. my B-roll or behind the scenes footage actually performs better than the final mm -hmm. photos because mm -hmm. people want to see the real mm -hmm. behind the scenes and how, how everything is done. Mm -hmm. So I definitely it's a big see that to for it. sure, especially now with TikTok and Reels and everything. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a big element of, of being able to, to show your content. True. Yeah, uh, just dipping my toe in. Um, every uh, concert or festival that I shoot, I I always make sure that I'm um, grabbing a couple of clips uh, here and there. But I, ha I have so much like on my hard drive that I haven't stitched any to anything together to make it like a real thing. Right. But um, I, I do capture video, but I haven't done anything like in a professional setting regarding that. But mm -hmm. definitely looking to get getting into more of that, um, especially with the Apple one. It's just it's an amazing camera yeah, that does. Yeah. <laughs> I've been primarily still, and and I was actually scared to get into video because I didn't know much about. I'm just a still dude. Give me my little flashes, and I, I'm cool, right? So I have to kind of step outside of myself. But I, I realized that the world is going to more and more video, and so I started getting into it and learning it, and I really enjoy it, you know. And I, I had a friend, you know, and I've been kind of mentoring him. He got hired to sh do video for a, a, you know, a wedding video. He got paid $3,000 and he doesn't have any video on his portfolio. Yes, yes. But he's getting, but he's, he got hired for video. So that's how wide open it is a video. For it. It's there's huge, a huge there's a People huge are going need. to spend money on it. Right. Did, did he crush it or she? Or she? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's like, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. I've been mentoring him, so he better. Yeah. yeah, hopefully. What about you, Jeremy? Do you do video? Yes, is the short yep. answer. Um, <laughs> I, yes, over the last couple of years, I've been slowly transitioning into even more video than photography. Mm. And a lot of my photography I shoot, I have what video component I'll create alongside it. Right, while right. While shooting. So, so it's actually um, become a part of the process versus just like, I'm just going to stash like, you know, you're stashing like a bunch of footage for one day, hopefully, you know, <laughs> which I'm not gonna lie, I do that too. I've got <laughs> footage I haven't even looked at yet, but that's, that's. But it was a, it was similar with me uh, being a tr photography traditionally. Yeah. It's like my, it's been my bread and butter. It's right. been what I've been doing for a while. And video has always been a little scary. I thought, you know, I went to, I had a lot of friends that were in the film industry and that's a whole different thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so yeah. I, it was a little daunting for me to even try video because right. I didn't know what I was doing compared right. to these people. Yes. So, but. You know, I wanted to grow as an artist and photography or videography is a little challenging. And also it's the way a lot of people are consuming content mm, on the yes, internet. For sure. So especially micro videos now with, mm -hmm. you know, TikToks, yep. Reels. Um, yeah, so I've been 
transitioning more and more into video and have so much to learn there and it's exciting it's a it's just a, a totally new format of storytelling mm -hmm. so i think so, you can be more creative within uh telling a story through yes. video than photography oh, sure. they're just challenging in different ways mm -hmm. so it sounds like some of you started doing more during the pandemic probably you had yes. more downtime yeah. right so let's talk about that a little bit uh jennifer is asking how has each artist evolved or adapted their practice in the midst of the pandemic mm. It's been a couple of years now. What has changed in the midst of all of that for you? Anita? I mean, I feel like it's a tricky one for me because I stayed relatively active throughout the entire thing. Um, I did have to go home to Ireland for a four or five month period uh, where I wasn't really doing anything. So I ended up doing the, uh, you know, the Zoom shoots. Mm -hmm. So I did like three or four of them and that was fun. It yep. was an interesting experience. But other than that, I managed to be in places where I was still able to shoot. Um, it definitely gave me more perspective on how important it is to have a presence, to have digital right, yeah. products, to have things that you can do when you can't do anything. You know, like before the pandemic hit, I knew that it was going to probably be a lockdown for a while. So I ended up just gathering as much content as I could. I shot nonstop for like three weeks straight. So I ended up having probably 10 to 20 videos that I could post wow. on YouTube. Um, so basically, that's why I didn't really feel it as much, because I was still able to post throughout the pandemic. Um, and that was fine, but it was definitely challenging. Oh, yeah. You yeah. sound like you're a good planner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, just, so. I, just, I just know, I just see it, and I'm you're just like, like okay, I'll have, to shoot. <laughs> I'll have to shoot as much as possible, and then I'll just have so much content. So. Oh, my gosh. You did it the right way, because I'm sure for a lot of people, we're like <laughs> hands in our pockets, like, oh, my gosh, what do we do now? You know, um, I, I know for me, um, you know, I, I was quite fortunate that I started in video, and I never started professionally. Like I didn't get too far into it before I realized like video is a little bit difficult to market yourself unless, you know, unless you're really good and then people come and watch your stuff. But like to just meet someone out in the streets and be like, hey, I'm a videographer. Let me show you my work <laughs> versus like in two seconds, I could show you my photos and you get a general gist of like, is he good? Is he not? What does he do? Um, but yeah, I mean, I pivoted quite a bit more into creating content, into doing video. Um, you know, I create videos for Alpha Universe, which hopefully you guys have seen. If not, alphauniverse.com, check it out. <laughs> um, but, um, and then I've also, I have my own YouTube channel and I've kind of leaned into uh, creating uh, content and, and talking to people and trying to educate and hopefully inspire and hopefully entertain. Um, so I've, I've leaned really hard into the video side of things and I'm happy that, you know, we have gear that's affordable uh, to be able to do it, you know, because I, I was doing this, 20 years ago, I remember, you know, to get what we're getting right now, number one, wasn't possible, like at any price <laughs> you point, can't get it. but like, like it didn't exist, but you know, to have like this level of technology and quality, you know, available to us, we may not know how to use it, right? We may be a little like, oh, I'm not sure. I don't know, but the camera's not going to hold us back when we're ready to knock on the door and be like, Hey, I want to learn how to do this video yeah. thing. Yeah. You for, know? for me, this might be naive to say, but I feel like the video on these cameras, the A1, or the Z1, yeah. um, they're so good. And I, I have no experience with these higher grade cameras that are like thousands, thousands, like thousands. These thousands. Yeah, like these Venice cameras right here. <laughs> that are just, like, there's just such a stark difference between price between uh, the cameras that we shoot with, that shoot incredible video with those. And I'm just like, do you, do you use those cameras? No? Yeah, I mean, I have an FX9 in my studio and I love it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's got its advantages, but to be honest with you, you know, you, you put the results side by side, you know, ZV-1 and FX-9. I mean, if, if you have the correct environment and situation, you probably couldn't tell the difference, you know? Maybe the, like, connoisseurs of video will be like, oh, yeah, that's definitely, who couldn't well, tell? Well, and filmmakers, cinematographers, sure, right? Sure, they could tell. Just to tell the audience, because you mentioned that we have several FX-9s here. That's yes. what we're talking about. <laughs> More than we're a few. Spoiled right because now. we're spoiled as yeah, a digital yeah. media production center in Los Angeles, where they have them all, mm -hmm. including Venice's. So that's why everyone's talking about it. There was a question, actually, um, somewhere in the chat that said, do you miss camcorders? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I know the answer to that. Oh, God. Do I miss 640 by 480? Uh, no. No. <laughs> I'm going to say, I, I, I miss the excitement that was around at that time. Um, I, I'm probably dating myself. But I, I had a friend of mine who moved to Japan, and I was living in Orlando, Florida. And um, this was like before smartphones with cameras were a thing. And I remember him telling me like, hey, I'm in Japan and they got these phones that have a camera on it. 
I'm like, bull crap. Yeah, I'm like, I, I, I was like, listen, I want you to email me a picture. And I think I had like prodigy internet back in the day. Like this is how, how long ago it was. I was like, listen, I want you to take a picture where you have your tongue sticking out and your arm over your head. Cause I want to make sure it's not a photo yeah. that you took a while back. So he takes this photo with his phone and, you know, it took 10 or 15 minutes. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my, and the picture was like the size of a stamp. And yeah. I was just like, filled with now. wonder this is amazing <laughs> you know and here we are like 20 years later and you know we, we have different tastes <laughs> so, so continuing the discussion about your style and how it has evolved we got a nice compliment for you from regina saying that she discovered you during the pandemic which a lot of people discovered Ooh. you guys during the pandemic because they were looking at stuff and um been following the work ever since so i'm sure that's um the case for many of you how has that been for you, engaging with the community, connecting with other people during this time? Did you do more of it, less of it? I know it changed, it became virtual, but I know a lot of people did actually a lot more of it because they had the downtime. How was it for you, Greg? You Concert photography went away for a little bit there, right? Yeah, it did. Um, and I, I, I'm actually kind of grateful, not for the pandemic, but for the stillness, because uh, for years it's just been like, running, 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 run, like every other weekend, it's like another festival, another show. And during the pandemic, I learned like, it's okay to be still for a little bit and kind of understand why you do what you're doing. Like there needs to be a reason for you to like get up in the morning and like get out there and take like these wonderful images. Like what's like, what's your why? Like, why am I doing this? And I found inspiration through uh, social media as well as like photography books and stuff like that. Uh, it, it was really important for me to reinvigorate and re-energize myself uh, within photography because it was, you know, I was shooting so much, it was becoming a little stale. Um, so the stillness kind of kept me inspired by, like, looking at people who I I, I really love and admire as well as, uh, like, visiting photography books. And what's, what's kind of strange, though, like, my style is, like, I love black and white photos, right? And when I came out of the pandemic, like, I don't love black and white as much. <laughs> it's like, what happened? Like, if you go down my feed now, it's just a whole bunch of vibrant, colorful images. And I was even looking at the description of my work on the Sony Apple website. It's like, Greg takes bright and vivid, beautiful photos. I was like, oh, it used to be black and white. <laughs> That's changed. Um, uh, besides that, uh, I, I, I have connected with my community in a different way because, like, the stuff that happened during, like, the whole George Floyd situation uh, mid-2020 was, like, you know, super depressing and being able to kind of like talk, uh, you know, amongst my peers about what was going on and actually be on the ground level and photograph those experiences as well as protests with my peers was like a really cool thing. And to be able to share those images with the world as well was like very helpful and also equally inspiring. So yeah, we uh, featured some for, yeah, on Alpha yeah, Universe. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that was, that was great. And, um, yeah, I, I'm grateful for, uh, again, not the pandemic, but for the stillness. <laughs> the that stillness has been yeah. I got a quick question. What's a, what's a photo book you're inspired by? Um, Is so, there one specific or just generally? Uh, so there's um, there's three, and uh, there are two different photographers. Uh, one of them, Shimodu, he had like this um, portrait series with Tupac that's amazing. R.I.P. Shimodu, by the way. He's like my, my favorite photographer ever. But uh, regarding live music, um, Neil Preston, I have two of his books, and in my opinion, best photog best live music photographer of all time. Um, they're mostly black and white, and I grab a lot of inspiration from him. But um, one one book is just like it's just called Queen, <laughs> and it's all this. He was Queen's photographer, uh, yeah. um, and he, you know, it, the book is just full of like like every single page is just like inspiring, inspiring, inspiring. So uh, whenever I'm feeling like a little like I need some like 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 a creative jolt, yeah. I just pick up that book. And there's another one I forget the name of it, but it's just it's not just um, uh, what's the name of it again? <laughs> queen. The queen. Yeah. It's not just Queen. It's not just Queen, but there's like uh, multiple artists in there, and those two books like super inspire me. So uh, the two books by um, Neil Preston is, as well as Shimo, just two pocket books. That's my, okay. that's my jam. Excellent. What other inspirations during uh, this time, Scott? Well, you know, for me, it was quite a different experience. I mean, I got to just be totally honest. It crushed me. Yeah. Um, it crushed me from an emotional standpoint of view and it crushed me financially because what I did for a living was meeting people, yeah. meeting them in person and teaching them. And then I didn't, basically all my income was tied to that. And so when the pandemic came and all the events got canceled, 
I was sitting there and I totally remember at one point, it was just a bad day, like a bunch of Sony events got canceled, some weddings got canceled and this got canceled. And I went up to the room with my wife and I just started crying and breaking down in front of her because I go, oh. I think we're going to lose everything. Because at that time, I didn't know how I was like, going to survive. I was the sole financial provider for my family. And I just felt like I am letting them down. And so I, you know, and when I first time, like in 20 years or so, I filed my taxes, I'm showing a loss in my income. And so, I mean, I don't, I feel blessed. Okay. I don't want to, you know, nobody feels sorry for me or anything like that because I feel extremely blessed. You know, I have a roof over my head. I I can eat as much food as I want. <laughs> and we, and the great part about it was one was it allowed me time. And I actually laid down 44 hours of content that, and I had didn't, I'd never had the time to do that. So I had some time to record that. And then I was able to make income off of that and move forward with that, which was great. And then also before, as you know, before my life was like every week I was traveling right. somewhere. Mm -hmm. So the stillness of just pulling back and just being with my family, that was actually a blessing too. So, you know, I'm dealing with all this stuff and trying to move forward and, and so unsure, even now, so unsure of my future because mm -hmm. we're starting to come back, but mm -hmm. it's not like before. So I'm still kind of going through a process of transitioning and seeing where I fit. And but you know what? That's the artist struggle, right? Yeah. We always. all go through that every few years, regardless. Um, but to be completely honest, I just kind of feel like I don't know. I'm in transition still. Yeah. And it's okay to feel that. You know, yes. you always somebody always asks you, how you doing? We always feel like, oh, I'm doing great, I'm great. doing this, right. you know. Mm -hmm. But it's okay to be honest and say, hey, I'm in transition, I'm mm -hmm. struggling, or I'm dealing with this or whatever. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much for sharing that. Yeah, that's I know a lot of people are feeling that way. So yeah. it's, it's okay to feel that way and figure things out. So okay, you've all been doing a lot of exploration. What is the future going to look like? Like, what are we looking at in 2022? 2022 or like the future future? <laughs> uh, I, guess, I, mean, like, I, have some, I have some predictions. Uh, if I had asked you like a year ago or yeah, two yeah. years ago, we, we would have painted a picture that doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, let's say next year Okay, first. next year. Well, I am, might be kind of, it's not a country. It, I'm releasing, I'm really excited to go outside my comfort zone a little bit and release one of my photo series as an NFT series. So, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, NFT, yeah. So I've been, I've been gearing up for it, and it's a body of work that I created over the quarantine, my rooftop series. Oh, nice. And, yeah, I'm gonna, it's going to be a collection of 65 photos that I put together. And, yeah, it's, like, the most important body of work I've made, and I'm really excited to put it out in the world for people who want to collect my work uh, to be able to. So... A lot of people have been doing a lot with NFTs in our community. Mm -hmm. A lot of our yeah. um, Alpha Imaging Collective have been minting NFTs. Um, is that in the plan for anyone else? I'm Probably. curious Probably. about it, yeah. you know. Um, I definitely want to learn more about it for sure. I love what crypto, else? so I would want to do it. You really want to do it? <laughs> yeah. I, I know that everyone wants to do it. It's just hard to understand for a yeah. lot of people. So. Yeah, yeah. I think you just have to be very involved. My friend is really involved in it. Um, she minted one a few months ago, and she's really into it. She's releasing a series now. And it's very, it's very community-based. You have to be very involved yeah. in the community of people. So you have to spend a lot of time, and you have to be very dedicated. It's not just a matter of releasing a photo and just hoping for the best. Like You really have to be in the forums and the meetings. Right. And mm. It's a whole it's different just, group it's of a, people yeah. that need to get to know you. Yeah, so. for sure. Yeah. What else? What else are you thinking for 2022? I released my workshop uh, last month. And, All right. Oh, um, it was very exciting. It was a swimmer photography workshop. Mazel tov. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I really want to do more of them next year. Um, I it, It's been a long time coming. I filmed it months and months ago, but I was just, you know, imposter syndrome. And I was like, I can't teach anybody. I don't know anything. And now I released it and I've got pretty good feedback. And I really want to go into different topics because i know that you know swimmer photography is quite niche for what it is um so i want to expand into studio and other outdoors things and maybe business things um but i'm super excited about that because it's it's like a new genre of something that i haven't explored yet and it's it's really cool nice okay workshops 
you you were doing a lot of workshops. I've been with you in yeah. international places. Right. What are we you thinking for twenty two? I'm still waiting for our China trip. That I was know. the last thing that got canceled. So. You know, I think the overall arching thing for me, it's like when you get started again, you have to be really proactive about what you want to, I mean, to be honest, I'm, I was kind of a little bit spoiled because people would just call me up, oh, you want to speak here? And then all of a sudden my schedules filled up, but then people were coming to me. So now I feel like, hey, if you want, nowadays you got to get out there, you got to get on the, the, the phone or email and be proactive about what you want to do. And when you're re kind of inventing yourself again, my belief is, you got to throw a lot of lines out there and try some different things and see what sticks and see what you like and see what you don't like, but don't be afraid to fail and try something new, you know, <laughs> doing a workshop. I remember in throwing out a work, Oh, I don't know. I got to put out there. Nobody's going to sign up for my workshop, but you know what? That's okay. Two people come, whatever, throw it out there and see what happens and not be afraid of failure. And I think that's like the biggest thing, I think, is just getting out there and doing something and trying it. Yeah, yeah I think, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm leaning in quite a bit towards, uh, you know, YouTube and my community, you know. Um, I, I, I'm very much like uh, energized and inspired by the conversations that I get to have with people through that experience of creating videos and you know, reading comments and, and talking to people and, uh, you know, and seeing the unique issues that have popped up in the past year and a half, two years now almost, um, of, of just uh, really good people that are struggling, you know, just like what you were talking about. Um, that story is is happening at various levels, you know, all throughout. And, um, you know, they're, they're looking for somebody who can understand, you know, and, uh, I'm not saying that I do fully. I, I try. I'm in it. So I kind of understand. And, uh, you know, so just really leaning more into just um, getting closer to my community through YouTube and, and, you know, learning as much from them and also taking the opportunity to kind of like play around and do photo shoots that I would normally not be able to do because I'm, you know, uh, known for a certain style of photography. And that's kind of what people come to me for. And don't have time to play anymore you know so yeah. uh now i feel like i've had a lot more time to play and and practice and do things that maybe before i would have just uh not had the time or the effort you know put the effort into doing it and now i have the time to do it so it's been a lot of fun and i don't know maybe maybe it may not be 2022 but maybe 2023 i'm a concert photographer yeah. I'm, uh, you know creating tiktoks <laughs> like uh, you know, to me, it's like I'm I'm an open book. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm back to like day one of like, okay, I, I'm relieved of this pressure. What do I want to do? What do I want to explore? And and yeah. it's an open book again. I love that because I, I would say probably most great discoveries come from great struggle, mm -hmm. and Absolutely. this mm -hmm. has been a great struggle. So related to that, you have all sort of discovered who you are. It's very clear. You've shared a lot of that with the world. I would love to know what you think makes you unique because we had a bunch of questions today about like, I don't know how to find my style or how do I find my style? What should I do? Mm. How much should I try? Mm. And I saw a thread in all the different um, discussions we had about how try new things, just like put it out there. Nothing bad is going to happen. All of you said it um, at some point in some form. And you've done that and you've discovered your style. So like Anita, for instance, you were sharing today that you love to shoot in midday light and that's your favorite thing, not golden hour, not, you know, early morning. And people know you for that, right? And they know you for the type of photography that you do. So what is each one of you, what do you think is your thing that, that made you out there, that put your name out there? Um, for me, um, and I know a lot of photographers do this, but you know everybody's perspective and eye is different. But I'm really, really big into um, like capturing like as much emotion in the face as possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm getting like the tight shots and you know every crevice of their you know their face that's like stretched out when they're screaming into the microphone. I want to make sure that's captured because you know it's all about like capturing emotion as authentically as possible. And I think I, I think I do that pretty well, but I also like um, like concentrating on things that people wouldn't normally uh, look at, like 
the, like the details in the hands with it while they're gripping a microphone or the tattoos while they're strumming a guitar. So um, I kind of kind of try and, and and create my own lane within music photography because when I was coming up, a lot of people looked down on people who weren't shooting the same way that they are, like the OGs and who've been who've been shooting for decades upon decades. It's like everything needs to be fully and sharp, and I need to be able to see every single member of the band. <laughs> and when I see that, I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't, I personally don't love that. And I want to be able to focus on who I want to focus on. And if people love it, then they love it. If they don't, I'm still creating the art that I want to make. So, um, yeah. And black and white as well. <laughs> Before. Before. <laughs> okay. Jeremy, how about you? Um, what was the question? Again? <laughs> what do people know you for outside of asking a girl in a day from a job? Right, right, right. Um, what just do people know your style? Yeah, I feel like yeah. I'm, I'm a people person, so I love photographing people and working with people in general. So whether that means that or photographing someone in a studio or just going up to them on the street and asking to photograph them, I think I like to photograph people and show the truest form of themselves usually I like to tell optimistic stories because I just I, I think I just see the best in people so that's the way I photograph them I love it yeah uh, well clearly a lot of people love that because you have a huge following um Scott how about you well okay let's start out what I was before as a photographer I was that's a okay. math major okay <laughs> so what is math dealing in Formulas, right? <laughs> and so when I approached photography in the beginning, it I approached it from a formula base, right? Okay, so how do you pose? Oh, shift the weight this way. All right. So, but then if you ask me, when did my work really change where I felt like I was proud of my work or starting to create a signature style? Then I realized photography first is exactly what Greg said, it starts with the emotion. And when I can feel and then translate and work with, you know, my subjects or whatever, and we both work this feeling or this emotion and the technical aspects wrap around the emotion to bring it out better, to tell a better story. That's when I felt like, okay, my work is getting to that next level because it didn't lead with the technical, oh, what camera setting should I have? How should be the flash be? It first led with what's the vision or what's the emotion? And then wrap all your knowledge around on how to tell a story from that emotion. And that's when I felt like my photography was getting a lot better. I should have been taking question. notes. That was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, your, I'm curious, does your background in math, does that, do you apply that to your photography oh, at all? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, in regards to lighting, because this is what I love about photography. It's right brain and left brain. So, mm -hmm. so that's why it's the number one hobby in the world, because the creatives can love it and the techies can just keep buying gear and gear and loving it. And we all love it and we all come together. And so when I teach workshops, we got people on the left side and the right side and we're kind of melding together, you know, and so it's beautiful. Wow. I, I never thought of it that way. That's cool. Because also, if, if you if you want to create and want to make a painting, not a, it's it's really hard to paint. At least for me, a lot of people, yeah. it's a lot easier to take a photo and feel like you're creating sure. art. So right. it's a lot more accessible. Yeah. Okay. Is how it about, the number uh, one you hobby? Anita. You think I just love the fact that I get to give representations of female body and empower the female body. I try to shoot with as many different skin colors and you know shapes and sizes of models, um, and I love the fact that I'm also a female shooting from a female perspective because I think it is quite different. And all the time you can kind of tell if it's a it's a man or a woman shooting the photos. Um, and I really love that, you know, because because of YouTube I have a voice and, and I can, you know, kind of show people that all the time you don't really need a lot of equipment to take mm -hmm. photos and you can really use what's available to you. And you get to understand natural light. Like once you get to understand natural light, you can really take beautiful images. Um, you know, without that much effort once you know what you're doing, I guess. But um, I think I just want to show people that less is more and, and you know, and I don't know. I think that's that's mostly what I like. And obviously I love natural light, so. And color. Color, again, yeah. really important to me. I, so. I love you mentioned that female perspective. We need to plug the Alpha Female program here. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about resources, right, during this time mm -hmm. to create projects, get a grant and, and yeah. maybe you'll create something. Yeah. Um, Miguel, how about you? I mean, I think for me, I'm very fascinated with people's faces, you know, and 
Um, you know, for me, it's just been one of these things where I would, I remember growing up, I would look at magazines while I was waiting to check out and seeing these like really powerful, just full on face portrait, you know, and thinking like, wow, you know, my pictures don't look like that. I, I want to do that. And so that just really spoke to me. And even to this day, you know, there's so many different faces, so many different everything. I mean, everybody's face is completely different. So uh, trying to take a portrait of a person, you know, that's, that's like what brings me joy. You know, it makes me happy. And especially because most people don't like to see themselves in pictures. And so I love the challenge of like, let me see if I could take a really good picture of this person to where afterwards they're like, this is the best picture of me that anyone's ever taken. <laughs> like, that makes me feel so yeah. good to know, like, it, it's that empowerment thing. You know, I think a lot of people, for whatever reason, you know, we just don't like the way that we look in portraits. And so uh, I've taken it as a life goal and challenge to like take pictures of people that hopefully they like the way they look and maybe even love the way they look. And how do I go about doing that? And so I'm always trying to add new like wrinkles to the game. And the very beginning was very simple for me. It was just, how can I make this picture look as clean and crisp and, you know, uh, HD, which now is not <laughs> enough, but you know, now it's gotta be 8K. But like, you know, when I, when I started doing this, you know, it was like HD quality to me was just mind blowing. So like, how can I get my portraits to have that, you know, quality and, and that image quality. So, uh, and it's still like that to this day, you know, I want to have that sharpness and that image quality. And, uh, I want people to be really happy with the way they look in those images. So. Okay, great answers, everyone. I want to continue talking a little bit about new things to try in the future. I saw a question earlier here in the chat that uh, was asking if you've tried or if you've done more macro photography in the pandemic because everyone was <laughs> stuck and trying to find things like Erin Outdoors. She, she did this amazing series mm -hmm. with uh, the little miniatures and created a whole thing happening. So um, I want to know about that, but I also want to know what is the next thing that you want to try in photography or the next type of photography that you haven't tried? You've already done it, puppies. <laughs> so yep. got to think of a new one. Um, how about you guys? I mean, what do you, what's the next thing? I mean, I don't know. I started dabbling in nudes. I have already tried them and I really like them because I think it's like the next step from, from being a swimmer photographer, I guess. Um, it's just the female form and just appreciating it. And I think I would like to explore more like the potentials of, of close-ups and so on, because right now I just incorporate it into nature and I shoot outside mostly. Um, so I just get these really beautiful images of like, you know, naked women, nature. Um, but I would love to do details and, you know, just concentrate on the skin textures, the folds, you know, all, all that makes women beautiful. So I think that's what I'd like to try next. Nice. Um, I don't know what I want to try next, but I know that I've done a little bit of unit photography and I, and I love it. And unit photography is basically like behind the scenes stills or pull aside portraits when you're, when you're on a movie set or any type of motion picture type setting. Um, I've done a very, very, very small amount of it and it's for a documentary. And I just want to do something. I want to do more in that space. Like it's, it's something I really love. And besides live music and like commercial stuff, I think it's a really cool auxiliary to have in my portfolio. So, um, I'm hoping that 2022 will bring more of that and I'm actively working towards that. So uh, crossing my fingers for that because that's something that I really love. Um, but yeah. Cool. I think for me, you know, I, I really love educating. And I think, you know, moving forward for me, I think, I, I mean, I've been in this space where I've, you know, taught hundreds of thousands of people more or less on kind of like the hobbyist and semi-pro and pro level. But I, I kind of want to dabble into the college space because I feel like um, what people learn in college is a little bit different than, you know, what you need in the real world too sometimes. Yeah. And I feel like I have a lot to offer in that space, you know, how to make a living and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's kind of interesting me. So getting up to just a different teaching space for me, I think would be interesting. You're a wonderful teacher, son. <laughs> Thank you. Sharon, <Absolutely. laughs> sure, what are you thinking? I'm, I'm interested in so many different things. Uh, it's hard to say one, but I, I mean, maybe uh, in the educational space a little bit, teaching people photography that are interested in photography, whether it's in a college setting or in a YouTube video. I haven't explored. I, I've, I've dabbled a little bit in it, but yeah, I, 
just teaching would be a lot of fun. And, and Miguel, how about you? I think for me, um, I've been putting the groundwork uh, towards becoming like a filmmaker. Um, I have, so you guys probably, none of you know this about me, but I love creepy pastas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so for me, like I've heard a lot of like really good creepy pasta, which are basically uh, like short horror stories. Um, and so, and I love the horror genre, but I feel like most of it is trash. Um, but I hear these creepy pastas that, you know, just everyday people have written and I want to turn them into either short films or full length films. Um, so that's, that's been my, um, my secret hobby and my secret thing over the, the past like year or so has been, uh, you know, trying to figure out the, the skills that it takes to create these, uh, these films, you know, and eventually make a short film. And I would love before the end of 2022 to have like a short film that I could say, Hey, you know, this is one of my favorite stories. And, you know, I added my own spin to it and kind of just see where it goes. We will happily bring it into the world, but I will not be watching. It. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, the first one that I have is great. It's, it's, it's really great. It's not even a creepy pasta. It's uh, there was a book that Alfred Hitchcock uh, basically took all of these short stories and uh, he compiled them into a book. So he didn't write the stories, but it was stuff that he loved. Mm. And um, there's there's like two or three of them that were just fantastic. And I'm like, how are these not movies? You know, this is just like great stories. There's so much garbage stories that they make into movies. Like these are great. So uh, so don't take my idea. Don't go out there trying to find it. But, you should have uh, said that. But, um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's some great stories in there. And I just, uh, I, I, I feel like I have the gear. I have you know, um, one of the really great things during the pandemic, like Anita and I met during the pandemic, and I've met a lot of like just great people that, you know, I could hopefully, you know, lean on them a little bit to be like, hey, you know, how do I do this? And maybe steer me in the right direction. And so, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's the goal for this year. So community, so let's end with a quick discussion that would leave our community inspired. We have a lot of beginner photographers with us uh, who are asking questions throughout the day that I've noticed. So what is the one piece of advice that you would like to leave them with um, after today's event? What is the thing that they should do next? What should they try? How should they behave? What is, how should they look at things? What vision should they get? Oh, that's so many questions. Anything yeah. I'm giving examples, right? <laughs> so what is your piece of advice for, for our community? Well, how about you? Should I start? Yes. Uh, if I would, if I could boil it down to one piece of advice, I would say keep shooting. The more you shoot, the better you get. And to piggyback off of that, something that I could look back at, anyone could look back at that's been shooting for a little bit. I guess this doesn't apply to beginning photographers, but just look back in your Instagram. If you're feeling a little uninspired, like you're in a rut, just scroll back one year or two years and see what your photos looked like then or scroll back a little bit more. And then you could just see how much you've improved, which it just holds true that the more you, sh with anything, the more time you put into it, the better you get. And sometimes you don't realize it. So if you're interested in one specific niche, like for me, I love portraits. Let me, let me change my advice a little bit. So if you like portraits like me, the way I feel like I personally became a lot stronger portrait photographer is by coming up with a project idea where I would hold myself accountable for continuing to make portraits. So um, if you're working within a frame a little bit, I started taking a portrait of a stranger every day under one of my projects. And I did that for a while because at first I was a little nervous. It's a little daunting to go up to someone and ask to take their portrait, but I wanted to get better at it. So at first, I wasn't good at it and didn't really know how to approach a subject or be able to take a photo in any situation. And just by doing it again and again, just repeating, I naturally, without even thinking about it, I was just doing it and I just got better. So if you're interested in something, whether it's portrait photography or puppy photography or landscapes or whatever it is, just keep doing it and you'll, you'll get better. Okay. I think with photography, there's a difference between knowledge and skill. And we become enamored with knowledge. We love it. We crave it. We consume it. We watch these videos all day. But you have to turn that knowledge into skill. And how do you do that? Practice, 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 practice. And so when I'm you know, teaching thousands of photographers a year, it's like, okay, 
they I find that we all love that knowledge, right? We just want more. But really to convert it, you got to get out there and pick up that camera and start shooting and shooting and shooting. So that's one part of it. The second part of it, if you want exponential growth, is that you've got to be mentored by somebody because all these people write, like, hey, I was picking his brain this, this afternoon about concert photography, right? He's a master at it. Like, why don't I just ask a master? If you want exponential growth, you know, there's things that Greg told me that like, dude, I would have never found that out. But in 10 minute conversation, boom, I'm ready to take his business over. <laughs> And so, oh, like man. everybody in this room, I, if you just pick their brain for 10 minutes, they will tell you things that took them years, yeah. literally years. So, anyways, those two things. That's why we love our events so much. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, it's the, it's the mastery and it's the mentoring. Love it. Mastery and mentoring. Yeah, I think I've, it's kind of broad advice, but um, I think if you're, like, trying to get into photography, but you have a fear of it, I think you should move with that emotion. I think fear is, like, the number one motivator and a good way to get you out of your comfort zone because if you're complacent about anything, that means you're not you're not growing, you're not progressing, and it's it's almost like like working out, right? You're working out, and after the the uh, the workout, you're sore. That means you're working out the right muscles, and that's the same way you can you can apply that same thing to fear, right? So if you're scared to do something, that means you're trying to grow, you're trying to progress. So if you're scared of any one thing, I say go with that feeling, right? Because the only way you'll get better is if you're experiencing that emotion. So uh, that's my, I think that's my number one advice. Beyond that, yes, keep shooting. I'm a live music shooter. And the only way to excel in that field is to shoot concerts, right? So reach out to whoever you can to get you yourself in that photo pit. If you can't get into a photo pit, sneak your camera into a, a concert, buy a ticket, get your camera in there. And, I, and a lot of my favorite shots came from the crowd, right? And I use those images to leverage actually actual paid gigs. So shoot, 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 shoot. Uh, get in the photo pit, get in the crowds, and bring your camera with you, and just get all the content you can. And, and please do it safely. Yes. 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 Yeah. That's all I got. That was, that was all gems. <laughs> there you go. That was oh, really man. good. That was a really good piece of advice. <laughs> I think from my perspective, because when I when I started out, I did a lot of model tests, and I mean a lot. I shot nonstop, and I would just keep shooting and shooting and shooting. But a lot of the, these things weren't very good because I wasn't really putting out planning behind it. I would just keep shooting and then just hoping for the best, basically. And then I, as I started getting better, I started to be a bit more thoughtful about my time, my model time, what ideas I had. So I think if you're trying to do something, it's good to experiment with different things, but try and be as prepared as possible. Mm -hmm. Put mood words together. Look at other inspirations, see how other people do work, you know, like watch YouTube or which, whichever way you find your knowledge and just be a bit more mindful about what you do and where you put your energy and time. Because if you shoot a lot, but you don't put a lot of thought behind it, you're going to get burned out really quickly and your images are not going to be that great because you're just going to be kind of half, you know, half doing everything. So I think if you put some thought into it, put some mood boards together, get a better preparation and shoot less, but better quality stuff, it's going to be better for your portfolio in the long run. I think um, I've been watching a lot of anime during the uh, the pandemic, and um, <laughs> so so for me, I would say my advice is to make failure exciting. Um, you know, there's there's uh, anime Dragon Ball Z, and uh, the characters actually have to like beat each other pretty much to death, like near death, and then what happens is they get something called a Zenkai boost. They actually become more powerful. They they become stronger, and they literally rinse and repeat. This process of like beat them down near death and they come back stronger. And I think that photographers don't want to do that. Like mm -hmm. we're we're so like scared of like taking a crappy image. And listen, you got to rewire your brain. Yeah. That would be the biggest thing. You know, it's okay to take a crappy image, but you need to look at it and learn from it and say, okay, what made this crappy? How can I do it better later on? And then shoot again, like ASAP, whoever it is. I don't care if it's a can of soda or a human being, a dog, a cat, whatever, um, just just keep shooting and, and fall in love with failing because every time that you fail, you're going to get a Zenkai boost. Mm. And you're going to get the so. <laughs> There it is. Uh, very well brought back. I was going to say, good. and after the break, we'll go into our anime convention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. I'll well, be there. If I were to summarize what you guys said in one sentence, it would be focus on what you want, not what you don't want. 
Um, so that would that was great advice. Thank you guys so much. Can there I were say one more thing yes, about, please. I want to piggyback off what I really liked what Anita said, um, and she pretty much what I interpreted as is going into a shoot with intention. I think yeah. I've been doing mm -hmm. a lot of that lately. Um, compared to when yeah. in my prior days, I would just go and Spray shoot wherever. And I, I still yeah. do that. I, but if I go somewhere with an idea in mind of how I want to shoot it, what story I want to tell, yeah. then a lot of times my work comes off stronger mm -hmm. in the end. So, Okay. Intention. I love that. Yeah. We'll take that as the word for 2022. Yes. <laughs> intention. Yes, intention. So thank you guys so much. There were some other questions in here that were directed at specific people on the panel. So I just want to let our audience know that these guys are all on social. And yes. if you have specific questions for them, they are very good at replying and at engaging with their community. Maybe not Greg, but everyone else. <laughs> um, so, you know, please follow them and, and see their stories. And they share a lot more of this all the time. Um, so it's really wonderful. Thank you. Let's uh, give away a camera and the Ooh. phone. How about that? Oh, yeah. What do you guys think? Let's do it. Okay, so now I know that someone can do a drum roll here. <laughs> and I have the name right here in my Xperia phone. So the winner for the Xperia 1-3 is Eric Wesley. Congrats, Eric Wesley. Eric. And the winner for the Alpha 7 4 Ooh. is Norman McClay. Wow. Hey, yeah, Norman. Congrats, hey, sure. Norman. Good. Congrats. Now, this wasn't the only time to win. We also have an upgrade your bag, um, little sweeps that we're doing that go until January 16, if I'm not mistaken. So you can still have a chance to win. We're going to upgrade someone with one body, two lenses, two GM lenses. Wow. Mm. So um, really good opportunity there. So go ahead and join on alphauniverse.com. You're going to be able to do that. Um, a few more things before uh, we go. Uh, we also have our photo maps downloads on alphauniverse.com. Um, some of these guys actually put uh, some together for their cities or are going to put some together for their cities in the future. So um Check them out. Maybe you'll find some really good spots that you want to photograph next. We also have a gallery. If you haven't had a chance to visit it, which you may not have because you were listening to these awesome people, check it out on alphauniverse.com. It's going to stay there so you can see some amazing photography. We're going to keep switching out the photos so you can get more stories um, as we go. And a lot of people asked about the replays from today's uh, sessions. We will be replaying the content on our Alpha Universe YouTube channel, so you can go there because there was a lot that was shared, and I know a lot of people want to go back and take some notes. Um, so all of that, holiday promos on alphauniverse.com. So that was Creative Space. Thank you, guys. You Thank all you made it amazing. Time. Our teachers on the main stage, you guys, for the, for the live shoots, you are extraordinary. We're so lucky to have you in our family. And as part of our community, we do this for our community. Uh, as you know, Alpha is really based on community, around community. That's what we wanted to do, and uh, that's what we will continue to do. So hopefully we'll be able to do more of this in the future and in person because everyone's asking about condo. So yes, <laughs> condo 2022, Woo! who knows? Maybe it'll happen. Oh, Looking forward to it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys very much. And thank you all out there for being with us, spending your Sunday with us. We really appreciate you. And uh, happy holidays. Yeah, happy holidays. And happy, happy Hanukkah. It's eight day of Hanukkah, yes. right? Yeah. All right.